picture perfect. Afternoon in Hot Springs. Exactly what you want on one of the biggest days of the year. It's Apple Blossom Saturday at Oak Lawn Park. Why so important? Simple championships. 16 and counting. So who's next? Adair Manor is in from California. 9 to 5 morning line favorite. Trained by Bob Baffert over the years next to unstoppable at Oak Lawn Park. Of course, this filly has been unstoppable at Oak Lawn. Wet paint, undefeated, three for three in Hot Springs. And in her corner, Brad Cox. He's trained some great mares, but still seeking that first Apple Blossom victory. And in the Count Fleet, a title defense will take place. Skelly, lightning fast and hard to catch, trained by one of the best, Steve Asmussen seeking a sixth win in Oak Lawn's most prestigious sprint race. Uh, she was brilliant in last year's Apple Blossom. Clarier, great to have you with us on America's Day at the Race. This is always brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. They're playing our song, Call to Post, the first race in nine minutes. And yeah, we weren't kidding. Stunning spring afternoon in hot springs, mid 70s, light breeze, no humidity. Nine minutes out till the first of 12 races on Apple Blossom Saturday. That was our tent, by the way, uh, from the infield. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lafitte Pinkai. There aren't many races contested in April that have championship implications. This is one of them, the grade one Apple Blossom. Uh, as you heard, 16 mares have won this race and eventually been crowned Philly mayor champion. So how productive will this year's edition be? Only time will tell. But first things first, we start with today's 60th running of the grade one Apple Blossom, and it is the America's Best Racing's race of the week. Mile in a 16th, $1.25 million purse, top class, Phillies and mares. You see the field nine deep. And number four, Adair Manor in from California, trained by Bob Baffert, nine to five. Morning line favorite. As I welcome in my co-host, multiple grade one winning jockey, Rajiv Mirage. Rajiv, among those grade one wins on your resume is an apple blossom. Took place back in 2009 with 7th Street. That win, what did it mean to your career? Well, winning any grade one is remarkable. And, and that early in my career, it was a big stepping stone for me. But there was something significant that really happened after the race. When I approached the, the post-race conference, I was greeted by the head of Darley Operations, Jimmy Bell, uh, who were the owners of 7th Street. And he approached me by saying, hey, Mr. Big Race Jockey. That moment, for him to use those words, made me feel like he put me now in a level where he can entrust me with going around riding big races. And that snowballed in a relationship for years to come where Darley became a big supporter of me in big races and gave me so many opportunities. So that 7th Street moment, winning the Apple Blossom, really was um, something that paved the way for bigger oppor big opportunities for me. A difference-making victory in this prestigious of a race. Victory. And there is a connection, by the way, 7th Street, uh, that was that was Godolphin, right? Uh, and Wet Paint today, one of the key contenders, a Godolphin homebred, the second choice in the grade one apple blossom, but not the favorite. That distinction belongs to Adair Manor, as mentioned, in from California, Raj. One start this year, defeated in the Beholder Mile. So why is Adair Manor the apple blossom favorite? Well, Adair Manor is a deserving favorite, um, not only because she ran her lifetime best, a huge number of 102 buyer figure in, in her most recent race, but she was also uh, one of the top contenders in the Breeders' Cup this half last year. And she, on paper, she just looks like a horse that's at the peak right now and just really, you know, just a good filly. Yeah, so that's the, 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 the macro and the micro. If the Apple Blossom is known for producing champions, Raj, does Adair Manor have that kind of potential, like championship potential in 2024? A win in this race today will put her amongst the short list, at least in the top three um, for running for championship. And it, it will definitely be a, a good point to start at. If she can build on that, she's definitely a title contender when it comes to the Eclipse Championship this year. Again, uh, trained by Bob Baffert, uh, won the Arkansas Derby, 
a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'll have much more on Baffert's domination at Oaklawn later on in the broadcast. But uh, first things first, as we welcome in and say hello to our on-site broadcast team here at Oaklawn Park, standing by with Maggie Wolfendale uh, back at Brad Cox's barn, where apparently it's uh, nap time at the petting zoo. <laughs> Shh, wet paint here is relaxing and getting her pre-race naps in. So we're going to try to be quiet for the girl as she makes her four-year-old comeback. Oh, look, she's coming to say hello. Hi, honey. But wet paint, she was a serious force to be reckoned with last year in the three-year-old Philly races. And after a disappointing effort in the Breeders' Cup distaff, she had earned a well-deserved break. So that gap in her form was always planned, as Brad Cox has said, that she took a little while once joining the team down at the fairgrounds to kind of come around. But in the last six weeks, he, she has shown him everything that he wants to see from his star, his grade one star, as she looks to get back at the top level of this division in today's grade one Apple Blossom. And he said there were some other races he could have aimed for in Kentucky, but her perfect three for three record here at Oaklawn Park is what drove him to enter in this Apple Blossom today. Guys. Wet paint. Maggie, thanks so much. Uh, the grade one win in the coaching club, American Oaks, and home field advantage, Raj. Untouchable here at Oaklawn last winter and spring. Yeah, I mean, the affinity for the track takes big. That's a big thing to have in, under your belt. You know, never lost at this track. Um, she's, a, you know, the hometown hero pretty much here. So in, in one sense, Adair Manor is actually stepping into the, the house of uh, wet paint. Three for three, coming in wet paint. Godolphin, second choice in the morning line for the Apple Blossom. But that's just one of two graded stakes races this afternoon. And while the count fleet is a grade three, we're talking about grade one company because you have a Skelly, the best sprinter in North America, even money morning line favorite. Skelly, the count fleet later on this afternoon as we welcome in Paul LaDuca standing by. Paul, a very happy Apple Blossom Saturday to you. To you as well, to you as well, uh, Rajiv, and I'll be saying that to Maggie here in a little bit. But yeah, uh, in, in amazing race this year when it comes to the Count Fleet, when you were getting a runner like Skelly in there, and he was so dominant here last year, um, finishing out with the Lake Hamilton, then he went over to Sam Houston to finish out his year, and you know, he's come back a little bit stronger. And you know, listen, Mr. Asperson has had a stranglehold on this race over the last decade or so. Um, so, you know, Skelly last year looking for back-to-back. -back. Obviously, Jackie's warrior. Matoli's turned out to be a pretty darn good sire. Lemon Drop Dream and Justa Phillip. You know, Skelly's brilliance is his quickness. He's just so fast out of the gate. And, you know, um, when he ran in the Riyadh Sprint, he had to lay off horses. And it was the first time that he really had to do that you know over here in america he's always been able to just get to the front end and control things you know in defeat i can almost say that this might have been one of his best efforts you know when you, you realize that he come from off the pace i think ricardo santana did a great job it's just that remake ran him down in the long run i mean there's no disgrace in defeat now in, in betting this race the other two horses that steve has in the race rivet who I think benefits the most and being getting the outside draw is probably going to end up being your second choice. But there you see the multiple um, uh, greatest stakes winner, Skelly, who's eight for 13 lifetime, really never throws in a clunker. So, and we can't forget Jackson Travelers, Flavian Pratt will be a board as well, who won the Whitmore, I thought, in game fashion. So, Mr. Asperson has five. I think he'll get six by the end of the day, unless. He, there's a Tiana twist, uh, starts twisting home. You, we know the kick that he has, Lafitte. A twist in the story, all kinds of puns. I thought we were beyond that with the Timberlake race behind us. Raj, we talked about wet paint and how good she is here. Same can be said for Skelly, who's been almost perfect at Oaklawn Park. Not that he needs home court advantage. He is fast and one of the most exciting thoroughbreds in training in North America. Yeah, I, I think this is a great race for him today to actually show us some more of what he's got. Um, really looking forward to see how he stamps himself amongst the division. With a, with a big performance today, he could potentially be the 
top sprinter in the country. Now it's a little bit later on the count. Fleet grade one apple blossom, one of the biggest days of the year every year at Oaklawn Park. Live coverage right here on Fox Sports 2. The apple blossom race number like 34, I don't know. We're about a minute out till the first of the afternoon. Today's race is brought to you by Claiborne Farm. 100 years doing the usual unusually well you see the highlights the count fleet the apple blossom also live coverage from the big a aqueduct eight races coming your way as exciting as it is to watch this great racing that much more exciting to watch and wager get involved sign up nairabets.com use that promo code bonus 200 earn up to a 200 dollars deposit match after your first deposit bet any track anywhere anytime join now nairabets.com to earn your 200 dollars Deposit match. Couldn't find my past performances, Raj. Found them just in time. You're going to have to carry this thing all by yourself. Not that you weren't already. The yep. opener, $12,500 claimer. All for sale. Nine winners, two lifetimes. So they're all one for something, Raj. And we have an odds on favorite to deal with. Four to five. Dare me in what could be the start of a very, very productive afternoon for the family Asmussen. Yeah, I mean, but you have something major for this race. You you, you saw you saw Savage Darling, the favorite, the four, current four to five favorite. She was acting up pr pretty badly before the in the saddling box. I mean, that's that's yeah. got to have big mm -hmm. implications on this race when you think about this filly that doesn't break too well in any of her starts and actually refused to race two starts back. She's taken. She's been a uh, heavily bet here, um, and I think that. You know, there's cause for concerns. Some concern there regarding the odds on favor, perhaps in Savage Darling. We check in with Paul LaDuca. Paul, your thoughts on this opener? And by the way, a late scratch. The entry is out. How do you see this one unfolding? Yeah, Charlotte's Way got just scratched just a minute ago. You're right, Lafitte. So there was confusion earlier. A lot of people here on the rail were wondering they had scratched Cora Mandel. And then they announced they had scratched Charlotte's Way, then back. Well, Eventually, Charlotte's Way does get scratched out of this race. Hopefully, everything's okay, and she'll fight to live another day. I don't disagree, Rajiv. I mean, at the end of the day, you've been a horse that's four to five that Gate could lose the race for her. Now, she's been, over, been able to overcome it um, and run a decent second. But, yeah, when you refuse to break, there's always that concern. So do you want that gamble at four to five that she's just not going to break well? Um, you know, and you look at a horse like the five in here, Mamba out, I get it. You know, the horse won for 12-5, dropped for 12-5 last time. Uh, I know the next out winner, Wreaking Havoc, won, but that was an okay race that Wreaking Havoc won. But this filly, by more spirit for Buckhead Racing, I just think it's a little bit maybe more consistent. Now, two starts back, she got left in the mud. So... There's a lot of horses in here that are not good gate horses. You can go all the way through the lineup in here. The three, not a good gate horse. The four, broke nine and nine. The five, broke seven to seven, uh, seven and nine, two back. We've already talked about the seven uh, as well. So the six does not break well. So these are the kind of horses where you look and you're like, wow, there's a lot of bad gate horses. You know, besides the two, Hayek. And, you know, this horse is cutting back in distance. And this horse hasn't had a lot of... Uh, I guess gas in the tank when it comes to the end of the race, but I I'm willing to take a chance to the two Gets to the front in here at nine to two and coming out of those races and just keeps on going and I'll, I'll take that chance I can't take four to five and you know the five Mamba out I thought when he cleared last time or she cleared last time that she'd keep on going and she kind of hit the brakes when she hit the front so I think the two at nine to two and like I said all the time Nikki Juarez gets very aggressive so look for the two to be forward it sounds like a lot to watch for right from the start Raj yeah um, but he makes a great point Polly you know Polly makes a great point if the two horse is able to clear and take control of this race she might be able to last a lot longer than she has been doing going at a longer distance she's cutting back she's dropping in class and she's the speed of the speed from the inside so I expect Juarez to send her out to the lead and try to go gate to wire but number seven Savage Darling the favorite odds on when last checked Matt Dinnerman with the call first of 12 on Apple Blossom Saturday from Oakland on Fox Sports 2. We're ready to go. 
We're off and running on Apple Blossom Day 2024 from Oaklawn Park. The favorite Savage Darling is going to take to the back of the pack. Mamba out has speed. Dare me on the lead and Hayek is quickest of them all. Hayek from the inside strides forward to take a short lead. Mamba out about a half length back in second. Dare me is three deep to Sweet Candy and the fourth position followed by the favorite Savage Darling. Rye Money is next and a huge gap to Subway Susie who's detached from the rest as they approach the far turn run. Hayek in control at 4-1. to one, Hits the turn. A length in front of Mamba out. Dare Me is three wide in a good stocking spot. A gap of two to Savage Darling who finds herself on the rail now. She's fourth. Already niggled along a little bit by Christian Torres approaching the top of the lane. Tis Sweet Candy alongside of her. Then comes Rye Money and Subway Susie still far out of it. Top of the lane. Hayek off the turn in front. Mamba out second. Dare Me gives way. Savage Darling needs to do a little better. Is trying to weave her way through between horses now is going to duck to the inside. Savage Darling with a furlong to go. She's coming on. Savage Darling finding a good stride, taking the lead, and Savage Darling's in control, and she's going to win it. Savage Darling kicked it in when she needed to, and she wins it by two. Hayek was second, third home to Sweet Candy, and Mamba out was fourth. Savage Darling, the four to five favorite, delivers in the opener, leading rider Christian Torres in a win for our good friend and colleague, Tom Amos. Yeah, Christian really earned his keeps here. He was, you know, riding her pretty hard on the turn, seemingly like she was spinning her wheels. Um, and then once she switched leads, dove her to the inside for the clear path and um, found her best stride when it really mattered. Little anxious pre-race in the end, no difference. Uh, just too good for these Savage Darling in a second lifetime win. Tom Amos, Christian Torres in the first of a 12 on Apple Blossom Saturday at Oaklawn Park as we welcome in Acacia Clement, Sarah El Badwe standing by at Aqueduct as we get closer to the opener at the Big A. Guys, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Lafitte. Nice to hear you and Raj and the whole team over there. We look forward to hearing a lot more from all of you throughout the afternoon, of course, leading up to that grade one apple blossom later today, Sarah. But we have plenty of action coming up here in New York. We're just a few minutes away from the first race of the day, and we'll get a chance to meet the field for the opener at the Big A, starting with one half of the favored entry, heavily favored, Diva Banker. Yeah, this entry makes a lot of sense on paper, and it may be Hydra that's taking a little yeah. bit more of the money, her stable mate in here, but both of them do have a legitimate shot to win this race. And there is Hydra dropping down to the $12,500 level. And her race two back was just a really solid effort. She disposed of other speed in there. She was forwardly placed. A little tougher last time as well. Where did that last win come from Trade Secret? And I think that's a very fair question to <laughs> ask against inferior company as well and kind of a big step up in numbers than we've seen from her in a long time. A big drop in class for Freddie Mo Factor. And the problem I have with her is that when she's dropped in the past, she still really hasn't mm -hmm. woken up and been effective. Here is backed by gold. First start since August in Saratoga. I think you can make some excuses for this horse at a price over her last couple of races. She has some going way back that would fit. And to the outside, cutting back in distance, here's a fun name, Peachy Weechy. <laughs> yeah, this is one that I could really not make a case for, mm -hmm. but she did win two starts ago at Parks. That's the field for the opener. Early pick five starting here. Three to five on the entry right now. So we welcome in the third member of our team here in New York, champion jockey Richard Migliori. Richie, can we get around the entry in the opener? Well, I do think that out of the two, the one diva banker just makes a nicer physical impression. I love the way she warmed up. She looks terrific. I'm always a bit reluctant to pick horses or even an entry that's three to four at this point uh, lower level but out of the two diva banker makes a really nice impression the 1a hydra who i do think could play out to be the speed of the speed here um, well hydra to me could look a bit more hydra rated hydrated she just doesn't she just looks a little bit too dry her coat's a little bit turned for me completely the opposite with the one diva banker the four freddie mo factor i tell you eduardo jones his horses always look good and this eight-year-old mare looks fantastic and i think she's just dropping down to a realistic spot and i'm going to pick her at seven to one because she checked the boxes physically and on that drop in class and sometimes when horses have to work hard to maintain their position they tend to get discouraged and get 
give up. I don't think she's going to have to work that hard to find herself in a good spot uh, with this group. I, I thought she was a little bit interesting. And the six, Peachy Weechy, I, I have to say, she really looks terrific. Uh, Greg Dupreme is starting her for the second time. Quick turnaround. She really looked good. I, I don't particularly care for her that much on paper, but I would have been remiss not to mention her because she just looks so good in the flesh. Coming back pretty quickly from her last race, as Richie mentioned, just a nine-day turnaround for Peachy Weechi, who will cut back in distance. And yeah, Sarah, as you said, it, it's a little bit tough on paper. She ran at this level last time, though you can say going a mile where she'll cut back in distance today. Exactly. And maybe you think that she just didn't really prefer trying to stretch out in distance as primarily she has been better sprinting throughout the past in her career. I just kind of wonder where she fits from a class standpoint. Coming into New York, She's been a little bit more effective out of town. I think sometimes it's always a guessing game to see how does that parks form or, or Maryland form really translate over here to Aqueduct. As far as Hydra is concerned on paper, as Richie mentioned, she does look to be the one who should be forwardly placed and might be kind of the key of the entry, though, Richie from a physical perspective, preferring the stable mate. Yeah, I mean, it's always interesting to hear that point of view of who looks a little bit better out there in the flesh, because on paper to me, Hydra has the one up on Diva Banker, but both of them, I mean, you can make a case for mm -hmm. either. Three to five on the entry as we move closer to the starting gate. The number three trade secret taking some attention as well and wondering, can she repeat that effort that we saw from her last time out? It was a good race. I mm -hmm. mean, carried nine wide, maybe a little bit dramatic, but she was out in the center of the racetrack <laughs> in there and did really make up a lot of ground in the later stages. I just kind of wonder if this might be a tougher spot. Loading in for the first race of the day here at Aqueduct on this Saturday afternoon. We send it up to Chris Griffin standing by with the call. Backed by gold. Hydra. Pichiwichi. Is in. All set. And they're off. Good speed from Hydra towards the outside. Scott Company immediately here from back by gold. There, a quick one, two off of them. Green cap, that's Peachy Weechi up on the far outside. Trying to join them here at the rail. Is going to take back his Diva Banker. Couldn't get through there. Is now back in the fourth spot as a shared fourth with Trade Secret. Freddie, Mo Factor, but they are tightly packed. About two and a half would cover them all as they approach four furlongs left to go. Backed by Gold has got the lead, but plenty of pressure towards the outside from Hydra in the two path. Three wide. Peachy Weechi is cruising along here at nine to two. Three across the racetrack here, well into the far turn, into the opener as they're trying to catch the front three. Under a drive, it's Trade Secret to the outside there of an all-in Diva Banker. Freddie Mo Factor still the trailer. And backed by Gold is towards the inside. Peachy Weechi towards the outside. The favorites are in between them as Hydra's trying to battle on. Diva Banker is right there trying to get to the entry mate as well. But it's backed by Gold. The big long shot's still there. Peachy Weechi down the center of the racetrack. Hydra just can't cut in the margin and trying to catch them all as Trade Secret on the grandstand side. It's Peachy Weechi who's now put a nose in front. Backed by Gold. Battles on. Not giving in. Peachy Weechi backed by Gold. Down to the line. Backed by Gold. Backed by Gold. Comes back. Wins the photo. Over Peachy Weechi, tight for third. Nice photo and a long shot in the opener and one minute, 11 seconds flat. Backed by Gold, she was off the layoff and she was ready. Sarah able to hold off the closing Peachy Weechi, who maybe was a little bit reluctant to go by anyway. True, but I mean, you have to say that she really looked a lot better than her last race where she was trying to go a route of ground. I think that they will be keeping her sprinting from now on where she can be more effective and maybe compete on this circuit because that was a good effort from her defeating some of the more logical horses. And I did take a swing with this horse thinking that I liked her to be more forward in this spot, but I, I really like this ride from Sammy Camacho on this circuit. He's been so aggressive with a lot of horses that don't necessarily seem like they're going to be the speed on paper and he's been able to make it work for him with some big prices absolutely 13 to 1 great call sarah peachy weechy who got some high marks from richie as far as her physical appearance she went off at nine to two actually as well and as you mentioned did improve sprinting it was five six three 
1A, the heavily favored entry. Hydra will have to settle for fourth. All right, Lafitte, we had an upset in the opener here at Aqueduct, the favorite at Oaklawn in the first race, wondering what the theme's gonna be for the rest of the day. The theme's gonna be Sarah's giving out $28 horses, Raj. She, she, she's turning up the, the pressure. Great pick by you. Sarah. I, I picked the winner. Uh, unfortunately, it was only four to five, <laughs> but a winner is a winner. A win is a win. And for Christian Torres, the winning rider, could be a big afternoon. Yeah. Tejano twist a little bit later on in the count fleet and taxed in the grade one apple blossom. How is he able to boot the favorite home in the opener? Well, a slow start, which is customary to this filly, but Kristen really stayed after her and got her to kick in her best stride when it mattered most. But th this ride of ducking to the inside where the pat was clear was it where the race was won by Kristen. What a meet he has had. The, the chase for an Oakland riding title decided weeks, weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, he took his success last year, which was he won the meet very impressively um, by a big amount of wins. And he, you know, par parlayed that into another successful meet. As a young up and coming star in this game, this, this is a jockey that is going to make his presence felt here for years to come. Off and running at Oak Lawn Park, Savage Darling strikes as we're just getting started on this Apple Blossom Saturday in Hot Springs. Still to come, you'll meet free like a girl. Okay, so not free, but very inexpensive. So what's she doing running with the big girls in the Apple Blossom? And by the way, she's owned in part by a 12-year-old. And jockey Ricardo Santana, Rajiv sits down with the six-time Count Fleet winning jockey. What will it take to win a seventh with Skelly? Two of Santana's Count Fleet wins Courtesy of Whitmore, the Conor McGregor of Thurbert Racing in his day. Fan favorite, Oakland legend, now retired. So what's he been up to? Those stories and much more, all leading up to the 60th running of the Grade 1 Apple Blossom Handicap. We're back on America's Day at the Races, brought to you by Naira Bets. You can bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Get started at NairaBets.com as we take a look 
at the New York City skyline as we're here at New York City's racetrack. Race one in the books at Aqueduct, and it was an upset 13 to 1 with the number five backed by Gold, top pick by Sarah, as this horse was ready to roll off the bench for Pat Quick, not having run since August. No, and there were a couple of excuses you could say that her last few races just maybe she'd be a little bit better than those efforts. But what I really liked was this ride by Sammy Camacho Jr. to get her into mm -hmm. position early on in this race and not be intimidated by some other horses that on paper looked to be forward. He was committed to having that early speed and being in that position and able to hold off the oncoming Peachy Weechy for the victory. And when you defeat a short priced entry like that in any multis, you're pretty happy going forward. $29.60 winner, a good way to start the day. Race number one in the books here at Aqueduct. Plenty more to come. And we'll turn our attention back over to Oaklawn Park. You could say it's in their blood for North America's all-time winning is trainer Steve Aswison. His sons, Keith and Eric, are battling it out on the racetrack. Truly a family affair. Spun to run. His brilliant speed figures were among the fastest of any three-year-old at a mile or more. Eddie Hales from the legendary Danzig Sire Line. Now, this multiple graded stakes winner, millionaire, and Breeders' Cup champion is passing his remarkable talent along to his progeny. 95, 5, 200, 200, 200, 200, the back, Patrick, 200,000, thank you. Spun to run, standing at Gainesway. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. This proven son of Giants Causeway has sired seven millionaires. With over 10% stakes performers, his recent top runners include Tarabi, placed in the Grade 1 Spin Away and Breeders' Cup Juvenile Fillies, Grade 2 winner Plum Ali, plus these standout performers. A proven value sire, first samurai, standing at Claiborne Farm. to have you with us on America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2, as always, brought to you in part by Hillendale. Adalapa. Horses in the paddock, 11 minutes out till the second. We check in with Maggie. Here with Eric Asmussen, about to get a leg up from his Hall of Fame dad. And Eric, got out to an auspicious start here. You actually had the bug, which your brother did not. Yes, I get the opportunity to ride with the bug, and I am very tall, so the lightest I can tack is 117, which I will be doing today, but it does allow me to get the advantage in races like this one. What's it like riding with your brother? Well, I try and kick his butt, but that's, that's quite hard to do lately. He's been quite on fire, so I'm just trying to look like him. Well, you're doing a great job riding as much as possible. Go get him out there and getting a leg up from your dad. It's got to be extra special. No, it's it's the best. It's it's crazy. This is my job. It's just a blast. Well, Eric, it, keep wearing that smile. Good luck here. Thank you so much. Eric Asmussen will be riding against his brother in here, but still for the same team, guys, for dad. He wants to kick his brother's butt first and foremost, <laughs> right? Eric Asmussen. Steve Asmussen, there's dad talking to his boys. Asmussen represented by a pair of, of, of runners and children. Keith riding number two, go out, oh, go. Eric rides number nine, Tariko. Raj, what a proud moment for North America's all-time leading trainer. 
and one of the most celebrated families in thoroughbred racing. Yeah, and it goes to show you, you know, the family affair makes it even so much nicer winning races with your family. I've been in that position. My father is a trainer. I've rode races for him, and my brother was a jockey as well. And the first time I rode a race with my brother, we got in the starting gate, and we just looked over at each other and just kept laughing. It was, <laughs> it was more like a comedy show. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's got to be something special for them to be together racing at this level. It's like he's uh, putting his kids on the bus to go to school. Yeah. Except they get paid for it. Yeah, exactly. Riders <laughs> up. There you see Steve and Eric aboard Tarico. Big smile. These moments, so special and what a great story to follow. We, we've seen it with the Davises. We've seen it with the Ortiz. And just that rivalry amongst the siblings, though, pretty much across the board, general consensus. All right, if I can't win, I just want to beat my brother or sister. Yeah, I mean, that sibling rivalry, even if there was no money on the line, right, <laughs> even if they weren't riding for purses, just be competing against each other, you do have that si sibling rivalry. You do want to beat out your brother all the time, be the head of the household, so to say. You we'll know. see uh, which, uh, which son finishes in front of the other. And Paul pointed this out to me yesterday. I hadn't realized. You know what kind of meat. Keith Asmussen is having at Oakland, second in the standings. But Paul pointed out to me he is ninth in earnings on the year. He, he's had a bigger year in earnings than Joel Rosario at this point. Yeah, in, in the national stage, I mean, he's making a big impact. Oakland has the, one of the best purse structures at this time of the year, so the top jockeys here are definitely going to have a big say in, at a national level. But for a young jockey, that's a big deal, man. To be in the top ten in, in the country is pretty amazing. We'll see him again in the post parade. Mahoney Road kicks things off, owned and trained by Cody Rosine. Number two, go auto go Asmussen runners in 10 of 12 races today. Yeah, this is the speedier of the two Asmussens. I think this one's going to be really close to the pace early. My uncle Leon, leading rider Christian Torres. Yeah, big drop in class, had a tough trip off a long layoff last time, and the leading rider retains the mount. And Run Smitty runs second in his last pair. Long layoff for this one as well. Hasn't raced in over seven months and um, first time for the new trainer. Vale, popular for skiers, popular for climbing trainers. Yeah, this morning line favorite. He's only has one win in 18 lifetime start, but he always runs a good race. Western Ghent needs to step it up. Yeah, one of the other speed horses in this race is going to be a part of the early pace. Spurrier, the old ball coach, lightly raced four-year-old gelding. Yeah, a two-year layoff for this four-year-old gelding, but he's taking a big drop in class. Eight is out, Summer in Aiken. Tariko Asmussen's all-around owns, trains, rides. The other Asmussen on horse. I'm expecting that one thing Steve Asmussen said to his two sons, don't get in an early speed duel. Just don't get into speed duel. Don't get into early Stay speed duel. You don't want to see that. Two minutes out. Race number six. Apple Blossom Saturday at Oaklawn Park. Good crowd expected. One of the biggest days of the season. Count Fleet ahead. Apple Blossom still ahead. So many layers, so many stories to the headline events this afternoon, including a free like a girl coming up free like a girl's partial owner is only 12 years old but has formed an amazing bond with this horse that has already accomplished so much that's coming up on america's day at the races on fox sports 2.
Back just in time on this gorgeous Saturday in Hot Springs. You're watching America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. We were trying to convince Maggie to do a hit from the bouncy house. We're still waiting on confirmation. Maybe you can do some arm twisting there, Raj. Yeah, that would be a good spot for Maggie over there. She'll do it. I think she, I think she wants to do it. But first, we have to hear her thoughts on this a second race at Oakland. $25,000 claimers, non-winners, two lifetime, six for a long dash. There she is. Maggie, what are you noticing in the warm-up? And may maybe we'll get you in the bouncy house later this afternoon. We're on for like nine hours. You know I'm a champion truth or dare player, Lilifeed. I am going to the bouncy castle. You dared me, it's on. Just not now. Uh, there's a quick turnaround. So let's take a look at some of the horses here on the track for this second race. And the two horses taking, at least as of now, the bulk of the play, I can't say I'm particularly their biggest fans. Now, I do like number three, my uncle Leon, and, and he makes it a great deal of sense here. Um, I, I like him from the physical sense. He looks fantastic second off the bench, well-muscled, and just, you know, looks like a fit and strong horse having that race under his belt. He was slow into stride, turning back to the six furlongs. Um, he was a cur encouraged around the turn and just really could not make up any ground behind a gate-to-wire winner in Zambezi. My problem is the distance. I mean, that race looked like a kind of prep race. Let's get him fit to stretch him out. And arguably his best races on figures, so on and so forth, have been going long. This horse wants to run long. He might just win because of the class relief here. I get it, but I'm not a fan um, of the distance at six furlongs for him. And number four in here, Run Smitty Run, a horse that I'm fairly familiar with from up in New York. He's coming off of a voided layoff. Uh, this was not the trainer, or, excuse me, uh, I, I don't know how he necessarily ended up in Michael Hewitt's barn, but last time uh, we saw him, the horse born flawless, decent runner that he finished second to. He went on to win three of his next four starts, and Run Smitty Run, while that horse was on the front end, was able to rally quite well. But that was back in September, and for me, this horse just looks as though he needs to strengthen up. He looks very weak across his top line. Things that I have seen from him in the past where that it looks as though he, he, he struggled with. But again, he's just not making the greatest impression at a short price. And also, there's the argument that I mean, other than his last race, is he a little bit better of a turf horse, which Churchill Downs is very kind to horses who like the turf a bit more. I'm going to go with the kind of proven sprinter. I know he was a little bit disappointing when dropping to this level last time, but number two, Go Auto Go for the Asmussen team. This one with Keith aboard. That race won by the favorite. Yeah, he was steadied slightly when the horse who eventually finished second kind of brushed him a bit, but I feel like he was always going to finish third that day. But he just looks the best um, here overall. As uh, we see uh, the bouncy castle, if he, it's calling my name. I, I mean, I, I think my daughters might be a little bit jealous that mommy got to go play in a, a, a bouncy castle today. They're, they're, they're going to be jealous because because we're going we're gonna to make sure it happens. Maggie in the bouncy house at some point, Raj, between now and 7 o'clock. Or we have to make this happen. Why does Maggie get to have all the fun? You can go, too. It's right you know, there. Like, it's like <laughs> less than 100 yards from our set. I think uh, Acacia and uh, Sarah, they're going to be jealous that Maggie's <laughs> over here bouncing around and they're sitting behind the desk. <laughs> so you wonder what we do in between races here at Oaklawn, like 20, 25 minutes in between races? That's where we're at. Exactly. Something for everybody at Oaklawn. And uh, for the handicappers, well, they have the, the, this second race coming up and this $25,000 claiming event. Um, I thought it was significant, Raj, that Maggie pointed out with Run Smitty Run, one of the key contenders at three to one, a, a lot like not to like, maybe better on another surface. Just one for 17, doesn't love the way he looks, perhaps opening up opportunity for another and, and your top selection number three, who has now emerged as the favorite in my uncle Leon. Yeah, I mean, those are some key factors on horses that are a short price. It's not as if um, Run Smitty Run is a long shot. He has a lot of blemishes for one of the favorites. Um, but my Uncle Leon, I picked this horse because of uh, the many things that Maggie said as well. He's a second race off the layoff. He had some significant trouble early on in his, his most recent race. He drops in class. 
uh, I think that that's a great formula for success. Race number two, filing into the gate. The Asmussen brothers going head to head. Keith on number two, go auto go. Eric on Tarico. Here's Matt Dinneman. Good beginning. Spurrier in the green jacket gets the first call. Is going to the front here. Tarico strides in second. Western get third. And then comes Mahoney Road. He's with Go Auto Go. Run Smitty Run and Vale. They're side by side. And my Uncle Leon gets shuffled to the back of the pack while being encouraged to pick up the pace down the back stretch. They're separated by nine lengths. And Spurrier has a head lead. Tarico, though, as I say that, moves up on the outside and sticks a nose in front. Spurrier holds the inside spot. And these two spar into the far turn run. They've opened up two and a half on Western Ghent. Vale makes his way a joint third, takes that third position from Western Ghent, who's under pressure. Two back to go, auto go. Mahoney Road. My Uncle Leon is sent along, attempts to pass runners, but has a lot of work to do. Run Smitty Run has been outrun as they come to the top of the lane. Tarico Spurrier still going at it. They're off the turn is one. Vale has gotten a good setup. He charges down the grandstand side and he passes the early leaders and goes to the front. He's going to have to hold off my Uncle Leon, though who's coming with a late charge. It's Vale in front. My Uncle Leon on the outside continues a forward progressive move. And now my Uncle Leon is swept to the front. My Uncle Leon, Christian Torres, the early double for him. Vale was second, Western Ghent third, Mahoney Road fourth. Torres, two for two on the afternoon. Rajiv, two for two on the afternoon. My Uncle Leon deuces all around by two-time Breeders' Cup Sprint winner, Midnight Loot, strikes in the second. Yeah, and it, very similar to the first race, um, coming from well off the pace, Christian Torres got this. This horse didn't have a good break again, which he's accustomed to breaking slow, but he got him in gear and um, he timed it right. Christian has a lot of good mounts today, and it, you know, just adding on to his lead atop the standings. Confidence riding high as it has been for Christian Torres and live mounts in both stakes races. Back to Aqueduct, race number two here, post parade brewing. Acacia, I don't remember seeing a bouncy house in the infield last time I was at the Big A. There are no bouncy houses at Aqueduct Lafitte, unfortunately. But, um, you know, this is New York, so anything's possible, Sarah. As we'll meet the field for race number two, New York Red Maven special weight. This one for the Phillies, starting things off with Mama's Got a Gun. And back in off of a race where she was supposed to run, actually was scratched at the gate, so she's been ready for a moment. Number two, first time starter, La Fiere, I'm guessing. I wonder if this might be a prep for turf season. There's a little mm -hmm. bit more grass pedigree with this one. And then the one as well. The number three, Lake Abenaki. This is a horse that has a little bit of a modest pedigree, half to five time winner. The works aren't so bad. First time starters in the first four posts. Here's another one, Mulkey. And this is the one that's taking all the wagering action for connections that usually do take attention on the tote board. Makes a lot of sense on paper as well. Here's Eastern Star, the other one for the Donk Barn. This is the one that has experience, but you just have to think that one of these first time starters might be a little bit faster than her last two races. And long shot second time starter, Hidden War Dance. Well, she went off at 49 to one first time out. It's not as though there were high expectations and she's a big price again today. Three to five on the first time starter. That was fun getting a chance to see the Asperson brothers riding against one another. We'll have Davis siblings riding against each other in the nightcap today with Dylan Davis and Katie Davis represented, which is always fun and um, always been a fun storyline to follow with the Davis family here in New York, too. And every time we show that feature, you can really just tell how proud their father is of everyone's mm -hmm. accomplishments in the family and that they've all been able to really make those careers flourish going forwards. And there is Dylan Davis. He'll be aboard first time starter Lake Abenaki in this upcoming second race. For more in this field, let's check in track set with Richie. Man, what I would have given to ride against my brothers, guys, that would have been something to see. But alas, not meant to be. The three, Lake Abenaki, really making a nice impression. Very well turned out here. A pedigree that screams speed by Central Banker out of a hook and ladder mare, a homebred from a, a, a horse that was bred, excuse me, by Chester Mary Broman and sold at auction, but very sharp looking uh, and, and making a nice impression. The four Mulkey taking all of uh, the money here. That means that this horse has kind of tipped her hand, that she has ability in her morning trials. She is by Gunrunner. Two Gunrunners in here. It's just a 
really premier sire, Gunrunner, the one also Mama's Got a Gun by Gunrunner. Mulkey out of a mare. This is her first foal, but did win on debut. I like when there's precocity in the family. And then the five, Eastern Star, the one with experience, usually flashes good speed. I like speed in situations like this. And if you don't trust the firsters, I think this is where you've got to land. And that's where I landed on the five, Eastern Star. Dave Donk won a race yesterday, and he's a trainer that tends when things start going good. His whole barn wakes up, and they start running. Nice win for him yesterday. Let's see if he can continue with that successful uh, pass today. Richie, thank you. Eastern Star, the most experienced one in the field, and she does have that always dangerous commodity of speed. Will be interesting to see, Sarah, what some of the firsters do as far as showing early foot. Exactly, and I think the workout, even though it was a long time ago when the number four Mulkey sold, you have to imagine that this is a horse that could have early speed if they want to be intent on using it based on how she worked when she sold at Fasic Tipton Timonium because there isn't a ton of pedigree for this horse. I know that she is a gun runner, but there isn't much going mm -hmm. on in terms of the damn side pedigree. For her to go for the price that she did, she must have at least been an impressive physical and she worked well coming in. I know we haven't seen her in a little bit of time since that sale, but you have to imagine that one of these first time starters might be able to show some speed. She moved very well in the work out talking about the four mulky but she never switched leads which I, I don't love to see now she wasn't asked too much to switch in that workout going 10 and 1 um, you will often see a little bit slower times at the timonium sale because it's on a dirt track as opposed to a synthetic track like OBS sales are so 10 and 1 is is a very quick workout um, by comparison and yeah she did have a high purchase price Rocky policy I actually remember covering her races when she ran in the Maryland million races uh, when I believe Dale Capuano had her towards the start of her career she was an honest man but like you said, not necessarily a, a big graded stakes type and for that, that purchase price. Really a producer in yeah. terms of what has been you know, on the racetrack so far. So I think that she's she's fine, and clearly there must be something else going on outside of pedigree. The number one mama's got a gun, another gun runner uh, for New York Red Maiden Special Weight. You've got two gun runners in here, but this one, as we touched on in the post parade, the bottom side, much more turf meant. Yeah, and just had some more success going further as mm -hmm. well. So I kind of wonder if this is just a starting point for this horse. Top pick for you? Uh, I went to the four. I have I have exhausted my creative juices in the first race. <laughs> hey, you gave out one. $29 winner to start the day. You can coast a little bit for a while now as we have the fun New York Bread Maiden special weight race for the Phillies coming up. There is Eastern Star with the most experience and that early speed. We'll see who gets their graduation cap today in race number two. New York Bread Maiden special weight up next. Here's Chris Griffin. Mama's got a gun. Inside runner. Jose Lascano. Loading without the rider. Backs away. And in. All set. Speed towards the outside there, Mulkey and Eastern Star, who bobbled just a touch at the start, and they're a clear one-two just off of them as Lake Abenaki, and towards the inside of that one comes Lafayette. Towards the back end, that's Mama's Got a Gun, and the early trailer, Hidden War Dance, as the front two skip away, and they're joined by Lake Abenaki there from third. But the leader, that's Mulkey. It's Mulkey, who's the favorite, is up by three-quarters of a length. Pressure to the outside from Eastern Star, 22-3 and three for that pressured opening quarter mile. Lake Abenaki gets the nice trip, is coasting right there from third, is now a length and a half behind the battling duo. They are about 10 lengths in front of the rest. Mama's got a gun, moves towards the inside here of Lafayette, and towards the back end still the trailer. That's Hidden War Dance. The front two continue to throw it down and try to join them three wide as Lake Abenaki holding the rail. That's Mulkey. The favorite's got the lead. In between horses, here comes Eastern Star. Lake Abenaki with that dream journey up on the outside. Sitting just off of those pace setters has now got the favorite in sights. It's Mulkey who battles on, but Lake Abenaki at 6-1 to one has now put a neck in front. It's Lake Abenaki and Della Davis kicking away inside the final 16th. Lake Abenaki can open up by two. Lake Abenaki. Wins it. Mulkey second, then came Eastern Star holding on for third over an oncoming Mama's Got a Gun.
in 1 minute 11.50 seconds. Speaking of the Davis siblings, Dylan Davis with the win here in race number two, Lake Abenaki, first time starter. She got a perfect trip sitting just behind those pace setters, Sarah. It's like we're conjuring up our own feature angles I to know. succeed in races. <laughs> it's like we just built this out of nowhere, but no, she got a great setup in this race, dueling front runners ahead of her, able to sit just off of them and make that run. And I was saying to you, you could tell that that first time starter that was taking all that money, she was getting a little bit leg weary in the stretch and this one just went right on by. You could see her tiring late Mulkey. She did show speed right off the bat um, coming out of the gate there. And at one to two, we'll have to settle for second, a six to one first time starter, Lake Abenaki getting the win on debut for Rob Falcone, who's a co-owner of this one as well. Three, four, five, one in race number two. Well, we've had some good prices in the first couple of races here at Aqueduct, but don't worry, the party continues over at Oaklawn Park, and we'll learn a little bit more of the history of the Apple Blossom, taking a look at By the Numbers as fans are out in full force, enjoying the gorgeous day in Hot Springs, Arkansas, even a bachelorette party, and a lot more to come after this. Country Pig 5 combines the best racing from New York with top races from around the country in one bet. Find it in your track venue and play every race day. Races are posted weekly at nightwear.com slash cross country. Racelens is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. Racelens, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. Zandon's poetry in motion, big horse, but light on his feet. And he's always showed up and been consistent and been right there with some of the top horses in training. In the Bluegrass Stakes, he showed his determination and his raw ability. It's over. Zandon wins the Toyota Bluegrass. I feel breeders will be really blown away by what a striking, outstanding looking horse he is. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state-bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info. Welcome back to America's Day at the races. So glad to have you with us as we just saw a fun New York bred maiden special weight for the Phillies. And it was a first time starter, Lake Abenaki, sitting just off the pace setters and gets the job done. Yeah, great ride by Dylan Davis in here to sit just off the pace. Two horses that were really going at it early on in this race. And she just got that nice trip in the catbird seat stocking. It was pretty professional in this effort. And I love seeing a horse when you get very close to the end of the race, just one ear come forward and mm -hmm. be like, oh, I'm, I'm doing very well. I'm winning. I'm doing <laughs> great in here. And she had that coming up in this spot. And it was a good effort. Lake Abenaki in the Adirondacks in New York upstate. And uh, her namesake gets the job done here. Lake Abenaki by Central Banker. First time starter. $15.60 winner. The favorites upset in the first two races so far. We'll see if the trend continues as we take a look at the field for race number three today. Couple of horses at five to two. So not so much of a heavy favorite in this third race. Night Effect and Mighty Atlas both taking attention. This is a mile on the main track. A starter allowance for three-year-olds and upward here in this upcoming third race. A little bit more of a wide open affair. Yeah, absolutely. You can really make a case for most of the horses in this race. I couldn't really come up with the one, but 
everybody else you could at least make possible on paper in this spot. And I think that there is, it'd be interesting to see how much speed is really shown in this race by some of these horses. It'll be a contentious sort of jockey's race to ride. See how it plays out in the upcoming third race here in New York. But being Apple Blossom Day over at Oaklawn Park, let's take a look at By the Numbers, the Apple Blossom historic race with its first running in 1969. The mighty Azari has won the race three times in 2002, 2003, and 2004. Alan Paulson boasting the most wins for an owner with four, and Bill Mott, the most wins for a trainer, also with four. Mike Smith has won the Apple Blossom a remarkable seven times, the most recent of which was in 2019 with Midnight Bisu. Four Apple Blossom winners have gone on to win a Breeders' Cup race, and it's some list. Bayakoa, Paseana, Azeri, and Zenyatta. And how about this? 16 winners of the Apple Blossom have been named champion in the same year. You could forget that gutsy win in 2019 by Midnight Bisu over Escape Clause. And three, yes, Three Apple Blossom winners were named Horse of the Year, Azari, Zenyatta, and Have to Grace. And for a race for Phillies and Mayors to see three winners of the Apple Blossom be not just a champion, but Horse of the Year is really remarkable. And I think it really just speaks to the quality of horse that's run in this race over the years and where trainers really do want to target this race as being one of the bigger steps on the road for a campaign for their older fillies and mares. And this year, maybe it's a little bit lacking in some of the star power we've had in past years, but it's still a pretty competitive wagering event. It'll be exciting to see if Adare Man or Dare Manor can actually mm -hmm. be the one to bring that California form in and translate that over to a successful run at Oakland. It is our America's best racing race of the week the grade one apple blossom will be race 11 today at oaklawn park a mile and a 16th for the phillies and mares four and up sarah touched on adair manor she's nine to five on the morning line it'll probably be a short price come post time we'll take a look though at an overachieving philly by collected tax originally claimed for 50000 and this is one of the beautiful things about the sport of horse racing, Sarah, that you can claim a horse, you can end up with the Black Eyed Susan winner, a horse that is coming in off the back of a win and into the grade one apple blossom and uh, going up against some tough company in a salty division. And I like that she came back and had this prep in this sprint race and something that we hadn't really seen her do ever in her career before, but she was able to come back with a nice statement, rallying from far back back in that field and able to sort of resurface as one of those horses that might be making a say later on in the division. We'll see what she can do facing older company for just the second time and in a tough group in the grade one. Apple Blossom Tax will go from post number two with Christian Torres, who has swept the early double at Oaklawn Park so far. Skelly, wet paint, they're graded stakes winners last year in 2023. They're looking to keep their names up on that wall and pick up their own stakes wins this year in 2024. We'll talk a little bit more about them and a lot more coming up at Oakland after this.
Diaz, Bordenero, and Richard Migliori show the way. Junior College is three quarters of a length back in second. Semaphore Man is tucked in at the rail third. Off duty is next. Then it's Bach Ride and Rodeos Castle. Midway on the turn, and it's still Portanero leading at Junior College, hanging right in there. Off duty moves up with Semaphore Man. And here they come into the stretch of the Count Fleet Sprint Handicap. Half mile and 45 and one. Portanero leading the way. Junior College wants to challenge him to the outside. Semaphore Man not through along the rail. To the extreme outside, off duty is next to Furlong to go. The leader's Bordenero. Semaphore Man's got some courage if he can get through along the inside. It's Bordenero leading it. Semaphore Man trying to test him, but Bordenero's just so tough, and Bordenero's going to win it by half. Bordenero in the 2007 Count Fleet All Heart, and he's a two time winner of the race, Sarah, and this year, Richard Migliori aboard. Pretty incredible, right? Yeah. He, I bet he loves seeing all those flashbacks of all his great rides. <laughs> Richie, terrific ride, and what a gutsy performance from Bordonero in that Count Fleet, digging in to hold off all challengers. Uh, yeah, he had horses to the left of him, horses to the right of him, and he just kept sticking his head out, his neck out, wanting to win, didn't want to get past. And the horse that uh, was on the inside, Sephamore man, a uh, terrific ride, Tim Ducey there, wound up winning the race in back-to-back -back years the next two years. So he was facing a legitimate racehorse in Sephamore man and Bordenero, trained by Bill Spar, just an incredible horseman. I was so fortunate to wind up riding a lot of his horses when I was out in California and uh, showing a lot of confidence in me to give me the mount on his best horse at that time. So you know, a really good memory and a very, very game performance. A good memory indeed. And he was one of the two-time winners as we look at multiple Count Fleet Stakes winners. Whitmore just absolutely dominating the Count Fleet. Uh, one day they need to rename every sprint race at Oakland after Whitmore. I know there is the Whitmore now, but it's just amazing to look back. And of course, Bordenero, as we said, a two-time winner. And Skelly could potentially add his name to the list as he did take the Count Fleet last year. And he's just been so cool to follow with the speed that he brings to the table and the consistency that he has as well. And I don't really think that he disgraced himself running second over in Saudi. And of course, this was his first start of the year where he was able to be successful, kind of pick right back up where he started. And you have to imagine as well that Steve Asmussen is not going to have all of his runners duel each other into the ground on the front end. And I think that he is likely the fastest of those three. And I know that there have been questions brought up about him coming back after running in Saudi in the Riyadh dirt sprint with the ship, with the big race, with the big effort. It's not like Steve Asperson is looking for a horse to run. He has two others in here. It's not like he needs to run a horse in this race. So there's no doubt in my mind that he's not going to run Skelly unless he feels like he's ready to potentially win. Exactly. And, and he's a trainer that does have that more patient approach, approach in general. And we, we're not going to see his horses in spots where he doesn't think that they can be successful. You don't become the winningest trainer in North America by not spotting your horses effectively. And he's a horse, Skelly, that sometimes can drift a little bit. More on that later, too, throughout this afternoon. We'll see if Skelly can add his name to the list of multiple Count Fleet winners. We head back to today, race three, coming up next at Oaklawn Park, going six furlongs, $8,000 claimer, four-year-olds and upward, meeting the field, Sarah, starting off with Get Back Goldie. I feel like this horse's better surface is really the grass. The dirt race is just not super competitive here. Here's the two, Otis, Otis, Otis. <clears throat> this is a horse that is getting a little bit of class relief. The last couple of races, though, not exactly inspiring. Square deal cuts back in distance. I do like that. I don't necessarily love much else about this horse's recent form. <laughs> Always finding something positive. <laughs> love to win. He has done that. Five for 16 lifetime. Big regression last time, but always a very dangerous claiming outfit mm -hmm. going to Carl Broberg. Here is Starburst. What color is the best? Red. Yeah, I agree. Okay, red, cool. red, red Sour Patch, red for most kids. I agree. I yeah. agree. Smoking hot, cutting back in distance. <laughs> the important, important stuff the important that we get conversations, here. Yeah. A speed and fade last time. Can he sustain some of that? Here's Raymond. And this horse ran well in his last couple of starts. More of the consistent type for this level. Tiger Dad, pretty fitting uh, Steve Asmussen trains where his son <laughs> Keith riding. <laughs> All in the family, owns as well. Yep. <laughs> and full authority, two to one favorite right now. 
Yeah, this horse went off at a short price last time, was able to get the job done, has a little bit of a freshening. We'll see what we get switching barns over to Matt Scherr. Christian Torres looking to sweep the early pick three as well as he's won the first two races on the card so far. That's a favorite full authority. Well, yesterday he tried to hide it from us, but Paula Duca celebrated a birthday and DeLuca's Pizza did a delivery of the birthday celebration to Oakland Park today. Pretty incredible, right? Yeah. I mean, it might not be the bounce house, but there's still some <laughs> excitement going on for Polly and With I know the he... celebratory cannoli. Perfect. I mean, that looks good. Yeah. <laughs> I got a chance to, to go to DeLucas for the first time when I was there for the Rebel. It is amazing, just as good as they say. If Paul is with us, Paul, happy, happy birthday. And that's pretty cool. They brought the party to you. Yeah, they tricked me, Acacia and Sarah. They tricked me as can be. They said our mics were something messed up with our mics. Something was messed up with our Unity, which is what we are do our programming th uh, through. And they tricked me. They got over, over to that tent. But I want to thank you to Eric Donovan, uh, V over there, just everybody, Lafitte, Rajiv. They're all part of it. They hatched this plan out last night, supposedly during dinner at DeLuca's and Anthony Valinati just delivered as well and, and him wearing my jersey just top of the cake uh couldn't enjoy it more here at america's day at the races okay we'll try to get you a winner here in race number three and you know uh, the six and the seven here are kind of interesting horses you know smoking hot get to see a little paco lopez he came by right by me whizzing by warming up his horse whistling at me paco Literally one of the most playful guys you'll see on a racetrack. And, you know, this Dan Ward charge, he usually rides a lot for Dan. And, and this year he's only ridden three times, but he's brought two of them home. So this horse is getting a little bit of money. But when you look at this race, there is a lot of forward horses. There's a lot of horses that look like they don't want to really pass horses. You know, Raymond's horse, yeah, comes out of a nice race, but we've seen horses coming out of the Diodoa barn just regress. So do you want to take that horse at seven to two um the 10 on the outside you know there's a lot of different factors that go in the 10 full authority because you know this horse was actually drifting out in his last two races now the flurry stables they're battling for owners with steve Asmussen. so i would think the 10 is going to fire a big shot here for matt shears getting this horse a little bit of time from a good trainer of great compton and the works aren't like you know, sell me. They're, they're more nice, easy works. You get Christian Torres, the leading rider board. I just, I don't see anything else. The only other horse I could see in here is the four because he's got a couple of races to go back. But again, I just think the 10 gets the best draw. I'm not giving you much here. I'm giving you the two to one favor to Keisha. And again, thank you very much. <laughs> We love to celebrate you, Polly, and you've done such a terrific job throughout the entire winter down there at Ocon Park. By the way, when I was there in the, over the weekend uh, for the Rebel, everybody loves Paul at Ocon. It is amazing. He, he stops, he talks to fans on the rail, they want to talk baseball, they want picks, they want to talk races, and, and it's just so great to see how much the fans really, really appreciate Paul and every, all the work that he does over there. And I think that sometimes in the winter we forget to really have that interaction mm -hmm. with the fans as much because we do have a great crowd come to Aqueduct, but it's not the same as a Saratoga sure. type of crowd. And so for them to have that on track down at Oaklawn and have that experience as well, he's a man of the people down there. And I have to say, I mean, the fans at Oaklawn are fantastic. You know, it's just, it, you can feel it. it. It has that kind of small track feel with some very special and big races and people come from all over maybe they spend the winter down in Arkansas and being there and enjoying uh, what the product is and it's just a, a really happy group of people which is so great to see and I mean to see how crowded it gets on the big days as well. Yeah absolutely and I mean everyone was truly there just to hear all of your Timberlake puns. Oh, I I exhausted every so single much variety. Timberlake or InSync song I could think of. Yeah, I, I think Lafitte is glad that he's off the Derby Trail so he doesn't have to hear me with the Timberlake puns. But when he cuts back in distance, I will be back with a vengeance. All right, race three coming up at Oakland Park. Full authority. Uh, Paul likes his horse as well. And he just, he has Good races on the go back in the mid-Atlantic as well and facing some tougher company and a nice win last out at Oakland. Yeah, he just makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's 
faced much better in terms of class throughout his career than a lot of these horses have come into contact with. He's run faster numbers than a lot of these horses had on a more consistent basis. And he just makes a lot of sense coming in here. If you want to take a shot against him, though, at a short price, I don't blame you. And I think that maybe a horse to do that with would be your second choice in Raymond. He mm -hmm. is in really good form right now. Loading in for race three at Oaklawn Park. Two to one favorite to the outside. We'll see if Christian Torres can keep sweeping the card as he looks for his own natural hat trick. Send it up. Matt Dinnerman standing by with the call. Love to win. Tiger Dad. Full authority to the outside. Here's full authority. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, love to win, wins the start. Broke very alertly and is sent for speed. He's got a narrow lead in the early stages. Smoking hot on the outside, coming up to apply the heat. Raymond runs in the third position, about two off the pace with Starburst. Another two and a half to Tiger Dad. Get back Goldie next in the field with full authority, the favorite on the outside. Square deal between that pair. Otis, Otis, Otis is the trailer with a half mile to go. Love to win is first. Quickens the pace here and hits the four turn, a length and a half in front. Smoking hot, couldn't keep up his back in second in chase mode. Starburst to the inside. A gap of two to Raymond. Fourth now. He's five ahead of Tiger Dad all in. Full authority needs to turn it around. And at the moment, he's just plotting in midfield as they hit the quarter pole. Love to win. Still clear. A length clear of Smoking Hot in the second position. Raymond is underway on the grandstand side. He's charging fast. Smoking hot. Raymond after Love to win with a furlong remaining. Love to win needs to find more. He is. Smoking Hot is second. Raymond outside flattening out a little bit. Love to win. 16th to go under the left-handed encouragement. Opens up two. And Love to win on the class drop. First off the claim for Carl Broberg scores in gate-to-wire fashion. Raymond was second. Photo for third there. Starburst, Smoking Hot, and Full Authority, who came on too late. Galps out okay, but did not hit the board today. Love to win aggressively handled early on in the race, and he lift up to his name, Sarah. A big improvement first off the claim for Carl Groberg. And this is an outfit that we see generally have these horses come into their barn and be able to do something a little bit different with them and be able to get them to improve coming in. And it's not like he had numbers that would put him out of this. It's just that his last race was so bad, yeah. kind of too hard to believe. But the drop in class, aggressive handling, got the job done for the new barn today. Had to face the likes of Jackman two starts back, who was in the Broberg barn and won, I believe, five in a row. And um, yeah, it's certainly turning things around on the class drop and uh, taking charge in the new barn. Finishing up there, Love to Win gets the sixth victory of his career. Back over to Aqueduct, we have race three coming up next. It's the starter allowance, as we mentioned earlier, a very wide open group in here. Two to one favorite right now with Night Effect, a horse that does have quite a bit of early speed as well. We'll take a look at the post parade though, starting with Capital Conquest, who stretches out in distance. This is the one I really couldn't make a case for on paper as this one ships in from Parks. Pennsylvania bread coming out of state bread competition. Here is Night Effect, your favorite. I'm a little bit surprised that this horse is the one taking all of the early money and I guess late money at this point. Has some races that certainly fit though. Next will be debate, second off the layoff, trying to turn things around for Linda Rice. I do like this horse stretching back out in distance. I think that this is more of that one pace type that can at least get himself a little bit more into the race going longer. Here's assume nothing, a good rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, especially <laughs> on the racetrack. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> Has early speed, should be forward, ran well over his last couple of starts. Fighting back, the other Linda Rice runner. Kind of a question mark coming in first off the claim for Linda. Where has he been since being claimed from Brad Cox? We do see him, though, protected in for the starter allowance as well. We'll see what he can do. Here is Mighty Atlas. I think of this group, you could argue that he's faced the best company over his last couple of starts, ran well against some tough horses in Saratoga, ran okay last time, off a little bit of a layoff, and kind of did have to steady in between horses as well. Horses warming up on the track for the upcoming third race. Let's check in with Richie. Uh, yeah, really nice, uh, contentious group here. And we'll start with the three debate. Uh, really good looking son of Flatter. Um, 
like what I see. Extremely well turned out. Um, Eric Cancel uh, give him a nice warm up. I like what I saw there. Uh, the four assume nothing. He's going to be my top selection. He, you know, he was just narrowly beaten last time when he controlled things on the front end. I think there's potential for him maybe to control again on the front end. He was very game. And he's such a nice little balanced individual. He looks like a little sports car to me. Kendrick Carmouche rides him back. Sometimes, you know, a rider like Kendrick learns a little something. They're able to get just a little more uh, out of a horse. Uh, I, I'm going to pick assume nothing, even though... He has accumulated now six seconds as opposed to two wins. And when horses start accumulating more seconds and wins, I do start to question how much they want to be the herd leader. Horses are herd animals, and you can't take that out of them. Some of them want to be the boss, and some are just happy to kind of run with horses. I'm hoping that he breaks through today. And the five fighting back, complete opposite from a physical perspective of the four, assume nothing bigger, a little bit uh, you know, thicker, a, a little bit more substance to him, not kind of as balanced or racy, but he comes off of that big effort last September, comes off the layup. Usually horses like this are better with a run because they do carry a little extra weight. Horse that I'll be looking to see how he does today and follow him back next time. But I'm not, I'm going to assume nothing and go with assume nothing. <laughs> Assuming nothing, Richie, I like it. Horacio de Paz, Kendrick Carmouche teaming up for this one. And he has speed and coming off of a second place finish at this level. Yeah, this horse has run well as of late. There's nothing really to knock about the recent form. And he's been able to be pretty consistent. That race at Laurel, two back, as well as the one here in his last start where he did finish second. And he was the horse that was really doing all of the dirty work on the front end in that race and just got run down late. It'll be interesting to see if anybody else tries to go with him early, if anyone else wants to show some of that early speed, because he does look to have at least a little bit of an advantage in there. Here's the three debate, who's now actually clicked over to your tepid favorite. A couple of horses at two horses at three to one and three horses at seven to two. That's the kind of race that this is. Sarah, I know you had some interest in debate. Yeah, I just like this horse getting a little bit more ground to work with and now second off of a layoff. The race that he was able to win at Keeneland, it was in for a tag and that's the race that Linda Rice did claim him out of. And it was a sprint race where he got a nice setup. The pace was really coming apart in there. But in his earlier races, earlier on in his career, he'd been able to be a little bit closer to the pace and be a little bit more effective by not giving himself so much to do in those races. And I think stretching back out in distance, now second off the layoff, he could possibly get back to some of those races that he was running earlier on in his career. And those could make him effective in this spot. Three to one right now, debate as we'll go back to the four, assume nothing, who we just talked about. And he has that speed. We'll take a look um, at his recent race where he did just miss. And coming out of that race as well is Mighty Atlas, who finished fourth, was kind of chasing outside that day. As you mentioned, assume nothing was the one who did all the heavy lifting on the front end. He did. And, and Mighty Atlas was forward in this race. And he did try to make a run at him. But I think ultimately just had a little bit too too much work to do, a little bit more fitness to find off of the layoff. And you can see things do get a little bit tight for him in here as Grandpa's kid starts to come over, assume nothing does as well. He has to steady back a little bit. He was never winning this race, but I think it's just that pause in momentum, as well as the fact that he was coming off a little bit of a break. Maybe you can expect a little bit more this time out. Five to two now on the number six, Mighty Atlas, who is second off the layoff as well from Mike Mac Mike Maker. Like you said, could potentially be a bit stronger second off the bench, and we'll see if he can build off of that fourth place finish as well. What do you make of the five fighting back? As we touched on, Broker's made in his, in his third start for Brad Cox, was claimed that day in September after winning by seven. We haven't seen him since then, and now he comes back here in this spot for Linda Rice. I guess it's a positive that he's not being dropped dropped in for a tag, mm -hmm. right, for this new barn. But at the same time, Linda Rice is someone that will run her horses if they are ready to go and find a spot. And so the little bit of a break may be cause for pause in here. And also the fact that some of the horses he beat have regressed yep. since that race as well. See how he stacks up against this group. Starter Allowance Company, a wide open third race. Anything can happen. We'll see how it shakes out. Chris Griffin has the call. Fighting back, Mighty Atlas is in. All set. Just opening the front of the gate there was Mighty Atlas. The two to one favorite.
Close the front. Set again. And they're up. Good speed here from Assume Nothing right out towards the front. Just flashing that early speed. Assume Nothing towards the inside. Here comes Night Effect to join that leader and now takes the front. Night Effect has got the lead. Back to second. Assume Nothing at the rail. That's Capital Conquest who's going to track from third as they are well off the rail as they hook up with the back stretch. Mighty Atlas is in the fourth position. It's a moderate tempo early. Debate second to last. The trailer. Fighting back, 23.53. It's mild pressure here from Assume Nothing as Night Effect is doling out the fractions. Night Effect and Jose Gomez doing it nicely so far. Assume Nothing stalking from second, Mighty Atlas in third. Capital Conquest gets the hurry up here at the rail in the fourth position. Patiently ridden is Eric Cancel with the bait. Right there in fifth, and the trailer in a tightly packed field. It's fighting back who starts a move. They picked it up 46.60 for that half mile time. Night effect gets more pressure now. Assume nothing is right there to the outside. Now within a neck of the leader. Three wide there is Mighty Atlas. Capital Conquest is tightly at the rail, is being encouraged to move forward, is still there in fourth. To the outside of that one, that is fighting back the trailer is debate. They get set to reach the top of the stretch and three of them across the racetrack. Night effect to the inside. Assume nothing in between horses. Trying to catch them both is Mighty Atlas on the grandstand side. Capital Conquest now straightens up to chase those leaders fighting back and even from the back was far out of it. Debate. Debate's got the most momentum out of all of them. Mighty Atlas is right there. Assume nothing. Assume nothing with a nose in front. Assume nothing and Mighty Atlas. Now those two shoulder to shoulder. One, two. Assume nothing. Mighty Atlas. Got tight, it's assumed nothing towards the inside. Over Mighty Atlas, then an oncoming debate in one minute, 35 and four. Assume nothing and Kendrick Carmouche get the job done with three horses coming towards the wire, Sarah. It looked like nobody really wanted to win that much, but Kendrick took assume nothing out to engage the six Mighty Atlas and he dug in. He did, and we were kind of surprised that they were allowing Night Effect to be the one doling out those fractions pretty comfortably by himself early on in this race, taking Assume Nothing just slightly off of the pace while not taking him too far out of things early. And it was a winning move. It paid off because he had just enough at the end to outlast Mighty Atlas, who was running at him towards the outside. Top pick from Richie, Assume Nothing, and Kendrick Carmouche get the job done over Mighty Atlas that March 13th. March 15th race, excuse me, turns out to be pretty fruitful. Both of those horses coming out of that race won by St. James. It was four, six, three, two, as we'll take another look at assume nothing close up there. And that's the moment when Kendrick kind of takes him off of the number two night effect who was stalling at that point, engages the six mighty Atlas and they fight it out towards the wire. He realized who the competition was right. at that point. He understood that who he needed to defeat to be able to be successful in this spot. And he took his horse out to engage the right foe towards the outside. And I don't think there was anything going on in terms of anything against the rules that he was doing as he celebrates for the people. I think he was just race riding effectively. Speaking of engaging with the fans, nobody does it better here at the Big A than Kendrick Carmouche. We're up on the third floor in Equestris Richie, and we can hear them cheering for Kendrick. Yeah, Kendrick's uh, so popular, and he's just got so much enthusiasm. This, to me, was textbook race riding. You know, when we talk about race riding, it's subtle, and it's an art, and it's about going out to engage the competition without running into them. It's not bumper cars. It's going out to make your horse feel the challenge, meet the challenge, and it, as much as possible, maybe thwart the other horse's forward momentum. This was textbook. Well done, Kendrick. All smiles as he heads into the winner's circle. Seven to two shot. Assume nothing with the victory in the third at Aqueduct. Back over at Oaklawn Park. Love to win. Lived up to his name. Gets the win. First off the claim for Carl Broberg and taking that drop in class. He faced some tough company in his recent starts. He hadn't run on dirt that much, so maybe a little bit underexposed on the surface in comparison to some of the other horses in this field. And we do see this as a sharp claiming outfit, really spot their horses where they can be successful and move them up as they come into this barn. Love to win, digging in, drifting out a little bit with the left-handed urging in the stretch, but he was clear running away from the rest of his competition to pick up win number six of his career, looking back to that left lead late fighting $17 winner in race three at Oakland Park. As we 
take a look at what else is coming up. We're going to check in with our friends at Fox Weather for a weather update. Hey, race fans, I'm Fox Weather's Ian Oliver, and this is your risk of weather impact report for America's Day at the Races. We've got a full day of big races out at Oaklawn today, the Count Fleet Handicap, and of course, the 60th running of the Grade 1 Apple Blossom Handicap. This was a brutal run of weather in Arkansas this week with severe weather, flooding rains. Thankfully, now we've got Grade A weather for the Grade 1 race. Let's check out that forecast. Thankfully, the risk of weather impact is low. That's a beautiful look for your Saturday. The only drawback is some gusty winds. We could see some wind gusts up over 20 miles per hour. So if you're wearing a beautiful hat at the track, make sure you uh, keep a hand on it so you don't lose it. Anytime that you need a forecast before you head out to the track, uh, check us out at foxweather.tv. Always on, always free. Thanks for that, Ian. Looks like a gorgeous day over in Hot Springs, Arkansas for the Apple Blossom. I'll make sure to tell Rajiv to hold on to his hat. And a big day coming up with all of the graded stakes action. Good weather for the bounce house yeah. as well. Yeah, Most absolutely. Importantly. We love to see it. Hey, listen, <laughs> Oakland has had so many tough days with the weather that they certainly deserve another beautiful afternoon and for the Apple Blossom coming up. But over at Keeneland, the final stop on the road to the Kentucky Derby, Hades, who won the Holy Bowl down at Gulfstream Park, is looking to get into the gate for the Kentucky Derby and could pick up those vital points later this afternoon. Introducing Gift Box, winner of the Grade 1 Santa Anita Handicap. He's a three-time graded stakes winning millionaire with four triple-digit buyers and a four ragazin to his name. He proved himself early as a graded stakes place two-year-old, and now his career as a stallion is just getting started. From the first crop of the leading sire twirling candy out of a multiple graded stakes producing mare, Gift Box, only at Lane's End. Experience the adrenaline-pumping, suspense-filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Bets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing. Be a part of the action with Naira Bets. at his core. And Core Beliefs will come on and win it nicely. By leading sire, Quality Road. And here is Core Beliefs to take the lead. Core Beliefs on the outside, here it is, Core Beliefs. All the best attributes of his sire, a multiple graded stakes winner who's proven at the classic distance with tactical speed and a must-see physical. It's Core Beliefs who digs his heels in to win the New Orleans Handicap. Core Beliefs, standing at Walmart. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on every screen, every, screen every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. You're watching America's Day at the Races on FS2 here in New York, slowly but surely embracing the spring vibes. Some of the flowers are starting to bloom. Actually, tomorrow, Sarah, it's going to be quite warm. The weather's wow. going to heat up. I think it's going to be close to 70, actually. Over Do you here. get to be outside tomorrow? Um, I, I'm not, actually. Of I'm, course, I'm, that's why it's yes, nice out. <laughs> uh, naturally. I am heading down to Florida for the OBS April two-year-old day, go. which it'll be nice and hot out there as well. And here at Aqueduct in race number three, it was Assume Nothing and Kendrick Carmouche re-engaging, putting that race riding to the test, and he gets the victory in the third. Yeah, this was a patient ride because this was a horse that maybe some expected to really want to be forward to sort of engage with Night Effect early. But Kendrick took his time with this horse, kept him in good position, but had just enough to outlast the horse to his outside in Mighty Atlas. $9 winner in the third, Kendrick Carmouche with the victory for Horacio de Paz. As we mentioned before the break today, the final 
step on the road to the Kentucky Derby, the Lexington to take place at Keeneland. And it can be a pivotal race, especially for Hades, because he has 30 points after winning the Holy Bowl down at Gulfstream. Disappointed in the Florida Derby behind Fierceness, who's one of the top two. Um, Hades kind of tied with El Grande. Oh, who's there? Uh, he's around number 24, 25 on the list. And he needs those points if he wants to get into the gate, which it seems the owners want to. They do seem intent on that. I know they were excited about this horse earlier on in his career. He did go three for three. The Holy Bull being that big victory over Fierceness when the real Fierceness didn't quite show up this day off of a little bit of a break. But he got to do things so comfortably and so easily on the front end in this race. And then I think we saw last time out in the Florida Derby going a little bit further. If things don't necessarily go his way on the front end, we might not get this same kind of performance. And I just don't know if he's going to be the one that makes the lead in the Lexington coming up later today at Keeneland. There's some other horses that are pretty quick early on in that race as well. Jose Ortiz going to be aboard today for the first time. And yeah, he wasn't even close to the lead last time in the Florida Derby, which of course Fierceness did win uh, very impressively. It got a chance to flaunt the speed, winning the Holy Bull over Domestic Product, who of course did win the Tampa Bay Derby. Fierceness coming back to win the Florida Derby. But again, that speed and at Gulfstream in particular, um, having worked there for many years, you, you will see this. It sometimes can carry that speed, especially in races like the Holy Bull, which goes to the first finish line. Exactly, and especially those route races, right? I mean, you have horses that get really comfortable on the front end, and they are able to just keep going. It is one of those tracks that's just very kind to forwardly placed horses. Keeneland is as well, mm -hmm. but I think there's some other horses in there that might be a little bit quicker than him early. Wonder what we'll see as that will play out in the Lexington a little bit later on today. It's part of the Cross Country Pick 5 sequence. You've got three races from Keeneland, including the Jenny Wiley and the Lexington, the Apple Blossom in there as well. And then the New York Red Maiden Special Weight in the nightcap at Aqueduct in race number nine. Fun wager with some very good races in there. Yeah, absolutely excited to see Gina Romantica come back and Keeneland as well. It'll be a very interesting race in that Jenny Wiley. Hopefully you'll be participating with that cross country pick five. Meanwhile, horses are in the paddock for the upcoming fourth race at Oaklawn Park. That's a look at the number seven, The Heights, who is seven to two right now to his outside Rocket Knight. For the coach, Wayne Lucas, taking a drop in class. We'll talk more about their chances at Oaklawn after this.
We're back on America's Day at the races, getting ready for race four at Oaklawn Park. It's a meeting claiming 30,000 mile and a 16th three-year-olds and upward right now. The number eight rocket night for the coach, Wayne Lucas, taking the drop in class is five to two. Meeting the rest of the field, though, Sarah starting off with... The Asmussen family, here's ambiguous. <laughs> no surprise there. This one second off the claim, a little class dip for this one as well. The two Darvish going by, and then the three PR, call me maybe. This is a horse that's had plenty of opportunities, but not as many in for a tag, so maybe you could be a little more forgiving there. Big price in the four, impeccability. And this is a horse that hasn't had as many chances in for the tag either, maybe could improve getting that little bit of class relief. New claim, blinkers on, new gelding, a lot of changes for the five out in. And a very short price last time and disappointed as well, but it was a wet track. Here's the other Asperson runner, Sagittarius. This one has only been in for the tag once, was favored in off the turf race, ran second. The Heights is next for Lindsay, Sch Lindsay Schultz. And this one's second off the layoff, maybe could improve after that race, finishing third last time out. Here's your favorite Rocket Knight on the drop in class. And second time in for a tag for this one, a horse that is now second off a little bit of a break. And just be happy. It's as simple as that. Assume nothing, just be happy. A lot of good <laughs> life advice from these horses' names today. And look, even the pony has a smiley face on the saddle pad. Perfect. Hunchback? It's not meant to be. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about this fourth race at Oaklawn Park. That's the field. Stay with us. We'll be right back on America's Day at the Races. Coming down for the finish, and it is Silver State. One forty, one forty, one forty, hundred forty thousand. Grade one winner, Silver State, standing at Claiborne Farm. Watching America's Day at the races as everybody's having a great day at the races over at Oakland Park with that beautiful weather, seeing a great crowd in the infield, Maggie somewhere on the bounce house. It, it looks like a lot of fun over there. It Little really does. I yeah. mean, Paul's got the birthday celebration. I know. There's a lot going on outside Saw over there. Saw a bachelorette party over there. Yeah. Got it all at Oakland. <laughs> Got it all at Oakland. There is the number six, Sagittarius. Eric Asmussen aboard, currently the favorite, riding for his dad, Steve. You've got Keith Asmussen on the one, Ambiguous, riding for his dad, Steve. So the Asmussen brothers going head-to-head -head once again in this upcoming fourth race. Let's check in with Paula Duca. Polly, looks like the party's continuing over there at Oakland. Yeah, people are starting to pile in a little bit more. We're getting ready, ready for the ladies to run a little bit later on. And obviously, I think a lot of people are here to watch Skelly, maybe the best sprinter right now, at least in, in, in North America. So, yeah, they're starting to pile in. And it's absolutely gorgeous out here at Cation Sarah. It just really is a breathtaking day. Um, so, 
you, you, if you don't love horse racing, you don't love this day, you're not alive. So let's put it that way. And we got one minute to post. And, you know, Sagittarius looked the part. Uh, I'll be honest. I mean, he was really focused. The thing with him, he's never gone long on a dry strip. He started his career on the turf. His last two efforts were off the the turf events that were landed on a sloppy racetrack. You get Eric Ashton aboard, who's capable, obviously. He's went down to Texas and he was riding horses there. He's going to actually go to Louisiana Downs after this meet and ride the Mondays, uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So he's getting more and more experience and, you know, I think he's the horse to beat, but I just don't trust, you know, because you're doing something for the first time and Brendan Walsh had been tinkering with this horse's whip blinkers on the drop and this horse had a lead in the stretch last time. So just a tough horse to trust in here. The seven, the heights yeah, for Lindsey Schultz. This horse actually ran okay last time. I actually thought the horse was going to run third and got put up uh, via disqualification. But, um, you know, obviously getting better. Now, Carlos Barbosa jumps to the two. We'll get to that horse. Rocket Knight, the eight for Dwayne Lucas and Nick Warris. Now, I know it's warm out. But this horse was getting a lot of uh, sweat from behind. We call that kidney sweat. And he was getting a little worked up. A lot of the horses were actually okay. He was trying to get a little worked up. It looks like he settled down. Now, I know Nicky Juarez, the jockey, took his his knees out of the saddle there just to settle him down. You can see there, right there. And he's just been a little bit keyed up at, at three to one. But I landed on the two in here, Darvish. Um, in a horse that, for Craig Compton, claimed this horse comes out of a race. Vagana, who got taken down that day, I think this horse is going to improve second time. He gets weight with the 114 pounds with Barbosa. And Greg Compton's very, very sneaky off the claim. And I think this horse is very, very sneaky. Where I think you could poke holes in some other horses. You're getting good value at 7-1 to one with the two, Acacia. You are indeed, Paul. Thank you. A new claim, Greg Compton taking over with Darvish as this horse will try to make amends and turn things around. I like it. A nice price there. Yeah, absolutely. And you have a lot of horses that have had their fair share of opportunities, a lot of them at a level similar to this, if not at this level. And at least with this one, you're getting a newer face that is changing something up at a fair enough price to sort of guess and find out if this horse could be competitive in a spot like this. The six Sagittarius, the favorite at five to two. Um, what are you? I'm a Leo. What are a you? Leo? I'm a Scorpio. Yeah. Whatever that means. But not into astrology. No, I'm so so sometimes if I say I'm a Scorpio, people are like <gasps> afraid. Oh. <laughs> Andy is the so, most I, I guess it just it adds a little bit yeah. of uh, intimidation. Of, of intimidation I guess. factor. Yes. Uh, so maybe I can use it to my advantage. I guess well, I'm a Scorpio, so. you better watch out. Right? Andy yeah. is the most typical Gemini that I've ever met. Is that the two faced one? <laughs> or the, the twins. <laughs> You said it, not me. <laughs> we love you, Andy. <laughs> oh, man. Loading in for race four at Oaklawn Park. Maiden claiming. We'll see how it plays out. Sagittarius, the favorite. Matt Dinner in 75 with the call. Impeccably. Impeccability goes at Rocket Knight. And just be happy to the outside to complete the line of nine. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff. Rocket Knight, prominent in the early stages. PR call me maybe there as well. The heights between that pair. Darvish makes it pretty much four across the track. Looks like he's going to ease off, though does. Off of heels into the turn. Darvish in a little bit of a tight spot. Drops back to the fourth position. Sagittarius now racing alongside of him. Then comes Just Be Happy. Kept out of harm's way on the outside. Ambiguous is next with impeccability. And the trailer is Auden as they approach the backstretch run. Two runners across the track here on the lead. Heights is inside, Rocket Knight outside. They're stride for stride with not a fast tempo set by either. The rail's open for PR, call me maybe. Third on the inside, getting a little bit closer, is up to come and tackle that pair down the back stretch. Three across the track on the lead now. Sagittarius in the fourth position within a length and a half or two of the lead. Impeccability joins that rival. Another length and a half to just be happy, finds himself between horses. Auden attempts to get closer from last, is on the outside of that rival. Darvish's lost position drops back to the second 
second last position while under pressure and ambiguous now trails as they dart around the far turn. PR Call Me Maybe has a clear lead now and shakes away. PR Call Me Maybe opening up the lead to a length and a tail, a length and a half. The height second, Rocket Knight under heavy pressure in third. Impeccability attempts to get closer. Coming up to split horses at the top of the lane. Ambiguous rides the rail and rather that Sagittarius as they come down the stretch. PR Call Me Maybe. The Heights is re-rallying far outside. Rocket Knight tries to get it closer as well. Impeccability's right there. A cavalry charge as they come for home. The Heights between horses continues to grind along. He's got a head lead now. Impeccability surging after him. Impeccability on the outside wears down the Heights to get there by a narrow head. Third home PR Call Me Maybe and Rocket Knight was fourth. 50 to 1 on the number four, Impeccability. Gabe Sayas in the saddle. And boy, this horse had a big turnaround today to run down the heights. I mean, this was exciting. You saw this horse really start making up that ground significantly, and you thought that he might get there at that huge price. This has got to be exciting. We'll see if we can have another long shot coming up in the fourth at Aqueduct. It's a New York bred allowance going a mile for three-year-olds and upward. Right now, the number five, Jackson Heights, currently nine to five. He is a stakes winner, won the Bertram at Bongard as a two-year-old, and that is the only win he's ever had. We'll talk about more with him in a moment, but the rest of the field, Horse Be With You kicks things off, and there is Cephalo's mission. This is a horse that's faced really good company over his career, and he can be a little bit forward now third off the layoff. Stretching out for the first time. Here's a big price, Financial District. This is a horse that would need to find a race that we just haven't seen yet in terms of where he classes up. Last out maiden winner Friday, I'm in love. Could potentially throw some speed into the mix and uh, ruin the plans for Horse Be With You. Jackson Heights, there he is, nine to five. First start since September. And this horse has no early speed, mm -hmm. but he definitely has some class coming in. I just thought he was a little bit pace compromised. Always one that's very far back. And another last out maiden winner, here's Flip's Dream. Well, he really appreciated the stretch out and distance, a bigger type of horse that seemed to have a little bit of trouble getting out of the gate efficiently. Mm -hmm. Last time out, able to get into a comfortable rhythm, but we'll see where he fits from a class standpoint against winners. Stepping up to face winners for the first time, a horse that's been at this level of competition for quite a while is the two Safalo's mission. Linda Rice has tried different distances with him. He had a little bit of a layoff. He came back, sprinted two back, and here's his race most recently where he finished third, just beat in the neck. Does it concern you, Sarah, that he's been running at this level for such a long time without able to break through. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you see something like that, when you have a horse that just isn't winning, you're mm -hmm. always hesitant to take them at a shorter price. And I know he's a second choice right now, and we'll see where that ends up falling as wagering closes. But this was a good effort. It seemed as though Lightman was going to be a horse that was going to have things his own way on the front end. He did move up to try to engage that horse a little bit early, taken out of his game. But at the same time, when you look at a horse like Horse Be With You, who has that string of seconds lately, at least he's won more than one race over his career. Two to one favorite now, Safalo's mission, as we'll learn a little bit more about him. Check in with Richie, trackside. Yeah, bo both horses that are taking the most money co-favorites now, two Safalo's mission and five Jackson Heights, are also the two most impressive individuals from a physical perspective. They just could not look any better. I was vacillating back and forth on who to pick, the two or the five Jackson Heights. Ultimately, I landed on the two Safalos mission just because he has more natural early speed, and I do think he'll be a bit more forward, so potentially works out a little bit of a better trip, but I don't think a lot separates these two, and Jackson Heights could not look any better. He is dappled out. He looks very, very fit coming off the layoff. Comes in with some very, very sharp workouts. A best of, uh, you know, 27, 59, and one out of the gate on the Belmont training track. Last time, a sharp half. Uh, second of 171 workers at the distance that morning, and he looks the part. Orlando Nota is having a terrific meeting here. Now, kind of interesting, and we'll keep an eye on Jackson Heights, but in the seventh race today, Lauren Leno's got a first time starter, Metatron, in who has got the same exact work tab last two times out of the gate and then off the pole with a first time starter, three year old, that reportedly has been more than holding his own with Jackson Heights. So a little bit interesting going forward to today's seventh race, but here I'm going to go with the two, Safalo's mission. 
right, Richie, thank you. Interesting info there as far as the workmate of Jackson Heights. And we'll see what he can do off the layoff. But as you mentioned, Sarah, just always pace compromise. And he's a horse that runs Jackson Heights and has faced some very good competition. I mean, second in the Albany, two starts back. But he's always so far back. Exactly, and that doesn't really give him so much of an advantage against a horse like Horse Be With You, who we're taking a look at here, who is a forwardly placed type. And from the rail, things are simplified about what he's going to do early on in this race. This is his race two starts ago at a mile, where he did take a little bit more pace pressure, put away the other speed types, just couldn't hold off Amadeus Music, who ran very well in that spot. He's run second three times in a row. You never absolutely love to see that, but at the same time, I think that getting into this more compact field with the slight cut back in distance, they're going to be aggressive with him and see if they can take it all the way in here. That was Horse Be With You being beaten by Clever Forever, who was second in that race where Safalo's mission was third in the group of three. Coming down to the wire, Horse Be With You has that early speed, as you mentioned, turning back a bit from the mile in an eighth. Eight to five now on Safalo's mission. Um, Friday, I'm in love, has a little bit of early speed as well. How do you expect him to play things out, given that the main speed, arguably, is inside? It'll depend on what Kendrick Carmouche really wants to do with him. I think they've realized that he is a horse that can be a little bit more successful when he has that forward position. But I don't think that they're going to be in an all-out send mission to try to take anything away from him and get him into an early pace battle if they don't think that that's a way that he could be successful. And I just didn't really see the case where he puts away a horse like Horse Be With You and still holds off everybody else. 7-2 to two on Horse Be With You, who does have that early speed. Jackson Heights, 2-1. to one. We'll see what he can do off the bench. And, you know, I know that he won the Bertram of Bongard going seven furlongs. And that was, again, as a two-year-old. I've always felt for him, the longer, the better. He's got that big, long stride. He's going to come running late. More distance often, I think, does help this horse. Though, as mentioned, he's a deep decided closer he is but i mean he ran really well too back in the albany going mm -hmm. a mile and an eighth behind drake's passage a horse that you know pretty well he ran well second to colloquy mm -hmm. at that distance as well so he's shown that those longer distances do sort of suit him going forwards two to one on jackson heights good to see him back we'll see what he can do against some new york red company throughout this year as well safalo's mission though making a nice impression on the track he continues to be your favorite for linda rice and jose lascano always a very potent duo here at the big a going into the gate for race four at aqueduct here's chris griffin jackson heights flipstream Dylan Davis just kind of resituating their board. Jackson Heights flip streams in. All set. And they're off. Flip stream breaks very well. Also, Friday I'm in love is in the early mix. And at the rail, here comes Horse Be With You to join them. Horse Be With You has the lead, is up by a nose. Right towards the outside, there is Friday I'm in love. And towards the far outside, that's going to be Flip Stream, who broke on top, but is now going to be taken back off the pace. Cephalo's mission is towards the inside as they hook up with the back stretch back there and forth. From the back, trying to rally on, that's Jackson Heights, who is off slowly, and the trailer is Financial District. They're chasing horse. Be with you. 24 seconds flat. Easy opening quarter mile for 7 to 2 on horse. Be with you. Eric Hensel and horse be with you. Right there to the outside is Friday. I'm in love is in the two paths. Safalo's mission. Jose Lescano move through towards the inside here at the rail. Up on the outside, flip stream. Still patiently ridden. It's going to be three wide as they work into the far turn now. 47.49 for that half mile time from the back. Jackson Heights is trying to rally on. Is making hard work of it so far. It's still three 
off the lead. The trailer is Financial District. It's still Horsby with you. Horsby with you with a head in front. Friday, I'm in love, has been stalking this pace setter, has every chance towards the outside. Cephalo's mission wants off the rail, gets off the rail and moves towards the outside. But Horsby with you's got plenty so far. And Horsby with you is trying to get away. It's Horsby with you, who quickly is up by two and a half widening lengths. Horsby with you is just opening up on the rest of the field. Down towards the inside is Jackson Heights. Does have a late rally, but running out of time as Horse Be With You is just coasting along up front. It's a front running score for Horse Be With You. Horse Be With You wins it over Jackson Heights. Cephalo's mission then got tight. That was Financial District in a photo with Friday. I'm in love. And woman 36 and four. Horse be with you, used that speed to his advantage. Another top pick from Sarah and Eric Kinsell, as you said, simplifying things. And I like when Eric's aggressive because a lot of the time he is that more patient rider and can usually take a horse back and sometimes realizes a little bit too late that maybe he gave up some position that would have been a little bit more valuable, but not the case with this horse. He was able to just seize command early on in this race, not be intimidated by some pressure from Friday I'm in Love, know what kind of horse he had available to him to use. And this was a nice decisive win for a horse that had finished second three times in a row to win by a couple of lanes now and get that sort of confidence booster going forward. He earned this win. It was a late run and a good comeback race as well for the five Jackson Heights coming up the inside, but we'll have to settle for a distant second. Again, he just has that that late closing run. But again, first start off the layoff, made a good account of himself. He did, and who knows where they could go from here. Maybe they try some of those state bred stakes races again down the line. It has to be just promising to see that he came back to the race as well, and maybe something to keep an eye on with that first time starter that Richie mentioned later, who has a similar work pattern. One, five, two, three in race four at Aqueduct. Back over to Oaklawn Park into the winner's circle was a big price impeccability pulling the upset in race number four he sat a good trip in here and manages to get the, the job done under gabriel Saez. This is a good one. Hurt. I mean, this is a horse that if you if you go back and hindsight handicap like I'm doing now, you could say, okay, he started out his career facing some decent horses. He ran second a couple of times in some tougher races than this. Then they tried a couple of different experiments with him that didn't really work out. Didn't really break all that well last time. Maybe you could kind of get there. I certainly didn't, but good luck and congratulations if you did. <laughs> if you had him, 102.60, a big price, a big upset. And a monster super factor as well with that three in there. 1400 for the 10 cent super. Impeccability at 50 to 1, pulling the big upset at Oakland Park in race number four. When we come back, not free, but a bargain. A beautiful story with Free Like a Girl, who we'll see running later in the Apple Blossom. We'll learn a little bit more about the story of Chassis Palmier when we come back. You won't want to miss this one.
Welcome back, America's Day at the Races. As always, brought to you in part by Naira Bets. But any track, anywhere, anytime, visit NairaBets.com or download the Naira Bets app to get started. Packing that grandstand, fans here at Oakland Park, such a loyal fan base. And today, they'll be making a lot of noise come post time for the Apple Blossom. They might be even louder if they knew the story of free like a girl should free like a girl pull off an upset in the grade one Apple Blossom. So free like a girl, what's in a name? In this case, quite a bit. Free because of her full brother, free indeed like a girl because of the little girl who loves her so much. And for her trainer, Chassis DeVille Pommier, free like a girl has absolutely nothing to prove because she already has. We had her older brother, we broke and trained him. We actually broke the track record going two and a half with him in Louisiana. Uh, so when it came time for her the next year to come up to the yearling sale, we went and looked at her and we kind of knew we wanted to get her. We liked her brother. Budget was uh, like 5,000. We got the 5,000 on the bid. We didn't have the bid, we were the underbidder and dad looks at me and goes, well, you know, she shows up to be something one day, you'll kick yourself, offer 55, go from there. We got her for 5,500 and she's already made 1.3 million. Dad and, and the other partner were already partners, so we were trying to figure out if we wanted a piece or not. And my daughter had a show pony that the owner, the original owner, Mr. Bruno, had given her. It was absolutely amazing. She was making him a jumper, and he colicked on us. We did surgery, and so uh, Mr. Gerald, being who he is, and he's been a family friend, offered her a thousand dollars or a piece of the filly, and my kid being game as she is, one of the pieces of the filly, and she's been along for the ride ever since. <laughs> she's my first racehorse, and I technically have another one, but she's like my heart one, because I saw her and just instantly fell in love. Watching her race is really cool, but I get really nervous, because when she's in the gate, I hold my breath, and then when she gets out, I like finally breathe, and then the home stretch, I'm like just trying not to just faint, because I'm not holding my breath at all. She's just amazing. We uh, ran her in the allowance race to see how she would handle the track, if she liked the track, if she could handle the altitude difference, and she seemed to handle everything fine. Free like a girl trying to tag her. Free like a girl, all racehorse. That was kind of our deciding factor. Hey, let's come up if it's shorter field or, or just take a shot in the apple blossom and, and hope for the best. She was two-year-old champion filly of the year for Louisiana. She came back and was three-year-old champion filly of the year and horse of the year. She is the queen of the barn. I mean, she's been a blessing, uh, amazing. She's definitely routine-based and she just loves her job. And we love watching her just because she goes out there every day and does what she wants to do and loves it. What, what a story. Uh, so many layers, Raj, uh, just seeing Avery talk about Free Like a Girl and, and interact with her. Um, these are the stories. That, that, that is the stuff that, that represents the very best thoroughbred racing has to offer. And a true underdog story. Uh, such a small purchase, 5500 to achieve such big success. It goes to show you the inclusivity in, the, in our sport. You don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire to achieve the highest level of racing. And if this Philly is, is to win this grade one race today, it would just add that extra oomph to this story. A, a true a rags to riches story in that regard. And if you didn't have a, a reason to pull for anyone in today's apple blossom, now you do. Free like a girl. And make no mistake, it would be a significant upset, but she com continues to exceed expectation. Raj, A, what do you make of her chances, and particularly this effort here at Oakland Park? This is by no stretch of the imagination too tall a task for her. She has a legitimate chance in this race to so at least make some impact on the race. Her second place finish in the Houston Ladies Classic Grade 3 when she was narrowly defeated by a neck goes to show she's not far behind the top contenders in here. In fact, she has some upside to be, you know, to, to even grow into herself.
and be one of the top contenders. How much would she, uh, just to lend perspective, in terms of competing with the likes of an Adair Manor and, and wet paint, how much would she have to improve off of her very best in order to run with those, the big girls in the Apple Blossom? Speed figure-wise, it's not that she has a far task. It's not a big mountain to climb, because she already has posted 90 buyer speed figures, which is comparable to some of the top contenders in here. So uh, yeah, she's right amongst the ballpark. So many storylines leading up to the grade one Apple Blossom 60th edition, race number 11, post time around 6.45 Eastern. Meanwhile, the undercard continues. Horses in the paddock, as you can see, for race number five, $25,000 claimers, non-winners to lifetime, mile and a six and the current favorite eight to five on the gray you're looking at, Interlock Empire. Let's revisit his maiden win. This is six starts back. It was right here about 13 months ago. He's 17 to one, Interlock Empire, but not running like it. Yeah, he was visually impressive in this race, drawing off um, pretty impressively for a five length victory. And since that race, he's been thrown up against the Wolves. <laughs> he jumped out of that maiden win, going on to the Arkansas Derby as his next start. He wasn't terribly defeated. He was eight by 10 lengths. Um, then he was running in stake races uh, in Oakland, took a layoff, ran in a turf, two turf races. So he's back to, uh, this is a big class drop for him. You know, getting beat five lengths in allowance race last time and now running for 25. To five, the favorite interlock empire by my count. You're two for two on the afternoon. You weren't on for races three and four. Are, are you going chalk here or siding with another? I did pick interlock empire uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before. He has a perfect post on the inside. He's going to drop back early. Um, the, the track has been conducive to late running horses. So I don't think that impacts him much. And to be quite honest, there wasn't any other horse in this race that I truly liked. Not even Pando, pictured, claimed from CR Trout by Lindsey Schultz. Yeah, off the claim, but he was beaten by 14 lengths at this level last time. Magna Trap been a struggle of late. Another late running horse, doesn't have much speed, um, will be looking to make his best run in the stretch. Artwell has never crossed the wire in front. Yeah, got, his only win was via DQ. Actually taking a step down in class after running for 40,000 last time. Number five, DeLuca, who celebrated a, a LaDuca birthday earlier today with DeLuca's. Has some recency coming off a maiden win, which he had some traffic trouble in, but stepping up against winners for the first time. Number six, Hess. Randy Morse has taxed going later in the Apple Blossom. First time outside of Arkansas, Brett. He's running open company today, but he does take a drop in class to the 25,000 claiming level. Cal Rizian, Lando, Billy D. Williams fans, this is your horse. Yeah, this horse is stepping up off a close race defeat last time, finishing third by a length. Dynamic Sun, five length maiden winner at Delta in Louisiana last out. Yes, yeah, so stepping up in class a bit off his maiden win, but it was an impressive five length victory. Go Cats pictured, lots of viewers in Lexington, so I'm not saying anything basketball related, Raj. Our Arkansas fans <laughs> might, however. <laughs> this horse won last time, but was disqualified um, for interference in the stretch. Uh, but, you know, takes a step up in class off the win, but does have that recent crossing the wire first place finish. Field for the fifth, who will earn that elusive second career victory. We'll find out six minutes. First, we check in with Paul. Yeah, Lafitte, I'm with you. I'm staying away from Go Cats. We can go with Northwestern, Arizona. There's a lot of more cats to go after. Let's just stay away from Kentucky right now. They're not in a good place. But uh, let's start with this race. I'll start with the the favorite in here, Interlock Empire. And I'm in agreement with, with Rajiv. If this horse runs his race, he's really going to be tough to beat in here. If you look at his numbers wise, and I get it. He was 58 to one in the Arkansas Derby, but when he broke his maiden, he beat Go Cats, who basically is your second choice by five. And he got left that day from the 11 hole to the short wire. So he's, now has he progressed since then? Probably not, but you could also say Go Cats is, is not exactly, you know, in the best form considering he's already dropped down to the 16 non two. And this is the first time that the ones actually drop into this level so i do think the one's going to be ultra tough in here you know the horse that's going to be kind of like 
the question mark horse is the six Hess. I think this horse has ability. You know, Randy Morse is such a sharp trainer, and he's sending this horse long. Now, the horse is broken dead last in all three of his races. He put blinkers on last time. It didn't help. But the horse has been getting bet at the window. And sometimes when you look at these lower level races, the Archie Breads can kind of hang when they, when they go for 25. So if he can get out of the gate, Barano sticks for the main man, Randy Patterson, who owns a ton of horses with Randy. And just I respect Randy as, as a trainer. And I just think yeah, that's the other horse in here. DeLuca was very game, like Rajiv said last time, and I'm, I'm rooting for him as well. I think the other horse in here is a seven, to be honest with you. John Horan is dressed to impress today, by the way. He's got his nice suit on, and he's been causing a lot of upsets, Lafitte, at this meet. So I think the seven might run his odds. And, and John's horses just never get played, and he comes on winning races. But again, they're going to have to do some running to beat the one. But, but again, if you're betting the one, don't look for him to be in front early. He's going to be fun coming from behind. John Horan. Cal Rizian saddled the winner of the Matron at a big, big price on the undercard of the Arkansas Derby. So the fifth in three minutes here. Time for the late pick five at Aqueduct. Acacia, Sarah, any other uh, 13, 14 to one shots for us? <laughs> I'm leaving that one up to Sarah Lafitte. She's been on fire today with the good priced horses. That's a look at Bayou Spirit in the paddock for the fifth race here. Sarah, uh, six furlongs on the main track, non-winners of three in life for 25000 any um, very exciting picks in here? Well, I mean, there's not a very exciting tote board in terms of what <laughs> we're looking at here with the contenders that are left in this race. But I do actually like Anthracite a little bit. I think the case can be made for him that he's been running well over his last couple of races since cutting back in distance. And he's a horse that had shown some speed in the past and they weren't as aggressive with him going longer, that he's been a little bit more forward in his last couple of races. And I thought that in this spot with two horses that seemed like they were going to be pace presences scratching out that maybe towards mm -hmm. the inside you could get a little bit more forward position and be a little bit more effective in here five to one nothing wrong with that for more let's head down get a paddock report from richie yeah and sarah you get the dave donk whose barn's heating up and dave's a trainer that when things start going well they go well i thought the four bayou spirit made a really nice impression here in the paddock uh this is a horse that's coming off a bit of a freshening i i, I wouldn't even call it a layoff even though he hasn't run since the middle of january in day and age where horses don't you know run as often to me that's not a full-blown layoff that's just a, a freshening he looks terrific you get jose lascano for linda rice uh, no hotter combination right now here at aqueduct the Five, 12th man, he's coming off a layoff. Uh, and he looks fantastic. Uh, Michelle Nevin does really good work. He's taking a pretty uh, you know, serious drop in class, like everything I'm seeing for 12th man. The horse that stood out, though, and absolutely, unless something changes watching him warm up, the six Devil's K. Uh, I think it, with the scratches, he probably plays out to be your controlling speed. He could not look any better. He's got that rich, hydrated coat, really looks good. Walked around the paddock like he owned the place and sometimes a horse kind of touts you and just lets you know hey i'm on my game well devil's k looks like he's on his game richie thank you he really could be the beneficiary in here with the scratches of morning cup and bad larry both of whom on paper look to be forwardly placed back over at oaklawn park getting ready for the fifth race lafitte will send it back to you i just have to say with go cats and the conversation here this UConn fan will be very upset if Dan Hurley decides to make a move. <laughs> Understandably so with back-to-back -back NCAA titles. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, I guess it's safe to discuss here in Arkansas, just not wanting to offend any of our Lexington viewers. The, the March Madness didn't work out for Cat fans and certainly with John Calipari making the move. Yeah, we can talk about it here, but <laughs> We're be, be here. careful when we cross state borders. If you're going to at either of us, it's Rajiv. <laughs> Maybe Acacia or Sari. Sarah, don't at me. What about Interlock Empire? 7 to 5, who is the favorite here? Raj comes so far out of the pace, typically. Uh, in terms of pace early on, will the table be set for him to enhance that late kick? Well, that's a difficult thing for him, you know. That's a difficult thing about taking a horse with his running style in a race like this because there isn't that much speed signed on. So I'm expecting that Manny Esquivel is not going to change much. This is the horse's running style. He's just going to let him fall back early. Um, and he could be 
a victim if the pace goes too slow. The four, the number four Artwell did show a lot of pace in his last race. And with Hess stretching out a little bit, he should show some pace. But there isn't a lot of speed here. And the more you look at it, Artwell might be the c controlling speed in a slow pace. And sometimes that's a big edge. If he can get brave up front, Artwell, when you hear that about thoroughbreds and a horse who makes the lead getting brave, right? What, what does that feel like when a horse is getting brave underneath you? When you establish the lead and the horse gets into a good rhythm, you can feel that, that fluent motion and it's breathing properly and he's settled. That's typically when they, they find more bravery. They get comfortable on the lead, they get happy, and as animals, when the presence comes from behind, another horse starts ranging up on them. You, as a jockey, you don't even have to look back. When the horse feels that mm -hmm. presence, he they react. You they find out if they're, the a, if they're an alpha or a pack animal. You want to be on the, the alpha. Definitely we'll want to be on the alpha <laughs> in that position. The alpha is the ones that dog it you're up. You're not getting by me. You're just yeah. you're not getting by me. Uh, circling back to Go Cats, you had a conversation with Ricardo Santana regarding the Heavy favorite for the Count Fleet in Skelly. Our viewers will hear that as we get closer to post time for the Count Fleet. What does Santana have to do here with Go Cats to put him in position to be effective from that outside post? Well, he's definitely got to be focused on two things. First of all, establishing some forward position. But secondly, not getting caught up too wide on the first turn. His race can be lost if he gets hung up too wide here. So he's going to really have to navigate himself towards the rail and into a forward position. Last two to load. Dynamic Sun, Go Cat steps forward. Interlock Empire, number one, the heavy favorite. Matt Dinneman standing by post time race five, Oakland, live on Fox Sports 2. We're ready to go. And uh, they're off. Go Cats. Blasts out of the outside post. He caught a perfect beginning. Is up on the lead with Artwell. These two stride together on the front end. Hess runs in the third spot with Calrissian. Pando down on the inside, scraping paint as they charge into the turn. Dynamic Sun parked deep around the clubhouse turn. Magna Tap, he's running in the third last spot with DeLuca. And Interlock Empire, the gray, will attempt to do his best running later. Takes his customary spot at the back of the field. Artwell takes a hold of the bench and leads the way by a length. Go Cats on a hold now is back in the second spot, tracking the pace. Pando a little bit eager behind the pace on the inside third. Hess is next with Calrizzi on their side by side. Dynamic Sun racing in midfield. He's five lengths off the lead down the back stretch. A length better than DeLuca. He's four clear of uh, Magnetap, who's second to last. Interlock Empire at the back with him joins him. Passes Magnetap with a half mile to go. Artwell still the leader here, approaching the turn a length in front. He went 23 and four for the first quarter the half in 47 and two so no breathers for artwell as he rounds the turn go cats ricardo santana jr getting to work aboard him calrissian walter de la cruz asking him for more in the three path pando down on the inside he's getting closer he goes well pando pando's looking for a spot to go as they come to the top of the lane he's going to get outside now pando come to split horses as they come down the lane pando paco lopez riding this horse very calm confidently here and he blew right by Artwell when Paco gave him the cue to go and Pando explodes to the front. Pando going away from the competition. This race is over. Pando just a paid workout for him. He is going to win by four or five wrapped up in the end. Artwell was second. Hess gets up for third over Calrissian. Uh, the body language on the rider said it all pando paco lopez raj his body language telling you like yeah i have a ton of horse and you don't that's exactly what and that's paco's style you know paco really likes to, to let his horse do the running for him and he usually waits until the last moment before he actually kicks in his riding and you can tell coming off the turn he felt like he had so much horse and he wasn't ready to, to squeeze the button Pressed on the accelerator inside a 16 pole, this horse just pulled off. Has to be the best feeling in the world. Oh, it's the turning best for home feel. and the tank is still full. When you come off the turn and you know you're only 10% on that accelerator <laughs> and you're passing horses, and that's what it seemed like. Paco was just a, barely had a toe on the gas, and he was inheriting the lead. So yeah, you, you could tell that he had a lot more left. Gave him his cue. 
Pando responds and wins going away. The favorite disappointing off the board interlock empire two, four, six, seven. Oakland time for the pick five at Aqueduct Acacia. All right, Lafitte, we'll see how it plays out. You've got seven to five on Devil's K in here in this fifth race coming up. As we mentioned, it's non-winners of three in life going six furlongs. And maybe the six, who currently your favorite, is the beneficiary of the horses that scratched with that early speed, meaning the remainder, remaining runners, though. Here's Anthracite, Sarah. His race two back was a good effort with this jockey aboard, finishing second to Hatch. Here's the four, Bayou Spirit, dropping class for Linda Rice. He's just been facing tougher horses, and when he runs at a level like this, he's usually more successful. And for 25,000, two back in the non-winners of two condition. Here's 12th man, first off the layoff since October. When you look at the company that he's kept, he's faced the best horses in his career overall. Devil's key, his speed could really be the key in here. And I think that's why he's taking the money he is with a lot of speed scratching out of this race. And blue plate special to the outcome. Side, also a drop in class. Two tougher spots coming back into a spot where he could be a little bit more effective. We'll see what we get from him. He hasn't broken all that quickly in his last two races. Had to face mandatory last time out who could come back with a 95 buyer speed figure in his subsequent win. That's the field for the fifth race. Late pick five kicking off here. Let's go back to Richie trackside. Hey guys, I don't have a lot to add that I you know, didn't talk about already in the paddock. I, I just think the six horse has such a tactical advantage and he really uh, made such a nice physical impression. Yeah, it's been interesting. Like Earlier in the day, we had more of a headwind on the backstretch and then it was swirling a bit more. And right now it's kind of shifting a little bit. I, you know, it's going back and forth. On one flag, I'm seeing a little bit of a headwind down the backstretch. And then on the other flag, it's a little bit of a tailwind down the backstretch. So it, I guess it's just a swirling wind maybe it's not having much effect on anything but I thought Devil's K looked great physically I think he gets to control things on the front end last time he went 22 and 1 45 and 2 he's not going to have to run that fast to secure a nice comfortable position on the lead I just think he has too many things going for him in this spot all right, Richie, thank you. Nine to five on Devil's K now, who will try to take them, you would imagine, gate to wire. Let's take a look at Anthracite, though. Sarah, you've been on a good roll today. I know you like this horse, a nice price at seven to one. And what is, um, you know, there's not a, a big kind of juicy double digit odds price horse to sink your teeth into. So at seven to one, this is kind of the value play of the group. Absolutely. And when you're looking at a field that's compact like this and you have a horse that is the longest shot in the field, they're going to play much better bigger in those multi-race bets as well and especially if you can beat some of the shorter price favorites and that's what we saw early on in the card today where you defeated a short priced entry as well as a one to two favorite and that's why these early pick fives are going to pay a substantial amount if you've mm -hmm. been right the whole way and this is a horse that's cutting back very slightly in distance from the seven furlongs last time he was a little bit wide and against a day where you maybe wanted to be a little bit more towards the inside and I just thought his race two back at a big price was a decent effort where he was able to make up some ground and wasn't too far out of things early for a horse that I thought had shown some more speed in the past. They'd kind of not really used it with mm -hmm. him over his more races in the middle. And then as of late, I think that he's sort of being that horse that they might realize they're a little bit better to be a little bit more aggressive with him. Bayou Spirit and Blue Plate Special will both drop out of Starter Allowance Company and back into the $25,000 level. They kind of have a similar look as well as they actually ran 1-2 in that December 30th race. Bayou Spirit getting the win that day. Blue Plate Special would also get the non-winners of two condition for $25,000. And then they both step up to face tougher. It just seems like a logical drop into this spot today. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing wrong with the class relief that either of them are going to be getting. And I think with Blue Plate Special, you just kind of wonder if the gate antics are sort of catching up to him a little yep. bit in a race where we didn't necessarily see a ton of speed on paper now with those scratches. Is he going to be up against it a little bit, even though he is getting that class relief? Has been breaking slowly in his last couple of starts. He's also a horse that just really seems to resent the kickback as well. Kind of wonder, Sammy Camacho Jr. looking for a second win on the card today. We'll keep him in the clear, try to get him out of the gate and into the race a little bit earlier. Two to one favorite on Devil's K. See if he can take them gate to wire. They load in for race number five, getting ready to kick off the late pick five here at the Big A. Chris Griffin has the call. Devil's Key and Blue Plate Special.
blue plate special to the outside. And it. All set. And they're off. Blue plate special was off slowly. Devil's Key shows early speed from in between horses. There's Bayou Spirit. Bayou Spirit with a neck in front. Right towards the outside is 12th man who's going to stalk from second three wide. That's Devil's Key. At the rail, pink cap anthracite. Slow starting. Blue plate special is eight lengths the trailer. They're chasing Bayou Spirit. Bayou Spirit and Jose Lescano doing it easily enough so far. 12th man is right to the outside here, is back to within a half length of the leader as they work into the far turn. Devil's Key is three wide. Anthracite with a ground saving trip for Ruiz is tightly at the rail, going to need somewhere to go. Blue Plate Special starts to warm up to the task, but is still seven off the lead. They went 22.46 for that hot opening quarter as they approach a quarter mile left to go. They're still chasing Bayou Spirit. Bayou Spirit's got a Quarter mile left to go at the top of the stretch with 45 and three for that half mile time and is kicking away. Devil's Key is in full pursuit to the outside of 12th man. Down at the inside, it's Anthracite. Will Bayou Spirit hold off the oncoming charge of Devil's Key, who's cutting into the margin now? Devil's Key to the outside here of Bayou Spirit, who's still in front. Bayou Spirit, Devil's Key. These two down to the line. Bayou Spirit would not let Devil's Key by. Bayou Spirit wins it over Devil's Key. Then came 12th man in one minute, 10. Point four, five seconds. Bayou Spirit digs in and gets the win. He was actually the one on the lead, Sarah, which was a bit of a surprise. And hats off to Jose Lascano for the decisive move because it paid off. It really did. And I mean, this was a situation where we kind of thought there wasn't an abundance of speed on paper in this race. And I guess Jose Lascano had similar thoughts and mm -hmm. thought, I'll just go. And it worked out for him. And often when you don't see a lot of speed on paper, you can see surprising things happen out on the racetrack. But the aggressive move paid off. He was able to get the advantage and secure that early on in this race. And he was able to win with that drop in class. Back down to the claiming level out of Starter Allowance Company. Let's go down to Richie. Hey guys, this is exactly why Jose Lascano is as successful as he is, and he's ultra consistent. He reads the situation and he adjusts, and he made Bayou Spirit, who probably fresh, you know, coming back since uh, January, show that kind of speed, and it made all the difference. Where Devil's K was hung out three, four wide throughout the entirety of the turn, um, when you know, even he, if he had to go a little faster, I think he might have been better off trying to clear. You can't let horses get brave and be passive. I'm never hard on riders or critical on riders when they make an aggressive mistake or if it turns out to be an aggressive mistake. I don't like passivity. You have to be the pilot. Jose Lascano did exactly that decisive coming out of the gate with Bayou Spirit opening day here at this spring meet. Uh, at Aqueduct Sarah, we saw Jose Lascano and Linda Rice team up for five wins together on one day. And I guess setting the precedent going forward is that they are ready and poised to have a big spring meet, and they seem to have a big meet every meet that we have here in New York. So certainly no change in that, but big day for them and a good decisive ride in here. Three to one winner in the fifth race, four, six, five, seven at Aqueduct. Back over to Oaklawn Park. Lafitte, I think you owe us some prices. Those results forthcoming at Keisha. Jose Lascano, such a good rider. Paco Lopez, Rajiv, uh, such an easy ride in that one to just guiding Pando and pointing him in the right direction. Yeah, true Paco Lopez style. He's one of those jockeys that his, his position on the horse is a little different than the typical. He likes to ride with a loose rein, long rein, stays out of the horse's way, lets the horse do most of the running. And you can tell, like he said, when he came off the turn, he seemed to just be motionless while his horse was actually pass, <laughs> passing the other horses. Widening on this field, the heavy favorite, Interlock Empire, non-factor, Pando first half to the claim, Lindsay Schultz, Portia Racing, Sharp Hooks Racing, winning owners, Ma uh, Pando with Paco Lopez. He rides, you see the results, 1160 for the win. Uh, he rides Shotgun Hottie, does Paco Lopez in the Apple Blossom. Do you give her a shot this afternoon, this evening? Yeah, I mean, Shotgun Hottie earned her way to be in this race. Uh, while, while she looks like she might be a tad below the top contenders, she's not that far off, and, and she's a very consistent filly. She always shows up with her race. Uh, so you hate to keep making excuses, but I think legitimate excuses, Shotgun Hottie, in her last 
couple of starts. Uh, that's the Alabama, the, the Alabama Apple Blossom. A little bit later on, the grade one event, $1.25 million purse. The big names, uh, they're here, including Wet Paint. Story of her name later in the show. The story today, Rest versus Rust. Unraced since the Breeders' Cup in November. Already a grade one winner. She's been brilliant at Oaklawn. Wet Paint, major contender in the Apple Blossom. You'll see it right here on Fox Sports 2. Your guide to selecting a stallion for your mare. Step one, make sure he's won a big, famous race. This big guy charges away and takes the Dubai World Cup. Step two, he'd better be very good looking. Step three, he must have excited the support of breeders with quality mares. Mystic Guy. He's unmissable. Call Darley. Introducing a stallion as top class as they come. In 22 career starts, he won or placed in 12 graded stakes, competing in 15 grade ones, earning over $1.7 million. His undisputed speed is evidenced by seven 100 plus fire speed figures, a three time grade one winner, Raging Bull! Watching America's Day at the Races brought to you as always by Claiborne Farm. 100 years of doing the usual and usually well. There's a look at Blaine strutting, strutting his stuff and saying, I've still got it. I could still run down Zenyatta in the stretch in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And what a sire Blaine has been as he is the sire of wet paint, who, of course, grade one winner last year, taking the coaching club American Oaks, and then she's back for the first start of the season in today's Apple Blossom. And you know that she loves Oaklawn, right? She's a horse that really flourished there on the way to the Kentucky Oaks last year, winning several starts there over wet racetracks, and then finally showing that she could also do it on a regular dry racetrack as well. And maybe some left a little disappointed as she went off the favorite in the Kentucky Oaks and didn't run her race that day, finishing fourth. But this was a big effort from her to run down a loose on the lead, Sacred Wish, ran a good second after that in the Alabama. It's tough to make up ground at Santa Anita. You don't want to hold that race against her too much in the Breeders' Cup distaff. It'll be interesting to see how she comes back with her late closing style in and, here. And it's nice to see her back as a four-year-old now. As you mentioned, second in the Alabama, Randomized was loose on the lead, not able to run her down that day. And then Randomized would go on to run a very good second in the Breeders' Cup as well. So she's been facing very good competition. Our only time facing older was in the Breeders' Cup. So now she's back as a four-year-old. She's got some of the big girls that she's going to have to take on this year and we'll see how she handles it but fun to have her back I mean you'd imagine you're expecting a little bit of progression as well and this is going to be a, it's not an easy spot to start but certainly a starting point for the year for her and at least you know that she likes the track right whereas her main rival at least from the pace advantage point of view is a dare manor and this is a horse that still has yet to win outside of California so she has to take her show on the road but wet paint is very at home at Oaklawn She's three for three at Oakland Park so far. We'll see if she can make it four for four and picking up the grade one apple blossom later today. Back over at Aqueduct in race number five, the aggressive, decisive ride by Jose Lascano paying off with 
Bayou Spirit and dropping back down in class after winning the non-winners of two condition, two starts back for 25,000. He goes back to a comparable level today and picks up the third win of his career for Linda Rice. And you just know that he can be successful when facing company like this. And it was a great ride and assessment of this race by Jose Lascano to say, hey, the main speeds in this race aren't here. I need to be forward to give my horse the best chance to win this race. And that's exactly what he did, executed that plan out on the racetrack. Holding off Devil's Key late in the stretch by your spirit. Win at number three of his career and just seems when he drops into this kind of claiming level, that's when he wins. $8.40 winner in race number five at Aqueduct as there's plenty more to come still at the big A, but time flies when you're having fun. We're saying goodbye. I'll be back reporting a little bit later, but Sarah, it was great getting a chance to share the desk with you. It's been a while. I know, right? Not yeah. since the fall, I think. You've been away all winter. Who do you like in the Apple Blossom? Uh, I'm going to go with Tax. I really liked her return race, and I think stretching back out in distance should only help her move forward yet again. Can't wait for that. Coming up a little bit later on, a lot more at Oaklawn Park and more at Aqueduct as well, and we'll hear a little bit more about the story of one of the most likable horses in recent history, three-time winner of the Count Fleet, a Breeders' Cup winner, champion sprinter, and now in his new career, the mighty Whitmore. What's he been up to? We'll hear more about it after this. Great to have you with us. America's Day at the Races, live on Fox Sports 2, live look in the paddock. Race number six here, Oaklawn Park, about nine minutes out. Riders up in a moment, post parade. Good race, Raj. Three-year-olds, some expensive prospects, late developing types. Like, I'm not saying Arrowgate is in this field, but, but sometimes it takes these horses a little longer to find their best. Yeah, and when you look at the number one corporal, he's a $1.1 million purchase, mm -hmm. son of Gunrunner. So obviously they have high expectations for him. And he was heavily bet on debut at three to five. And he had some trouble at the start. He, he ran super green. as he, he was very green, very immature. The dirt hit him. He was bouncing all over the place. And he never put in a good run. Today... It's, it's in a tough spot on the inside here. To plan our song, post parade momentarily. First, we check in with Maggie. Ah, oh, you didn't think I'd do it, did you? Here I am in the bouncy castle. 
I think I have some challengers over here, but uh, we'll, we'll see. I think I'm going to have to go through, so you jump down. Anyway, Oaklawn is so family-friendly, guys. It's a gorgeous day. The infield here is packed. We got Bouncy House. We got this gladiator thing that I'm subjecting myself to, the rock climbing. If you're here, you're lucky. If you're not, you're not. So, all right, here it goes. All right, don't hurt me, young man. Go, go, run, go. Who <laughs> 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 is, is that is that Nancy? Yes. Nancy, hold this. You never know who you're gonna bump into around here. Wow. I wonder if this is the first time for either of them that they've spent time in a room or an area with padded walls. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think th this is something Just that they're accustomed to. putting it out there. Maybe we can get a morning line on that. <laughs> By the way, I still want a paddock report, Maggie. <laughs> In the bounce house. You knew she'd take up the challenge. Like, you knew she was going to go there before the end of the day. Yeah, Maggie never backs down to uh -uh. a challenge. She mm -hmm. looks like she's enjoying herself, by the way. Like I said, maybe not the first time. <laughs> Been in a room with padded walls, just saying. Three-year-olds coming up six minutes out to the sixth race here at Oaklawn Post Parade just moments ago. You would have seen it live, but we had to see that. Priorities, my friend, all about priorities. And for here, Corporal, the priority to see how much he can improve in his second career start, the two-to-one favorite, lots of room to improve. He does have a lot of room to improve, but he has a tough post position, which I think is going to put uh, Flavian Pratt in a darn if you do, darn if you don't situation. First of three rides this afternoon, Flavian Pratt. More on that in a moment. Elko County, Kenny McPeak co-owns and trains. Uh, a deep running closer, Sep got beat seven lengths in this level last time. Another expensive colt, Tornado Road. Yeah, 1.15 million, the same as Corporal. Hasn't shown much as yet. Chester saying is taking some money. First couple of the races stretches out today. Yes, yeah, stretching out for the first time to two turns, and he showed a lot of speed sprinting, so he should be a major pace factor. Moel Grand uh, leading rider Christian Torres seeking a third in the afternoon. Yeah, another late run in closer. You like Lear, yes? I went with Lear. He had some trouble in his first start. Looked like he gained some valuable experience. Now he's stretching out to a mile. I think we would expect some improvement, and he'll be a good price. Keep an eye on my six, Raj. I feel like Maggie's going to come by and throw something at me. <laughs> Seven there, an outsider. First bid, then the eight, Yale County. Harry Hernandez in the jot at Anthony Colors. Good second at this level last time when tracking the lead and taking over, and the, the Finishing second by next out winner, Native Land. Brownstone stretches out for the first time. Stretches out, blinkers on. One that you'd expect to show a lot of speed today at a mile distance as well. And World Fair, house horse, Luis Sella, yeah. President Oakland. Chance, Don't say anything. Chance Moquet told me that they are going for the lead today in this race. And this horse showed a lot of speed sprinting. So if he goes for the lead... It's, and someone else goes, it might be a fast pace. Good info. Good stuff. We saw from Santana in the last race, right from the outside pedal to the metal. Different kind of race, though, Ross. This is one mile. They, they ride to the first finish line. How does that change things in terms of tactics for the riders and for our viewers, how they can watch this race perhaps a little differently? Now you're straight away to the wire is a 16th of a mile shorter. That's a significant difference. So you, as a jockeys, you're gonna see them trying to gear their horse up a little earlier than usual on the turn. And which is tricky because it's, it's hard to gain traction when running on the turn. But you have to do it in this race because it's such a shortened stretch run. Uh, sometimes that impacts the, the closers. Um, and, and it's usually an advantage to horses that are up close, if not on the front end. Did you, would you find that, how much of a challenge would that be for you making that adjustment in these types of races? If you're on a horse that's a late runner and in, in such a big field, 10 horse field, it could be difficult because you, you get caught in positions where it's either you, you wait and save ground or you make an 
early move on the outside, which it's a, again, that's a darn, and if you do darn if you don't situation, um, it, you know, it's hard to be able to navigate and weave through horses and advance while saving ground on the turns because it's really compacted. It's a, usually the race doesn't necessarily spread out onto the straightaways. And so that makes it difficult when you're further behind, and that's why it impacts the deep closers. But the, the horses that are sitting in the tracking positions, they're the ones that have the first run on the closers, and, and they're in position to, to catch the front runners. So, yeah, watching this race a little differently than others. Three minutes out, we check in with Maggie. You know, they also have rock climbing here, by the way, in case you hadn't seen. <laughs> that's a hard no. I'm not doing the rock climbing. The bouncy gladiator pit, as best as I can describe it, was enough for me. Uh, nice to be back here in the infield watching these horses warm up. And I find a fascinating race that we have here. Baton Special Weights going the mile on tap. And we'll begin with the horse who is taking a lot of money at 9-5. to five, Currently stretching out in his second start here for Brad Cox is Corporal. Um, and the $1.5 or $1.15 million dollar purchase who was... Three to five favorite in the debut at fairgrounds and never really lifted a hoof, so to speak. He lifted them to do some climbing at the back of the field in which he was ultra green in that effort. Couldn't find his stride, couldn't keep up. And he certainly ran like a horse that said he wanted long. But what concerns me a bit is when you deal with these you know, top trainers that get the best of the best horses on top of all that, like the Todd Pletchers, like the Chad Browns, like the Brad Coxes of the world, when they run a horse in blinkers first time out, it's usually a negative sign because they know how to get the best of the best out of these great horses or very talented ones, at least bred to be that way, and they're not seeing it. So do I trust Corporal at nine to five? Not necessarily, but I do think that the mile helps him a bit here as we'll move on to the horse that Raj likes, Lear, who I, I really like the stretch out in distance. This is a long, lanky, leggy son of Lee in here. He was another one that was slow into stride, and he has that big loping stride. Everything about this horse says longer. He looks fantastic. I'm so fit and defined. Really like what I'm seeing from Lear here as he's been preparing for this effort uh, back here at Oaklawn, um, or excuse me, and uh, for the second start of his career. The horse, though, that I'm going to take here is number two, Elko County for Ken McPeak. This is why watching replays is imperative to handicapping races and the the comment lines and the the even you know the chart don't acknowledge this horse having some serious trouble he broke fine he was in a good spot early along the rail then he checked halfway around the second turn which took him all the way back to last then he started making up ground late in which that race forwardly dominated and galloped out in front of the rest of the field he's a bit sharper than what he was for that effort uh, and he looks great so i'm going to take him elko county here at a bit of a price currently at 10 to 1 because, guys, I don't necessarily trust the favorite in here. So uh, Elko County and number five, six, excuse me, Lear, look the part. Had the favorite, the one horse, disappoint in the last race, a complete non-factor, Interlock Empire. Uh, you and Maggie both with similar concerns regarding the nine-to-five favorite in Corporal. You're looking at Elko County, who, who Maggie likes and is an overlay at 10-to-1, and you both had some positive angles to work with regarding uh, Lear for Steve Asmussen currently. What is he at? Seven to one out there. Yeah, and if I'm Flavian Pratt right now on, on Corporal, I have a few things running through my head. First of all, I know this horse ran green the first time, so I want to keep him a, a clean face. And the only way to do that is mm -hmm. to send him out of the gate and try to establish the front. The problem with that in this race is there's few horses that are just faster than him. So if he was to make the lead, he would have to do it almost at a suicidal pace, which, which is not going to benefit him. And if he surrenders the lead to some of those faster horses early, he's going to be caught up behind horses and, and be in a position where he's getting dirt in his face, which is something that he might not like. How about if he's forward enough, maybe sitting second and third, tucked along the inside, as long as he's not taking a lot of kickback, forwardly placed, but not necessarily in front? 
And and that's what he is in his mind, exactly. He's going to, uh, Flavin is going to try to get this horse out there. It, when the speed horse is clear over, I would expect that he'll be looking to go to the outside and get him in, in that clean path. It's almost impossible to stay on the inside of horses and not get dirt in your face. You would have to be outside in the clear. Because once you're behind horses, that dirt is going to be spraying um, all you know at mm -hmm. a wide range in, in the horse's face young and experienced horses uh, trying to figure out what it is to be a professional thoroughbred corporal who we're talking about in the michael Tabor colors saw those colors in the winner's circle of the 95 kentucky derby thunder gulch for flavian pratt his first ride of the afternoon first of three rides jackson traveler contender count fleet rides wet paint for brad cox Grade one, Apple Blossom. Your first time out on the track, whether it's in the warm-up or during the race, is there anything you're doing in terms of gathering information that could help you in the later races? Well, first of all, he would have been watching the earlier races to kind of have an, uh, an a idea of how the track is playing, if there's any biases, anything that he can pick up from that. But Flavin is the ultimate professional who has ridden in race tracks not only all over America, but also internationally. So it, it's not... Uh, uh, and he's also ridden here many times at Oakland Park as well. So it's not nothing new to him, this track. Um, when you're a great jockey like he is, you can adapt to any track, really. I remember going to Japan and I had to ride the raw, the opposite way for the first time. <laughs> that and seems I, like it would be and, a significant adjustment. And I won adjustment. two races on the first day. It was, <laughs> you know, so once you know how to ride, you can really transform that to any racetrack. Lavi and Pratt, big wins here. Certainly last year's Arkansas Derby comes to mind with Angel of Empire. Live mounts in the Count Fleet and Apple Blossom. That's a little bit later on. We have three-year-olds here, Maiden Special Weight Corporal with Pratt for Brad Cox, the favorite. Matt Dinnerman standing by. It's post time. One back. World Fair. And uh, Leroff drifting inwards at the start was Jester Sang, but he broke alertly and his scent for speed isn't quick enough to go to the front here. World Fair from the far outside, offensive-minded. First time routing has a share of the lead with Copperall into the clubhouse turn. It's World Fair clearing off here and getting towards the rail, opening up three on Copperall, who takes the second position early. Brownstone runs in the third spot, then comes Lear with Chester saying, yell counting in the fifth position as World Fair leads the way at a quick tempo and scoots away, goes at a fast clip here. A big gap back to Moel Grande, who's settling well off the pace center, two and a half in front of first bid. Tornado Road at the back with Elko County as World Fair went 22 and two for that first quarter mile. Fast time on the Oakland dirt. World fair by about two and a half. Copperall runs in the second spot. Jester Sang sent along from the third position. A gap of two to Brownstone in fourth. Two better than Yell County. He's pushed upon to get going. Lear has lost position. He's called it an afternoon. Moel Grande, Elko County trying to get going from towards the back of the pack. And then Tornado Road in first bid. They round the far turn. Here comes Copperall on the outside to take the lead. And he cruises to the front. Copperall by two now as World Fair has had enough. In second Brownstone's coming with a charge. Yell County trying to get into it. Elko County with a sustained bid from the back of the pack. It's Copperall off the turn. Brownstone on the outside making a race of it. Here he comes on the outside in the three chimneys farm colors. This race won at the 16th pole. Copperall is finding more on the lead. Brownstone second. Copperall coming to the line. He's in front and he will win. Copperall gets there. Brownstone was second. Elko County third. And Yell County was fourth. The expensive Colt, the Coolmore Colt, Corporal delivers with Flavian Pratt three to two and what could be the start of a very productive afternoon for the star jockey. That was as perfectly executed ride as you can ever see. He had the one post, it didn't break that sharp. Flavian hustled him up to ensure that he secured his position going into the first turn and he just tipped him outside of the, the one pace setter and he never had to eat a lot of dirt. The horse got comfortable, and he was in position to get the first jump on the deep closers. And I like how he dug in when Brownstone came to him with a menacing run. And so this horse is, um, 
this might be a, just a stepping stone to bigger and better things as he learns and he figures out how to run. Those late developing three-year-old gun runner, his sire, he got better as he got older, former horse of the year, Corporal 1928 at Oak Lawn Park as our coverage continues on this Apple Blossom Saturday. Welcome to those just joining us on Valley Sports SoCal San Diego. Those already with us on Fox Sports 2, you're watching America's Day at the Races with live coverage from Aqueduct and Apple Blossom Day out in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and Oakland Park. Greg Wolf alongside New York Racing Association handicapper Andy Serling, the best yet to come on what looks to be a fantastic Saturday. Well, of course, you and I just showed up. How could the best not not be yet to come? It's going to be very exciting. No, looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing what happens down at Oakland Park. Looking forward to the guys down there doing all the heavy work for us, and you and I just sitting around, hanging We're out. We're just going to sit back, relax. Tracks. Uh, we have so much to get to. What do you think of Skelly made that trip to, you know, overseas to Saudi Arabia that ended the seven race win streak, but just the travel alone, is he going to be the real Skelly coming back? Yeah, I don't worry about, you know, he'll get, he'll get over it, but I think the first race back, he's vulnerable and man, Tejano Twist about his unlucky a beat in the final prep and the Whitmore for this race, my heart goes out to him and I'm going to take him to upset Skelly, but I kind of hope Skelly comes back and runs a big race. He's a very good horse. Meanwhile, here in New York, we have the late pick four coming up. It starts with the six race, $40,000 claiming seven furlong sprint in a race where right now it's the six who is favored. Lafitte's Fleet, we had a huge scratch in this race with the seven dangerous ride coming out. Well, the, the two favorites, I mean, the yeah. five and seven, the, the morning line favorite and second choice coming out. The seven came out late. Take a look at the field. We start with Flint Ridge, part of the entry post three. I think the entry is very dangerous, particularly the 1A. Both these horses can be somewhat forward, and there's just not much speed left in the race. Post five for the other half of the entry. There's American Gentleman. Yeah, I, I think this is the better of the one, but has less speed, but still should be forward. The rail to Silly Key, Charlie Baker. I was interested in Silly Key if there was more speed in the race, but with the scratches, I just don't think there's enough pace for this horse. Cutting back out of a marathon, mile and three-eighths race, Majestic Frontier. He's been in terrific form, but he has no speed, and I worry that the, the race dynamics could be against him. Cantor Machi Barnes, second off the claim, and the first off the claim was a win with Mr. Bob. Well, I like him like the public does. He's the narrow second choice. I think he's going to be forward. And 9-5 to five favorite outside with these changes, Dutro Barnes, first off the claim, Lafitte's Fleet. I mean, I... It's not as huge a move up, and even though he's running at 16 because he's been dropping from before that. He's a bit over bet, though, for a horse that usually doesn't have much speed. Can Dutro get some more speed into him off the claim? Post time coming up for the six. Let's head downstairs to Richard Migliori with more. Guys, the three-horse Majestic Frontier made a really nice physical impression, but it's a big turn back in distance, and I agree with Andy. I think the race dynamics play against him. He is a horse that likes to run on the rail. Dylan Davis is probably going to be outrun. Let him drop to the fence, pick your way, and hope for the best. The four, Mr. Bob, also great physical uh, you know, appearance. Really like what I'm seeing. Uh, Mertank Kent Tamasi does a great job, uh, and his horses look great. And I thought this horse chased a very fast pace last time in a race that's devoid of a lot of early speed i think he's potential that he can kind of control things he is my top selection like pretty much everybody else he's two to one right now and lafitte's fleet i do agree with andy he's a little bit over bet but boy did he look good in the flesh in the paddock Hendrik Carmouche went by me he said boy this is a jockey's race so somebody's aware of the fact that yeah tactics could play a big part here kendrick will be outside again lafitte's fleet two to one sport reflects how wide open this race is. Yeah, a race that really <coughs> changed with two serious favorites in here. Um, listen, I see it. I picked the race 4-1-A-6, so I, I see it as the public does, which is often not a great thing. Favoritism shifting here. Mr. Bob became the top choice on the board. We're set. Let's go to Chris Griffin for the call. And they're off. American gentleman shows speed towards the outside, and there's Mr. Bob from in between horses joining them. That's Flint Ridge. It's now Flint Ridge with the nose in front, but right back up on the outside is Mr. Bob, and these two hook up out in the center of the racetrack, taking off the pace is now going to be American gentleman at the rail, progressing. That's Majestic Frontier is right in behind the battling duo is now a shared third. The two towards the back end. That's going to be Lafitte's fleet 
with Silly Key. They're chasing Flint Ridge, who's well off the rail there. It's Flint Ridge, who's at about the three path there, is still a half length in front of Mr. Bob, who's right towards the outside here from second. Now they get closer to the rail as they move into the far turn. 23.39 for that opening quarter mile. Here comes the run from American Gentleman. Broke with the leaders, but is now back for more three wide. Three wide move here from American Gentleman. Still waiting for room. Dylan Davis, Majestic Frontier, tightly at the rail. Now being encouraged, but not cutting into the margin. The top trio still noses apart here as they approach the top of the stretch. 47 seconds flat for that half mile time. And now get in the queue. It's Flint Ridge, the gray down towards the inside, finding plenty. Flint Ridge is back up by a full length. Mr. Bob's been there the entire journey. Here comes American Gentleman down the center of the racetrack inside the final furlong. Flint Ridge just keeps opening up that margin. It's Flint Ridge now with less than a 16th to go. It is all Flint Ridge. Romero Mirage, they get the victory. Flint Ridge wins it. Photo there, Mr. Bob holding off an oncoming majestic frontier in one minute 23 and three. Flint Ridge, Gustavo Rodriguez Barn, Romero Mirage for the victory here, fifth career win. Really the 1A, and I think you and I agreed the 1A was the stronger one on paper, but what Flint Ridge had going for him was he had speed in a paceless race, and I think it's just as Richie and I were both saying before the race, the one, the, the one entry in the four had a decided edge from a dynamic standpoint, so whether or not they were necessarily the best horses in the race, they were going to have such a such an advantage the way the race was run. And for instance, Majestic Frontier, who actually very, very well to narrowly get beaten for second here, and that he had to be ridden just to even be close early in this race. If this race had, you know, you wonder if like the seven or five, the seven had been in here with more speed, if a horse like that would have had a much better chance. This horse fresh, so was you expecting him to be sharper anyway? You had that bullet drill, five furlong move, so they wanted to be forward, and they were with Flint Ridge, and he's able to get that fifth win of his career, his six-year-old by Into Mischief at five to two. One, four, three, one A here to kick off the late big four. Let's get back to Hot Springs, Lafitte and Rajiv. Your cousin, Raj. That was amazing. Exciting to watch Romero do that thing. Fun watching you watch him. Well, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> a lot of pride there, the Mirage family, and a lot of pride regarding this cold, the expensive $1.15 million son of gun runner corporal graduating for Coolmore in his second career start. Flavian Pratt, as you referenced, giving him every opportunity, the perfect trip from start to finish. Perfect position to put himself in that range where we, he knows it's a short run, stretch, shortened stretch, a 60 mile shorter, and he wanted to get him going coming off the turn. So he had to be forwardly placed. We talked about going in. The horse that was tracking would be the horse that would have the first jump on the closers, and Flavian executed it to a perfection. Exciting to see what this Colt does next in the second half of 20. 24. I mean, we still have the Spring Classics in front of us. Obviously, that's not on the agenda. He just graduated, but an expensive colt with good pedigree and ability. Exciting to see how good he, how well he progresses. Yeah, the $1.1 million purchase makes you think that he has that baseline ability. And now to see him jump from his first start to his second start with such a drastic improvement, where is the ceiling? We, we don't know yet, and if he continues to progress the way he is, he might progress into that hefty um, purchase price. And Pratt, Brad Cox, uh, yeah, they're not done either, teaming up with wet paint in the grade one apple blossom a little bit later on this evening. The stakes racing gets underway in about an hour with the Count Fleet, all coming your way right here on Fox Sports 2 Plus. Later in the show, the story of Eric Jackson single-handedly changed the course of racing in Arkansas. Hot Springs native Eric Jackson will be inducted into the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame. We'll have his story. It's Volatile in front as they pass the 16th pole. Volatile victorious in the Vanderbilt. One by two lengths. Tremendous amount of talent with his win in the Vanderbilt, as well as a couple of his wins at Churchill Downs, ran unbelievably fast. Uh, you know, very special family to me. Perfect star for two-year-old sales. Just a gorgeous horse and throwing very athletic horses that I think will run. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense-filled action of the sport of kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. 
It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Bats. Folsom from last to first in the mat win. And Folsom is flying to the finish. Folsom has taken the front and Folsom kicks for home. And Folsom sticks his neck out and runs to the wire. It is Folsom! It's Folsom in front and Folsom wins the Governor's Stakes. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. Back with you on America's Day at the Races on our Saturday coverage on Fox Sports 2, regional networks across the country, a little trip down Times Square. You can play all the action by getting signed up and started with Naira Bats. Spend any track, anywhere, anytime. Got a late pick five coming up at Oakland. Begins with that count fleet. And we're underway in the pick four at Aqueduct with Flint Ridge, Romero Mirage, Gustavo Rodriguez kicking things off. Speaking of overcoming your pedigree, yeah. Romero Mirage was a very good ride there. Um, and, you know, riding the speed horse. And, and, and Romero is really, you know, all kidding aside, it, it's very hard to get the opportunities with the riders around here, even in the winter. And he has made the most of the opportunities he's gotten. And that's really all you can ask from a rider. He rode the horse the right way, and he got it done. And, you know, we already have Rajiv on the show. Romero, incredibly well-spoken. And he has a, a big future when he, when he does want to hang it up. Well, he Coming could, on this desk. Can he get to Oakland by the apple by the apple blossom? <laughs> Replace Rajiv. on the set. Watch out, Rajiv. Yeah. He might be coming for your job. Uh, five to two winner here. Flint Ridge with the win to kick off this pick four. One, four, three, one, a seventh race. One turn mile. New York Preds made special weight. We'll set it up when we come back. And we'll talk about one of the all time favorites in Hot Springs when we return and show you what he's up to now. The great Whitmore. 2020 Breeders' Cup Sprint Champ. Still a big part of things for Ron Moquet and company.
He's a length and a half in front of Holy Boss from the outside Mo Candy, but Whitmore comes to the final 16, drifts out just a bit, but he's got lengths to work with. Here is Whitmore, yes! Whitmore's gotta go. He's still five lengths behind, and Smart Spree's inside the furlong marker. Win time is alongside. Smart Spree gonna have to dig down. Now Whitmore explodes in the center of the track, and look at him fly. Whitmore has to go, and he did. Wow! It is Whitmore now, a length and a half in front of Share the Upside. Then to the inside, and Manny Waugh, he's gonna do it again. Look at this race horse. Flagstaff just ran into second. It is Whitmore. Whitmore. Holy mackerel, what a horse. The great Whitmore, what a career he put together. 15 career wins, over $4.5 million, and fourth time wound up being the charm for him in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Ran four Breeders' Cup Sprints, pretty amazing when you think about it. You know, it's not easy to win that kind of money as a sprinter. And uh, even though they started him out in some longer races, they went on the Derby Trail. He ended up being a very, very, very efficient sprinter. In fact, the only horse to beat City of Light the year of the City of Light Damn, could have true. been horse of the year. Well, as we've talked about quite a bit over the past few years, he's become one of, if not the most popular horse in the history of Hot Springs. For all he accomplished, nine wins at Oaklawn, seven of those stakes victories. Oaklawn has made sure that Whitmore will never be forgotten. We caught up with the 2020 Breeders' Cup Sprint champ, who is still a very big part of the Moquette team. He's kind of digging this jumping thing. It's pretty cool. He's been doing great. He's been okay. theoretically in training all winter. We just do what we can. And he's trotting over some stuff and actually jumping some stuff, which is pretty cool. I think he's actually going to be really good at it. He has some really good instincts. He's really easy to ride. He stays pretty level-headed. Ask him if he can turn left, turn right, keep his balance, slow down, speed up, and then trot over some stuff that is laid out in front of him. That's all it is. And stay relaxed, not get worried about stuff he touches his feet on or, you know, like that's all really important. Really good. Really good. He was so careful. He doesn't have to jump high. Um, he's totally sound and been happy. He's been in nail on shoes for over a year now. I'll probably hit some little schooling shows or something this summer, just have fun. And um, I don't think anything major. I I he's very he far away from school. major Ooh. competition. Excellent work, Wit. He basically took all summer off last year and Played in the field with his sister, we call it. It's a little mini mule named Honey Bunny's sister friend. She basically rears up and pummels him on his withers with her little tiny hooves and tries to bite his neck. She's not tall enough to do that. And then he's like, okay, here we go. And then they run around like yahoos, like he's at the track. He just canters and she's running as fast as she can. Keeps him out of trouble, probably. I can't imagine what he would get into if he just was by himself in a field for a while. Oh, it was so cool. They were yelling his name, and he was just, you can just feel him, like, I'm really proud. And he, like, got off the trailer, like, six inches bigger than he was. He's like, I'm back. I knew it was going to happen. They named my barn after me. I'm going to my house, into my stall, into my barn, at my racetrack. And he's like, yeah, I'm awesome. Like, his head barely fit through the stall when he walked in and out. Took him to the track the next morning. He came on the racetrack, spun out, ran sideways, snorting, bucking, tail going everywhere. He's like, no, I, I think I've got a few more races in me. But yeah, I think he's pretty happy. He's pretty happy. <laughs> Such an incredible performer, uh, Maggie, and you'd expect that from a, one of the all-time great sprinters, that, at least in recent memory, to, when he gets back on the track, kind of puff up and remember who he was. Three-time winner of the race we're going to see later today, that Count Fleet. having now a race named after him in which, as we saw in that piece, he gets to lead the post parade each year. And it, Whitmore just demonstrates what I find so admirable in all thoroughbreds and all racehorses is that they have this tenacity. They have this massive heart. And anything you ask them to do, they pretty much say yes to. So Whitmore, it's been fun watching him progress in his jumping career. I think the funniest video I, I think I saw last year was when Laura posted a video of her uh, jumping him at a show in which she just kind of brought him out of the field and put him in with another horse that she's uh, been showing. And he went around there bucking. But 
He did not miss a jump, nor did he have any rails. So he just says yes. He looks like he's having such a fun time. And it's great that the people that campaigned him, the Moquettes, they had the, him in their backyard. And he is truly a part of the family. I think everyone in, in Hot Springs is, is claiming Whitmore is part of the family. He's become part of that entire town and fabric of that community so popular. We're going to have the big one still to come. Grade one Apple Blossom in that distaff division. Uh, Dare Manor, grade one winner for Bob Baffert. Wet paint making her four-year-old debut last year's coaching club American Oaks winner. In this sport, it takes just one special horse and a lot of people that believe in him. By Champion Arrogant, from the family of Broodmare of the Year, Better Than Honor, rose to prominence in the Grade 3 Peter Pan, displayed power in the Grade 1 Belmont, cemented his three-year-old championship in the Grade 1 Travers, defeating a champion two-year-old, Kentucky Derby, and Preakness winners. And the Eclipse Award goes to Archangelo. Archangelo, standing at lane's end. with you on America's Day at the races on our Saturday coverage. It's brought to you in part where you can play it all. NairaBets.com. Get that $200 deposit match. New customer bonus. That's the code right there to punch in and sign up. Bonus 200. And you're ready to roll again right there at NairaBets.com. Seventh at Oaklawn. $12,000 bottom level maiden claiming race. Six furlong sprint and auto dial taking all the money right now. Odds on with a big drop down in class. Next door, well, a couple posts over. Chris Hartman barn without objection to player as well, and that barn with a major shot in that count fleet. Let's go to Maggie for more. Yeah, here with trainer Chris Hartman, who will be sending out Tejano Twist. Third in the race last year. We were just talking about his last race, Chris, um, in the Whitmore, in which it was kind of a stop and start type of trip for him, which ultimately led to him just being narrowly defeated. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt last time the horse should have ran on from the 3 8 pole, and he, and he sort of slowed him down, and then he came, came up an inch short. It feels like there was not there was a pace duel, but there wasn't that much pace on last time. It feels like it could get a little bit hotter um, with the presence uh, of Skelly this time around. Are you? Are, is that what you're hoping for? Well, Skelly's extremely hard to run down, as we we've all seen that. But we're hoping that uh, the trip to do uh, to Ray Don will take a little bit of steam off of him. Yeah. But you know, he's a very difficult horse to beat, and we're going to try to get it running down late. But we'll be running from the three eighth ball, hopefully. <laughs> That's the plan this time around. Quick question with your horse here without objection. I thought he should have won last time, had a bit of trouble. How do you see this one shaking out? Well, we have to outrun the nine horse, but I think he will run good. The horse has been improving with each and every race, and he is definitely way better than he was his last race. So we're hoping for a victory. 
All right. Well, best of luck here and best of luck in the next, too. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Chris Hartman with Tejano Twist, the horse that always shows up, guys. Yeah, thank you, man. He really does. That's coming up with the Count Fleet where we'll see Tejano Twist. Just you look at that record. We put it up. Incredible. 21 of 30 career starts has hit the board. I, I, and it's, it's a very hard thing to do when you're a deep closing sprinter. You know, most of those horses, they find trouble. They find slower paces. Now, pace won't be a problem for him, obviously, with Skelly in the race. But Skelly's a problem for him if Skelly runs like Skelly does. And Skelly has proven to be better than him in the past. But you do wonder a little bit with Skelly going over to Saudi Arabia. And Tano Ta Twist was terrific last time. I and mean, they were just crawling up front. And he just lost a brutal bob. I'm going to take Tano Twist in here, hoping that Skelly from betting standpoint Point. For my betting purposes, I hope that Skelly has a little hangover from going to Saudi. But I also, like you, am a big fan of Skelly. Meanwhile, what do you think of Hartman's horse in this race here? Without objection, we're looking at him right now, 4-1. to one. The numbers from Autodial deserving probably to be the short price he is. But without objection, ran good last start. Yeah, I, I would rather bet without objection at 4-1 to one than Autodial at 4-5. At, 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 at to five. And not just because one's a much bigger price, but you know, Autodial lost his last race at two to five. He's got five seconds and nine starts. The connections didn't claim him for thirty thousand dollars to ship him to Oaklawn and run for twelve five. I mean, if he wins this race at thirty thousand dollar purse and he gets claimed, they kind of got their money back and they've had him for a month. They got to ship him over there. Why would you claim this horse and want to lose money right away with him, even if you win? Because he is likely to get claimed out of here. So. I wouldn't have any problem betting a cold 7-9 exacta here. 4-1 to one right now. Meanwhile, 4-5 to five on auto dial. Let's bring in Jonathan Kenshin, J.K., obviously Chris Hartman Barn, one of the sharpest outfits in Hot Springs. Absolutely. And look, without uh, auto dial, excuse me, the 9 looks really tough to beat on paper. But uh, these are at this level because they're not necessarily trustworthy types. Because of that, I ended up looking to the 7 without objection um, for a couple of reasons, mostly based on the trip last time. A horse broke slow, was stuck down inside. Uh, I just feel like you're getting a pretty significant rider change here and, and just felt like there was a little bit more value. I, I, look, I'm not going to play a multi-race wager and allow auto dial to beat me here. But I do think if you're betting this race to win, the seven without objection makes a ton more sense than a nine at four to five. And now down to three to one. I think the drop, and I just got a text from somebody uh, at Oakland was saying the owner's really trying to win the, the uh, owner's title. He's, he's local and he's never won it before, and I get that. But it's I, – I never completely I, – I understand that is probably part of it. It's a lot of money to try to win an owner's title, and I get it, but I, I still think. And the other thing is, forgetting about all of that, this horse is still – 0 for 9 with 5 seconds and lost last time at 2 to 5. And I'm going to guess he looked a lot better in the field last time to be 2 to 5. And with Chris Hartman, I think the 7 is a, a, a reasonable alternative. I think the bet here is you just bet a cold 7, 9 exact if you're betting against him. And that, you know, owners who trying to win, who's trying to win that title, that's State and Flurry. We've done a lot of uh, features on him in the past. Owns... Uh, with his family parking lots right across the street from Oaklawn. We'll see if he can add another win here with his 4-5 to five favorite. Let's go back to Maggie. That's good to catch up with my friend Jonas Gibson as he will send out this heavily favored at number nine in here, um, Auto Dial, in which he drops him down again. But it's not like this horse hasn't run this cheaply in the past. I mean, when he was a two-year-old, he, he did run for 10000 uh, for Keith DeSormo. Now, maybe he should have won last time. I, I, I get it. Um, but the winner did get loose on the lead and got fairly comfortable. Physically, this horse is a pure standout. Uh, looking at him against this field. He looks tremendous. And Jonas is firing on all cylinders uh, this year because he has also been very aggressive with his claims. So definitely not against the four to five favorite. But taking a look at number eight to his inside at 12 to one is Barrel Thief getting Lasix for the first time for Steve Asmussen, uh, dropping yet again a bit in class here. And I thought he just Made a great impression. Uh, comes back in here off a bit of a layoff. Now a three-year-old has filled out a bit. It, just nicely balanced horse that looks fit and ready to go. So I thought one at a price that could make a better showing of himself. Now, uh, a long shot. That's a first time. So I always like to kind of check in with these horses that I find they're 
pedigree is a little bit interesting. That's number six in here, Statler, for Steve Hobby, who is a great horseman. Um, this guy came in here sharp. He's a bigger, robust type of horse, which I ultimately appreciate. And I'm not that familiar with just a coincidence, I'll be fair. And he hasn't sired any first time out uh, winners. But the second dam, if you go back a generation, was a stakes winning dirt sprinter. And the dam have to a graded stakes winner um, by the name of Watchman. So there's some pedigree there. And in these types of races, if you want to take a swing with a price to fill things out underneath, certainly have at it, Greg. All right, Maggie, thank you. Still odds on, on the nine. Um, let's bring up another one. We were just talking about off here, the three, Court, dropping from 50 down to 12.5. Right. I mean, the problem with him is he's making that drop, and he's going from Robertino Diodoro's barn to a barn that's three for 108 when I printed these PPs, and that's what bothers me. But at six to one, it's a very healthy price on him, and I agree with you. He is clearly the other horse. That's quite a drop, huh? It really is. 60 buyer in that last out performance. Harry Hernandez will ride, but public has not moved away from the nine auto dial here. Jonas Gibson having an incredible meet. First off, the claim of the horse who was beat is mentioned at two to five, but against better last time out. So drops from 30 down to 12 five. Matt Dinnerman, the seventh from Oakland. One back, Bourbon on fire to the outside. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off. Corked ass for speed. Barrel thief on the engine early. Cadillac Cowboy inside of that pair. These three tussle for the early lead. Cadillac Cowboy from the inside with a head lead on Corked. Barrel thief taken back to third. Without objection, strides in fourth with Auto Dial. The two favorites, fourth and fifth down the back stretch. Dalton's Rutro has to ease off of heels at the tap on the brakes. In fact, Native Moonshine joining him in a deep bourbon on fire passes the aforementioned pair to be within six lengths of the lead into the turn. Statler has no early speed well behind as they round the far turn Cadillac Cowboy in control with Cork they're right together rounding the turn here comes Auto Dial with a four wide sweep Barrel Thief moving with him Dalton's Retro going to be caught about five or six wide off the turn is trying to gather momentum from there at the top of the lane Cadillac Cowboy has lost the lead Corked under pressure in deep water now Barrel Thief has come away with the lead without objection behind the leaders searching for racing room nowhere to go he's trying to get inside Auto Dial's there Dalton's retro cork is still in front. Barrel Thief has given way. Auto Dial on the outside in second, but Corked is fending him all off. Corked on the lead. Corked as game as the day is long. He won it, giving Harry Hernandez a double. Auto Dial was second without objection. Rough trip third. And then Bourbon on fire was fourth. It looked like a wall of pursuers were there to pass Corked, and nobody wanted to go by him, and Corked fended him all off. Five to one, corked with that big drop down in class. Should we join Matt in and rubbing in the people who bet the hanging nine at seven, it's an eight to five. Talk about no excuse. That was got about as perfect a trip as you could get. And cork just wouldn't be denied. So while I was worried about the switch off of Tino, it didn't seem to matter. Got it done. And yes, that was a lousy trip for the number seven without objection, who was just unlucky, Rob. Uh, Bayron found himself with nowhere to go. Three to five favorite defeated. Let's get back to New York. The seventh race, one turn mile. New York breads, maiden special way to everyone trying to get that first win of the career here coming up as we look at the three palace boss for Horacio de Paz. I think there's a very bad favorite in here. The four is being overbet because the connections didn't really do much running first time. Could win, but should be about five to one. I like the three and six. I prefer palace boss because he's a better price. The source that was wide last time against a gold rail and that January 18th has been a day we've seen many horses come back that had wide trips and run significantly better, including yesterday's first winner. I used him with Hagrid's Flame. I used him with the two, six and eight. Damn, this one produced a pretty good one, too, by the name of Castle Chaos. For more, let's go downstairs to Mig. Uh, yeah, guys, I, I'm actually going to pick the two horse uh, off guard. This horse, you know, tried the Damon Runyon a little too tough last time. He's got speed, uh, and I think speed is something you want today. You want to be forward. Uh, he's by Leo Frick. It tells me that he should be able to get the mile, uh, although, the, you know, he does have successful appeal on the uh, female side. And that's more of a, a sprinting pedigree, but I, I just thought this horse had to look physically that he would stretch out effectively, and he's run races good enough that I think 5-1 to one is a 
is a decent price for this horse. The nine horse Metatron made a really nice physical appearance, a long leggy son of Salamini, gets a good outside draw to start his career going a mile, has been training in concert with Jackson Heights, who ran uh, second earlier in the day in a nice allowance race. He's already a stakes winner and stakes placed. Um, so he's been keeping company in the mornings with a much more seasoned uh, older horse. And usually that bodes well. And he does have a really good look, a really well turned out for Orlando Noda. But I'm going to go with a horse with some experience. And that's the two, Alfgar. Uh, meanwhile, that first time starter is still on your screen right there. Eight to one morning line. Uh, that is considerable money and some very quick works in the morning. Obviously, there's a big story besides the works. And as Richie pointed out, worked well. The horse was over bet earlier today, but did one a respectable second. Um, listen, I, I, you never know with a first-time starter, and he could certainly win. It's not a killer field. I would let a horse like this beat me at 2-1, to one, but I did make a small saver 9-3 just in case. I don't want to run second at right now 14-1 to one as the second biggest price of the board to a first-time starter taking a lot of money. I made a, made a saver exact at 9-3, but... Horses like that, in general, my inclination is to let them beat me. It's not exactly a barn that you think of with winning with first-time starters. Very difficult race to find anyone to really kind of sink your teeth into. Yeah, I really want to bet the three here. I don't doesn't have to win, but 15 to 1's an overlay. He is a lot better than he looks on paper, and I think the four is a vulnerable favorite. Um, Hagrid's Flame, the six, is a very generous price at 7 to 1. This is a horse that ran well in his debut. It was a fast pace that was falling apart, but this horse ran perfectly fine in that race. There's the one Mig likes moving in Elfgar. Sam Camacho, Rachel Sells coming out of that stakes race, very distant third. And it was only a four horse field that Damon Runyon, but had been second against this level of company before. This could be the first time going beyond a sprint distance. This one turn mile coming up here in the seventh. Let's go to Chris Griffin for the call. Metatron, last to load. And in. All set. And they're off. Speed from Sorority Prank right out to the front and quickly Sorority Prank is up by a full length. There to the outside is going to be Palace Boss as the leader is well clear. Up on the far outside, that's Metatron trying to join that middle pack. Elfgar is in that second grouping right there is now a challenging third. In between horses there comes Bob John Ray. Tightly bunched here as they start to back things off. Very tightly bunched on the front end. The three towards the back is Slow Down Bag Andy, Hagrid's Flame, and Vincento. That's the trailer. Still tightly bunched. 23.56 for that opening quarter mile. Now they start to sort themselves out. And at 7-1, it's Sorority Prank who's in charge. Sorority Prank has got the lead. Is up by three quarters of a length. There's another long shot there. And Palace Boss is stalking from the outside in second. Metatron is in pursuit from third. At the rail shoved along is Elfgar. Trying to cut into the margin as the leader starts to skip away. Under a full drive is Bob John Ray. Is still four off the lead. Down towards the inside, Hagrid's Flame has got some momentum is there with Vincento far far back though is the trailer slow down big Andy 46 and 3 for the half mile time and sorority prank is trying to run them off their feet it's sorority prank who's trying to run away at the top of the stretch is still a length and a half clear palace boss continues to chase a sorority prank is getting away Metatron is backed out of it now here comes Bob John Ray and Bob John Ray with all the momentum grandstand side it is still sorority prank and palace boss but Bob John Ray is going to push on by. It's Bob John Ray. Still there is Palace Boss not giving in. Bob John Ray with a sustained rally. Bob John Ray is your winner. Palace Boss, Sorority Prank, and Hagrid's Flame. And one minute 37 and three. Bob John Ray. Silk so Michael Dub, Chad Brown trained second time out with the blinkers on the win. Right now, I just like Bob. I just like John. <laughs> and I just like Ray. Uh, but uh, he got the job done. He did improve significantly off his debut where he really did no running, but obviously he needed the start. And the stretch out to a mile helped him, and he was best here. He circled the field. He was the only horse that closed. I mean, I'm frustrated because betting the three at 16-1 to one and running second, it's a good pick, and 
got a little bit because I had a four. I had a save, but I'm not going to not have four three. But I didn't love the four and uh, paid a little bit of a price for it. But uh, he was best. You know, it's a, a tough beat when you're second at that price. But I lost to Orson that ran a better race. Five to two. We still, I believe, we've not had a favorite win in this pick five sequence. Yeah. The nine at eight to five. Um, if, if I could say one thing that people should follow is stay away from over bet, from heavily bet first time starter. It's one thing in Saratoga, you know, when you've got some of the higher profile outfits and expensive horses and they'll come through sometimes. But do you really need eight to five in a race like this? There was a lot of interesting stuff going on in this race. And to just take an eight to five first or going a mile for an operation that doesn't win with firsters, to me, that's just lunacy. Four, three, one, six. Meanwhile, back at Oaklawn, five to one court. And everyone was talking about the drop in class for auto dial from 30 down to 12. This horse was dropping from 50 down to 12, but was leaving the Deodoro barn. There was some concern with that. Able to get the win though and beat this three to five favorite. Yeah, um, and if that beat on auto dial doesn't convince you, that the nine couldn't pass you and I in a horse suit, Greg, I think nothing will. I mean, he had the entire stretch to get by. He is a refuse Nick. Up next, late pick five begins with the great three, Count Fleet. And last year's winner will try and go back to back at Skelly, that seven race win streak still intact on US soil. <laughs> so you're gonna that's your story, you're sticking with it. One you say it doesn't two. count. If it's the Middle East, it doesn't really count what happened. It's technically correct. <laughs> two stable mates. Well, it's definitely correct. <laughs> uh Jackson Traveler, Rivet in the race as well. But you got Skelly just seems like he's a different level of quick. He's good. I mean he's fast. He's a he's the kind of sprinters that you you know, the throwback good sprinters. They're not just good, they're fast, you know, they, they run fast throughout and there's nothing not to like about Skelly. I think the one reservation you have is do you think there's a bit of a hangover and he won't be quite ready to run his very best race? After yeah, all that travel going to Saudi Arabia, defeat and coming back. Ricardo Santana Jr., he has had a lot of success in this race. He's gonna try and win his seventh count fleet and including going back to back on Skelly. We'll see if he can make it happen as we get set for this grade three next. Back with our Saturday coverage on Fox Sports 2. You're watching America's Day at the Races. Good to have you with us. 
We'll get to the count fleet coming up at Oakland momentarily. First, let's wrap up the seventh here in New York. Bob, John, Ray, second time out for the Chad Brown barn with the win. Good magic has proven to be a very, very effective sire. And you know, you watch this race and, you know, I mean, obviously, once again, I bet the three I'm frustrated, but you, you can't really be upset because you lost a horse that simply ran a better race, and he really did. You know, he circled the field. Not No other horse in this race gained any real meaningful ground. The six made a, a little bit of a run, but it's not like he made a, you know, they made a real dent, and the one and three were one, two around the track, and two, one around the track, say three, one. When a horse sort of does something that nobody else in the race does at all, he ran the best race. I, I didn't love him going in, but he got the money. Five to two, return seven dollars ten cents. As you see, four three one six again, and we move on to race eight. Twelve thousand dollar claiming sprint. Colonel Vargo, we expected to take a ton of money. Four to five right now, right at that morning line. This may get shorter. The clock is going to strike midnight at some point. I mean, this is really strange that this horse is right back in two weeks later after a sensational performance, and he's in for twelve five. Uh, the only way he's not changing barns is if the claim is voided. He cannot lose this race if he runs a semblance of his recent efforts, but I don't trust him at all, and I'm betting the two FF Rocket. He's won six of his last eight, Colonel Vargo. Meanwhile, there he is, the reigning champion in the grade three counts fleet. Won this last year. Can Skelly do it again? Eight for 13 lifetime. We'll see him next. at Claiborne Farm. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the sport of kings no matter where you are with Naira Bets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Bets. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state-bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info. As they move through the stretch, it's still Skelly. Skelly maintains a daylight lead. And then comes Strobe. Pirate Rick toward the inside. Surveillance making up some ground. And Tejano twist on the far outside. But it's going to be Skelly. Skelly takes the count fleet start to finish. He is a speed demon. Skelly winning last year's count fleet. Raj, why should our viewers be excited to watch him defend that title today. Well, how could you not be excited? Watching this horse, horse blast away from the gates and just outrun his competition like this. But this race is a big race in its own right, but it, it also could be a stepping stone onto the road to becoming a national champion. A grade three race, but Skelly's like grade one talent. Top ranked North American sprinter. Uh, so this count fleet coming up, it's Oakland's signature race for sprinters, Raj, aside from the prestige aside from the half million dollar purse like what's at stake for Skelly and, and company 
Well, we've seen horses like um, Whitmore in the past use the Count Fleet on the road to becoming the champion Eclipse Award and Breeders' Cup winner. And, and Skelly seems to be of that caliber. Like he can use this race as, as a stepping stone to winning one of those big races. Skelly, who has been near perfect here at Oaklawn Park, went abroad that Riyadh dirt sprint in Saudi Arabia, an example of a horse losing absolutely nothing in defeat. Yeah, it, it was one of his best races in defeat because he changed tactics a bit, sat off the pace, which is something that he wasn't accustomed to doing earlier in his career, and he still put in his run. It was n He lost nothing in defeat because even the fifth-place finisher from that race, Tux, came back and blew out the Dubai Air. Golden Shaheen in the next race. Air. Those were so. some of the best, yeah, sprinters, like in the world dirt sprinters. Skelly, again, top-ranked sprinter in North America, trying to become the fifth back-to-back -back winner of the Count Fleet. There he is, one to two, and rightfully so. Skelly, very talented but not perfect, like any athlete relies on equipment. And for that reason, uh, Raj went into the jocks room earlier today to speak with his jockey, Ricardo Santana. This horse runs with a little different kind of equipment. He has an extension blinkers and an aggressive bridle on him. Why is that? Well, he's a horse that he's been improved a lot. You know, Steve is putting a lot of effort on the horse, you know. And I don't think the equity thing bothered him a lot, you know. And um, the horse is being improved a lot when, when everything he's using it. Is he been a difficult horse to ride or does the equipment help you to keep him going the way you want him to go? Well, in the first part, you know, the first two times I rode it, you know, he was really hard to handle it. And um, I'll be talking with uh, the Gallo boy, and he's been doing a really good job with the horse. So he would be teaching me about the horse, how I have to ride it, and the horse being improved a lot. What is your expectations of Skelly for, for the rest of this year? The horse is being on pro a lot. He doing it in Saudi, you know, when all the best sprinter, we finished second. We was really happy with him, and I think we have a good future with him. And Ricardo Santana knows all about good sprinters. Live look at Skelly. It just sounds like a fast horse. Santana, six-time Count Fleet winning rider. Skelly knows game time's approaching. Four of those wins, by the way, trained by Steve Asmussen, some big names in Matoli, Whitmore twice, and perhaps in moments, a second with Skelly for Santana. So could you expand on that a little bit? Why does Skelly race with that extension blinker? So the extension blinkers is made to cover the eye of the horse. Usually when a horse tends to veer one way or another, if they veer out, you'd cover their outside eye, which is the right eye with the extension blinker. And if they veer in, you'll cover the left eye. That usually keeps them from seeing a lot of space and, and they'll more respond to the jockey's handling. So in his past, Skelly uh, was notorious for wanting to bear outwards and not keep a straight course. And that's the reason why they put the extension blinkers on. And Ricardo said since they put that extension blinker on he's been a lot easier to handle and if you could see in his most recent races he's he's actually keeping a straight course and hasn't been able to do that but he did say something he said Raj <laughs> if I didn't have that extension blinker on he would be running to the outside <laughs> just fighting the rider these horses just have these tendencies lugging in lugging out there's Flavian Pratt on a major contender here is Pratt Jackson Traveler one of three for Steve Asmussen Riders crossing over the main track. That's when you know it's a big race here at Oaklawn when you see the proceedings that take place in the infield for Santana riding an odds on favorite. How much pressure is he feeling right now? I mean, he's won this race six times. Once you get into that point, you start thinking you own the race. I don't think there's any pressure on him. I feel like he has a lot of confidence in his horse. That's what I would do. I'd, I, I have the best horse. All I'd be thinking about doing is executing. And there isn't much. It, this is just a one way to go. Go to the lead and improve your position. And you mentioned executing. That's what they're huddling up discussing here. Take us inside that huddle. Steve Asby's in talking with his three jockeys who are going to be riding as we since three sprinters in the count fleet a fly on the wall would be here in this don't get into a speed duel here guys <laughs> that would be the, the last thing that a trainer would want to see is horses duking it out on the front end so 
Jackson Traveler is actually the second quickest horse early that would be able to apply pressure to Skelly, and he's from the same stable. That makes me think that there is no chance that Skelly isn't going to get a comfortable lead here. And with a comfortable lead, he's going to be tough to beat. Exciting count fleet, exciting speed, dynamo. Skelly, Maggie, how do they look up close and personal? Yeah, taking a look here at Skelly as he is nearly complete with his preparations. Going to get uh, reunited with Ricardo Santana in just a moment. But Skelly, I, w I, I have to be completely honest. I'm not exactly sure if it was him, but talking with several people in the paddock, he was kicking and kicking hard the saddling stall. So if you're concerned about energy levels with the trip to Saudi Arabia and back, I don't think you have to be. Um, the, he's certainly on it, to say the least. And, you know, it gives me confidence that I'm not going to see anything more than what his conditioner, longtime conditioner, Steve Asmussen, um, sees from him every single day. So the fact that he feels as though he's ready gives you confidence. He looks spectacular. He looks obviously incredibly fit um, coming in here. But, again, it's that intangible, that, it's that unidentifiable thing that you're not sure if they're going to come back and you know recover quick enough to be run their a race uh from that middle eastern trip so we'll see what he does here but i do want to mention uh the horse that is looking for three in a row for the barn that's number two jackson traveler my man looks better than ever i watched him school yesterday he looked good i think it's almost even more of a positive sign when i think they look even better the day of and he does. A horse that has finally really filled out that frame now as a six-year-old. And I remember talking to Steve yesterday and him saying that he's so excited to have him with Flavian Pratt again. He thought he rode him beautifully last time. He's going to go from inside, outside to in, where I thought he broke really sharp from that outside position last time. Lafitte, we'll see what he does from the inside and how he negotiates a trip from there out. But looks as though Jackson, he's thriving. Found his best fastball again, did Jackson Traveler Steve Asmussen, referencing that being his best race in years, the Whitmore victory here in mid-March. Yeah, and the Steve Asmussen's other two horses, Jackson Traveler and Rivet, they can both join the Millionaire's Club with a win in this race. The winner's share purse of 300000 would tip either one of these two horses into the Millionaire's Club. So if Skelly isn't to win and it's one of his stable mates, there'll be another million millionaire <laughs> horse going back to the barn. Lucrative event, prestigious race, Oaklawn's most significant race for sprinters. This grade three Count Fleet Sprint Handicap featuring grade one type of talent when you're talking about Skelly, who is one to two post parade. Another look at Jackson Traveler here, that Whitmore winner, first of three for Steve Asmussen. Nine wins, 891,000 in the bank. He's on a two-way race win streak, going for the hat trick here. Number two, I'm wide awake. Uh, we watched John Heron saddle the $57 winner of the Matron two weeks ago. Yeah, he's, Howard's had has shown some speed in the past. Uh, expect him to be up close to the pace. Would be a surprise indeed. Skelly would not. One to two for the defending champ. The defended champ, the expected pace setter, the horse that we're looking for, for an ex exceptional performance. 21 to 1 shot, perfect dude, 8 year old Washington bred. Yeah, this Washington bred ran extremely fast fractions at Sunland Park last time uh, to win. Tejano Twist, look out for him late. Yeah, this is the late runner that he's the one that will be benefited most from a hot early pace. Ribbit completes the Asmus in Count Fleet Fleet. Uh, wire to wire win two starts back was third as the favorite in the Whitmore last time and completing the field happy is a choice coming in hot sharp gelding yeah this horse was came off an extended layoff and is really starting to blossom into his own his third start off the layoff was another win this is exciting high octane sprinters the count fleet in four minutes skelly one to two we check in with paul yeah, one to two for a reason, Lafitte. Listen, he's very, very fast. And Steve has always thought so highly of this Colt, too, as well. And you, here's the thing. He doesn't need the lead like Raj uh, has said, you know, in his last race. He really was able to rate a little bit and relax. And it looks like at an older age, 
that he can. But when you look at this race, you guys made a great point. The other speeds in here are the two other Steve Asterson horses. So what gives? I kind of think that Rivet gets the better of the draw here than Jackson Traveler by being outside. And the reason why I say that is it, this horse went really fast, two back, 21 and change. Then last time out, the seven Rivet, you know, Keith actually didn't send the horse to the lead. They tried to kind of rate. And I think in the Whitmore, it was maybe, you know, that was the day we were here. And you, speed was not that good. I just think that Rivet can lay off Skelly a little bit. And I think this race could be 4-7 or 7-4 if they just, you know, don't. You can see here that Rivet kind of got caught in the inside and Jackson Traveler was the outside. And that's going to be reversed today. And he, and to me, Rivet got put on the tight rail, and that rail was not good most of the day. Tejano Twist, he always brings his game from behind. But I just think that Rivet gets a better trip today. And here's the thing, he's not as fast as Skelly, so I think he'll chase him around the racetrack, JK. And this race, to me, could you be just 4-7, or I think the 7-11 to one is great value. Well, it's tricky, right? I mean, this is a wagering game, and you're going to get one to two on Skelly. And I can understand why some people might not have the appetite for that. It is a horse race, you know, no matter way, which way you look at it, and a lot of things can happen. Skelly could break a little bit slowly, uh, could just be having a bad day. But there's no question in my mind that without a doubt, Skelly is the best horse in this race. He's the best sprinter in this race. He's the fastest early in this race. He's the fastest finish final time horse in this race. From a speed figure standpoint, he's got those Breeders' Cup sprint looking buyer speed figures. He, he checks all the boxes, but that's what's great about this game, horse racing. You have to decide whether or not there's a, a wager to be had with a horse like this that's one to two. Uh, the type of situation where I would want to get alive to this horse in multi-race wagers using no one else, I don't think that he's the greatest wager in the world from a, a win standpoint. Like Andy talked about a little bit earlier, you know, the fact that this horse is coming over back from the Middle East, sometimes, I think it's a little bit overplayed, but sometimes these horses can need a little bit of time to kind of adjust and find their feet again. I, I, I just don't know what else to tell you other than the fact that Skelly is the best sprinter in this race, and he's the best sprinter in the country. You just have to decide if you want the one to two, and uh, there's nothing wrong. You can spend that money too. <laughs> Look, it's not just our speculation. Steve Asmussen, Raj, told Maggie yesterday, quote, it's just a matter of how much the trip to Riyadh and back took out of Skelly. Yeah, and if you, like JK said, if you're looking for a vulnerability with a one to two shot, that is a significant vulnerability. If he takes a bounce, if that trip has affected him so much that he can't show his A game, then who is best to capitalize on that? And there, there are some credible horses. It's, it, can Skelly win this without his A game? I actually think he could still win without his A game. I think he does tower over the field. Um, he does have a tactical advantage. It's hard to go against him other than the speculation of that vulnerability that he might bounce. Tactics, jockey, strategy. Andy and Greg, if that pace is hot, look out for Tejano Twist in the stretch. Well, he's chased him a couple of times before, including in this race last year on a wet track two starts ago. That's probably not his favorite kind of track. Tejano Twist, he's a horse just always shows up. His last race was, an, was a remarkable effort, and he lost a head, Bob. He was unfortunate to lose. It was, it was a coin flip that he lost. After a race had a, just an absolute crawling pace, he was still able to close, forced to be closer, and he wants to be. He wants to sit back and make one run. That You don't need any of us on TV to tell you that Skelly's the, that Skelly's the worst to beat. It's, it's obvious. It's in his PPs. He's 8 for 13. He wins his races by open lengths. The question is why he's vulnerable, and the other question becomes... Do you think he's a better bet at two to five than the six is at four to one? Because at the end of the day, that's the decision that gamblers make. That's the decision that betters make. I think that Taylor Twist is a better bet at four to one than, than Kelly is at two to five. Because I do think there's a reasonable chance. I don't disagree with Jonathan. I think people tend to overrate these journeys. But seven weeks is coming back pretty fast. Normally they wait longer. So I think there is a chance that he's not in his A game. And that could even him out enough that I'd rather bet on Tejano Twist, which I did at four to one. 
And should say too, I mean, that according to Thurgraf, that race in, in Saudi, one of the slower races he's run in the last four or five starts. Yeah, I, I just think this is too short a price. Now, I'd rather bet him at two to five than that maiden claimer at three to five in the last race because he may be the best sprinter in the country. With more on Tejano Twist, let's go back to Maggie. Yeah, it's it's an interesting race in which it feels like there could be an assertion of top sprinter where we've kind of been searching for that now that is um, elite power has retired. But let's talk about Tejano Twist and I ultimately wholeheartedly respect him. And to be fair, I'm not really that familiar with what he looks like, generally speaking, in his uh, preliminaries. I got to say, I'm not overly thrilled. Um, a, he is a laid back horse, which kind of, you know, is parallel to what his running style is and that he's a he's a sit back and make one run type. Just thought he could look better in his coat. And also, TBF, to be fair, when you go up against a field of predominantly Asmussen horses, you're generally not going to look quite as good as them because his horses are just oftentimes better turned out than the rest. Doesn't mean they often win or always win, I should say. But I just thought that Tejano Twist could look a touch better, Lafitte. Tejano Twist, there he is. Christian Torres, leading rider, seeking a third on the afternoon, seeking a first count fleet, but all eyes on the ridiculously fast Skelly. Number four, Santana seeking a seventh. Count Fleet would be a sixth for Steve Asmussen and Skelly looking to, to successfully defend his title. Post time for the Count Fleet. Matt Dinnerman standing by. We're ready to go in the Count Fleet. And uh, Laroff, Skelly was away last out of the gate. Ricardo Santana Jr. asking him to get into it early, and he takes the lead from I'm Wide Awake. So it's Skelly, not a desirable beginning for him, but he's on the lead today. I'm Wide Awake running in second now. Perfect dude right off of him. Happy as a choice is next down the back stretch. A gap of two to Rivet and Jackson Traveler, and they're eight or ten ahead of Tejano Twist, well behind as they hit the far turn run. Skelly went 21 and two fifth seconds like a rocket ship here on the dirt. Skelly has opened up the lead to three now around the turn. I'm wide awake. Perfect dude have given way. Happy as a choice picks up the running in the second position. Jackson Traveler not picking it up. Rivet is trying to pass runners at eight lengths to gain on his stable mate. Tejano Twist dead last as they come off the turn. Skelly three sixteenths to go has a three length lead. Happy as a choice second. Tejano Twist rolling down the center of the track. Skelly furlong to go. He's gone five ahead now. Tejano Twist unleashed with his late rally, but Skelly is too far ahead, and Skelly coming to the line is going to do it. He's going to win the count fleet. He's back in the States and back here as a top sprint contender this 2024 year. Tejano Twist was second, happy as a choice third, and Rivet was fourth. <laughs> Just too fast, just too talented, just too classy. Skelly successfully defends his title. Back-to-back -back wins in the Cal Fleet. Wow. And like a rocket, this horse overcame some adversity. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the best of starts like Matt Dinnerman said. He almost got away close to the last of the field, and he just quickly recovers. He's just such a naturally fast, agile horse. He ended up running a half a mile in 43 and change. Look, even from a great start, running that fast is almost, you hardly ever see that. We'll dive deeper into that. Fired up Ricardo Santana, seventh win in the count fleet right at the start. I don't think Santana was excited as he was right there, the way things unfolded. Raj, we're expecting Skelly to break on top. We'll revisit the start and see what went wrong that, as you heard Dinnerman refer to, Skelly last getting out of the blocks. But this is a great race for Ricardo and, and, and Skelly because now he knows he can even overcome a slow start. I mean, this horse is maturing. He's running straight. He's doing everything his rider wants. Uh, this was a horse that had some propensity to be a bad actor early in his career, not staying straight, having trouble in his races showing some maturity. He, he obviously has that supernatural ability. This is a really exciting horse to watch. 
He's becoming one of my favorite horses because he's a gelding. And we're going to get to see this way more often, hopefully. Lots more to skelly. Tom more Durkin skelly. might describe it as a brazen display of speed. You saw the ears twitching back and forth, the removal of the blinkers. Skelly, Greg, nearly untouchable here at Oaklawn, and now the fifth back-to-back -back Count Fleet winner. That was incredibly impressive, and that U.S. win streak moves to eight for Skelly as we get to the sixth, excuse me, uh, eighth here in New York. Colonel Vargo, we expected to be this heavy favorite. He is three to five. Talk about FF Rocket, though, maybe one who could spring the upset. Right. Uh, Colonel Vargo should probably be running at a forty to $50,000 claiming race, given his recent form. And coming back two weeks after his last effort for 12500 there's clearly an issue. And he's going to be claimed out of this race. The only way in all likelihood it's not changing hands is if it's avoided claim. So who would you take to bet against him? Well, it's ridiculous that the seven is almost second choice because he has does a running style that pre prevents him from having really any real chance to win. Um, FF Rocket, to me, is the other horse in here. And I bet FF Rocket to win the two at 10 to 1, and I bet a 1 2 exact to cover myself. I threw the 8 in a little bit, who I think has a chance as well. But FF Rocket, last time out, that was a track that was. It was it was it was kind. I think it was fair, but I think it, it it worked against his running style, and that race was dominated on the front end. I'm hoping there's enough speed that he can make a run into it. He's been compromised on January 18th. That was the day we talked about where the three in the last race ran a huge improved effort as he was wide that day. I think the leadership Mongo, the trainer, won our first race today, is sort of an under the radar trainer. And listen, if this race is run fairly and Colonel Vargo shows up, he's going to win but I don't trust him, and you're not supposed to trust those kind of drop-downs this price, so I'll try to beat him with FF Rocket and save with a 1-2 exact. Colonel Vargo, odds on, he's won three in a row, six of his last eight. Let's go downstairs to Acacia. And Greg, as far as Colonel Vargo is concerned, I agree with Andy. You cannot really trust him, especially as he does have avoided claim on the form. He's in good form right now. And sometimes with the Jacobson horses, it's hard to predict what you're going to get from them. But as far as just from my eye does go, Colonel Vargo looks sensational. He's dappled out completely from head to toe. If you're ever wondering what we mean when we talk about dapples, just look at Colonel Vargo's coat. It, it's tremendous. Um, he, he looks the part. He looks like a three to five shot should. Very fit, very well muscled. From a physical standpoint, I do not have do not have any problem with him at all. The four motion to strike is coming out of um, some tougher races over at Fairgrounds last time out where he was chasing early last time out. And I thought it was pretty game to hold on to second. There was no catching the winner that day. He also has speed and uh, he's a uh, very athletic, got a big warm up out there. And it will be interesting to see how the pace does play out as the third horse I'll talk about is another one with speed. But the sixth airport at 28 to one just kept catching my eye. I mean, I don't know how the pace is going to play out here, if he's just going to totally fade and pack it in, and he's not been able to sustain much of that run late in the stretch recently. But as of late, he's been around three to one, and he's nearly 30 to one today. He looks incredible um, this afternoon for Rudy Rodriguez. So we'll see if he's able to stick around late in the race, Greg. And notches up another point here, almost 30 to one on airport three to five favorite public has not moved away from Colonel Vargo who tries to make it four in a row. Yeah, these are very dangerous horses to bet at short prices. He's a pretty likely winner of this race, but he's a very, very good horse to bet against in these circumstances. I think the two and eight are the reasonable horses if you're looking for somebody else. The big favorite breaks from the inside on the rail for the Jacobson barn with Isaac Castile. Let's go to Chris Griffin. Is in. All set. And they're off. Hop in the air at the start for anything possible, the early trailer. At the rail, it's Colonel Vargo with the early speed, right to the front with Mr. Phil. Those two join each other, and up on the far outside, here comes Breaking Stones trying to join them. In between racehorses there comes Airport, and at the rail, that's Motion to Strike. That's the leading five. Pink Cap moving forward, that's Joker Boy from the back. Horn of Plenty is looking for a seam, and the trailer, FF Rocket, actually far, far back there after that hop in the air at the start. That's anything possible. 
at the back end of the field. 22 and three for that opening quarter mile. It was pressured, but Colonel Vargo at one to two is in front, has plenty of action towards the outside as Mr. Phil is in pursuit. So is Breaking Stones. Does Airport have some room? Ellie Sale Ruiz is in fourth in hand. Nowhere to go right now at the rail motion to strike. They reach the top of the stretch and Colonel Vargo has kicked. It's Colonel Vargo who's got the lead. Trying to run with this rival is Mr. Phil muscling on in between horses. Airport, does Airport have enough? Does get the scene, but Colonel Vargo is still clear. Less than a furlong left to go. Colonel Vargo trying to hold off the charge from an oncoming airport. Airport running out of time. Colonel Vargo almost there. Colonel Vargo, Isaac Castillo, they get the win as the favorite. Airport second, then came a photo that was Mr. Phil with motion to strike. And one minute, 10, point four, nine seconds. Big favorite, he makes it four in a row in a good valiant run, runner-up finish to the one caught Acacia's eye, Airport. Yeah, you would have thought he would have been in front as he was the absolute speed on paper, but maybe they were right to rate. Maybe they figured we couldn't beat Colonel Vargo. I'd be interested to see if he's claimed. I, I, this is, these are very hard horses for me to deal with. I'm going to always bet against them, and you'll, you'll make some scores. You'll make money in, in the long term because this horse just shouldn't be in for 12-5. He should be running in allowance races or in certainly high-level claiming races. I imagine he was claimed. I'll be very interested to see if he can continue his good form. Four in a row, he just keeps doing it. Six for six at Aqueduct. The very tepid pace. He was claimed for 25,000, and he has won now six races since he's been claimed. He's won $80,000 in his last five starts, all these races in 2023, and, 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 and his last four races, he's been terrific. I, listen, I horses like this, like I said, I'm not shocked he won, I picked him second, but they're good horses to bet against over time. One six seven four in the eighth here in the York corner. Vargo does it again. Meanwhile, back at Oaklawn, Skelly, poor break, goes insanely fast up front, and it does not matter. He goes gate to wire to repeat in this race. Let's go to Maggie. Here, here with Steve Asmussen, uh, Skelly. What a devastating performance! And Steve, it feels like he's a horse that's actually getting more mature and more relaxed in his races. Uh, well, I don't know. 40, well, 21 40, and 40, yeah. 43. No, Just kidding. I think that he, he was a way a step slow today, and, you know, he had been breaking extremely well and relaxing just a bit. But, you know, we don't weren't looking to take him back, definitely, in uh, 21 and 2, 43. Just possibly the best race or the fastest race he's ever run. And to think after all that he's done, he's, uh, he's at this level right now. What an exciting horse. You know, congratulations. Congratulations to Chris Hicks, Frank Zalosa, who found him. And just, wow, what, what a performance it was today. And as you mentioned, his best yet. As good as he's made us feel on so many occasions. I was so concerned about the trip to Riyadh and, you know, what you sacrifice trying something like that. And just, I think, it, it, not only ability, the personality to take that and still show up and be the champ with it that he is. Well, you said something interesting to me yesterday about him being a gelding and that it gave you hope that he would get over that trip much better. Also, it keeps him around a, a bit longer, too. And do you feel like he's one that has now asserted himself at the top of this division? Well, he needed it. We, I mean, we literally had trouble keeping him on the racetrack yeah. before he was one. Like I said, Adolfo's done an amazing job handling him, galloping him in the morning with all of his breezes and stuff. And they, they are just in such a pretty rhythm right now. Um, like I said, I was a little concerned about his work. A, a week ago it was awfully sharp for him. But uh, middle of the week, he said he was ready for it. He was dialed in. And uh, what, a, what a performance today. Just so blessed to be a part of it. He's awesome. Steve, congratulations. Well done. Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And well done to the entire Asmussen team, rider Ricardo Santana, for a horse that isn't that easy to deal with, but certainly wicked fast. Guys. Speed horses aren't supposed to be able to do that. Not break well. Go 21 and change. 43 and change. Going sub 44, you do not see a lot and be able to hang on and win by as many lengths as he did against quality competition. That was so impressive. This is a brilliantly talented horse. You and I were talking off camera. I think the one concern you would have is he's already making his fourth start. He's run at Oakland three times. They shipped to Saudi Arabia. This is not necessarily going to help him as the year progresses to have a very, very strong campaign. But as a pure talent who he is now, 
he's he, he should be the favorite to be the sprint champion if he can continue to run these kind of races. You know, Speedboat Beach, the Baffert horse, who hasn't run since the Malibu, I don't believe. I mean, he has the kind of speed that he could be, I don't know, I want to say close to him early. His wow. horse is so fast. But I hope he certainly stays sound and he sticks around because we like talented horses, and this is a horse that we would see in the, Al the Alfred Vanderbilt up in Saratoga. And, and he, I mean, he's brilliant, this horse. Incredibly Man. fast, and he just keeps on winning it's it's amazing eight straight wins on u.s soil now for skelly who goes back to back of the count fleet that was fun to watch we're going to take a time out we'll be back louisiana bread millionaire getting her moment in the big time coming up a 17 time winner she's earned it gonna make her grade one debut in the apple blossom to come Be part of history. We saw history in the Belmont Stakes last year. There's going to be history happening this time around as well with the third and final leg of the Triple Crown happening at historic Saratoga for the first time ever. And it will be live on Fox Saturday, June 8th. That's a Thursday, I think, right? It's not even like a big, busy day. It's, just a it's not. Nice Thursday in the middle of August. The rafters may just completely spontaneously combust. We'll be safe, right? We'll be somewhere. We will be. We hope you join us. It's going to be fun. Colonel Vargo, this horse just keeps on winning. We'll find out for you if he moves to a different barn. David Jacobson, Isaac Castillo, four wins in a row, seven of his last nine. He has gotten his picture taken. Uh, he's, you know, the only, he's an amazing form. The only thing to say is why does he keep running so cheaply? We move on. To the finale, going to close out this card here in New York with a one-turn mile. New York Preds made in special weight, and he has it all outside for Ray Handel, has opened up as a 9-5 to five favorite. I believe if he runs either of his first two races, unless the first or the eight is some sort of monster, um, a for, ma good magic firster for Chad Brown, then he's going to win this race. He ran extremely well last time against open companies in New York bred, um, setting a very, very fast pace that totally collapsed. The horse who won the race finished second in our Wood Memorial last week, and this horse did all the dirty work and only lost by 11 lengths. He's going to be very, very hard to beat. And I'm looking at the big fours. He's not even favored over the seven. To me, that's laughable. All right, we'll have more on it when we come back from a timeout. A lot more coming up from Hot Springs as well as we continue our Saturday coverage. Next up, we'll meet the man who's known for saving Oaklawn Park. 
who's now being inducted into the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame. It's thousand words fighting back, coming down to the finish. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this is one stunning picture. Thousand words just in front. Thousand words wins the Robert B. Lewis. Honoree P is full out now, second on the outside. They're coming down to the line, and thousand words has done it. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.tv today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. ride from who? Rajiv Mirage, 7th Street, 15 years ago in the Apple Blossom. Rajiv, what do you remember most? Well, not only was it the biggest win of 7th Street's career, it was the biggest win of my career at that point. And this was the early stage of my, my career when I was just starting to make a name for myself in day-to-day -day races in New York Circuit. And to be able to go out of town, be shipped out by top connections to entrust me in a race of this magnitude, it was a great opportunity for me. And, and to be able to go and then actually win the race, it, it was one of the best feelings of my life or as, as my career. She was devastating, 7th Street. Hard to believe it's been 15 years. But that's the kind I was of only five years old at the time. <laughs> Pretty good riding there at five years old. It's, it's a riding family. Your cousin winning a race earlier today at uh, Aqueduct. But, but that's the kind of difference a victory in a race like the Apple Blossom can make uh, the most celebrated race for Phillies and mayors at Oakland, one of only two grade one events, the Arkansas Derby a couple of weeks ago and the Apple Blossom later on this evening. There is the field nine deep, a dare man of the favorite at nine to five wet paint. Number three, second choice at three to one and number seven, honor the lady with jockey Javier Castellano seeking a first win ever in the Apple Blossom and Maggie, it was a, a, a Incredible 2023 for Javier Castellano, the first one in the Derby, the first one in the Belmont Stakes, and today trying for that first one in the Apple Blossom. Yeah, Hall of Famer Javier Castellano and multiple Eclipse Award winner looking to keep things rolling when it comes to the grade one victories. He had 17 graded stakes wins last year, seven of them at grade ones, as you were mentioning, getting the two of the three jewels of the Triple Crown that he hadn't before and also winning his seventh Traverse Stakes. Um, the guy knows how to win races and he's definitely found the fountain of youth 
place now as a 45-year-old. And like you said, Lafitte, he will be trying to win his first grade one apple blossom coming in to ride the Safi Joseph trainee honor de lady. He'll also be on one here as well um, for Safi in Sarah's Shaman. So getting a good warm up here um, in this race coming up. But honor de lady, since the switch back to the dirt, she has gone two for three um, in graded stakes efforts. Now we'll see how she stacks up against some pretty nice foes in today's grade one apple blossom. Um, but she did nothing wrong last time out when taking the grade three Royal Delta in her four-year-old debut. And watching her school yesterday, she looked fantastic. She was dappled head to toe, full of energy shipping in here to Oaklawn Park. And Javier Castellano, he's going to bring the grade one magic yet again. Okay. Had it working for him last year, those seven grade one victories highlighted by that first ever win in the Kentucky Derby, that first ever in the Belmont Stakes, the, the Travers. It was a magical season. Javier Castellano, and now we turn the calendar in 2024, seeking a first grade one victory. What do you make of his chances aboard on our delay this evening? She's definitely one of the top contenders in this race. It's coming off her, her career best performance, winning the Royal Delta down at Gulfstream. This horse is on the up and up. You love to see when a horse is trending upwards like this. We also don't know the ceiling. This could be the next potential star in this division. Really improved since racing on dirt and now tackling. This is the toughest challenge of her career. Safi Joseph, her trainer, has really emphasized position. And she can be a little bit tricky to ride. The jockeys have to really encourage her to pick up her feet when the real running starts and right from the start. Javier Castellano, always known as one of the best position riders in the game from the outside post. How aggressive do you expect him to be? Well, Javier knows how to read the race in form. He's a jockey that is in tune with, with, the, with the tactics of the race. He's, if this horse needs to be closer, he will make it happen. And I think he's going to be aggressive leaving the gate. That's a very important factor in getting a horse that doesn't want to be engaged early. You have to be aggressive from the onset. Let them know that you're here to race today. Once you establish that position, establish that momentum, then you can always take it from there and start regulating. Tall order. Take it on the big girls in a dare manner. The favorite wet paint undefeated here at Oaklawn Park. Post time 645. The grade one apple blossom. You'll see it right here on Fox Sports 2. First things first, race nine. Good allowance event. One mile, $140,000 purse here. The field and updated odds with Alexander Helios Raj at nine to five. Yeah, Alexander Helios, the favorite here. He's, a, you know, coming before was Safi Joseph Train, switched to Dan Ward, came over to Oakland, had a third place finish in this race last time, chasing a super fast pace. Um, I expect that they'll try to regulate his early pace a little bit and save a little more gas in the tank for the end. Paco Lopez looking for a second win this afternoon. He'll ride shotgun hottie in the Apple Blossom. They'll make the turn. We'll kick off the post parade eight minutes out. Alexander Helios, two to one. Some support. Number nine at four to one in MacMan. And there's Eternally Grateful and Scott Becker, who saddled a $24 winner yesterday. Yeah, stretching out and stepping up to the allowance ranks here. Sarah Shaman, 7-1. to one. There's the, uh, the, the Safi, Hall of Famer. Yeah, it's Safi Joseph and Javier Castellano here getting a run over the track. Record point, 10-1. to one, Third race off the layoff. Then gamekeeper owned and trained by the Lucases. Yeah, nice win two starts back. Ran in a mile and a half stake last time. Comes back to a more realistic spot here. Trigger Happy just missed in his latest. Yeah, a horse that is super consistent but has seven second place finishes. Seas of Normandy out. Alexander Helios, aptly named son of Cairo Prince. Yeah, got caught up in a fast pace last time dueling early, uh, but uh, definitely a horse that warrants a lot of respecting here. Megan's Honor first or second in 17 to 27 lifetime? Consistent knocking at the door. You like Mac Man. Yeah, this is the horse that I like in here. He, his only two-turn race was an impressive maiden win last out. Lightly raced, but improving horse. On the stage, Eric Asmussen takes over for his father. Third in the off-the-turf race last time. 
That's kind of cool. Silver Heist, Keith, as we said, and the brothers will break side by side. Yeah, if that was Open my mics. brother, I'd be laughing, looking at him in the gate. I couldn't take it serious. <laughs> Eric and Keith side by side in the starting gate. And, and another one of those mile races, Rajiv, where we have the short, the first wire. More on that in a moment. We check in with Paul. Thanks, Lafitte. Now, you know, not giving you much here because I had this race marked down 7-9 and I actually like the 3 a little bit as my long shot. And I didn't think both these horses would be getting buried at the window, but I can understand why. Alexander Helios, um, Dan Ward and Paco Lopez are just a dangerous team together and seems like he gets the best out of his horses. And this horse does come off some of the better races, to be honest. And in is in a grizzled, you know, four-year-old with a couple wins, you know, like, you know, you look at the horse like the nine Mac man, that was a giant effort. And I've become actually good friends with Greg Compton. And I know that he's very high on this horse. It might be the best horse in his barn. And, you know, this horse went around two turns last time out and really crushed that field. Now, you know, Rajiv's talked about this and I've talked about this. When you're facing multiple winners, you know, I get the one to turn if a grateful is not that good around two turns as he is around one turn, but he's still a four-time winner. There's a lot of horse in here, multiple winners. So nine's really going to have to run in here. And we'll find out today, you know, if he's kind of the real deal. Because I think the seven will bring his A game. You know, I know I put my pick on the seven here, but I didn't think eight to five. If I was going to change, I'd go to record point in here, the three. And the reason why is this horse, if you look, had not almost run in a year, stumbled, lost the jockey. Then the last race kind of like got back on the horn a little bit and got a little bit more out of that race. I just think he's going to be a lot fitter. Two races, really only one race off a layoff since May. And I think could be sitting in a very good spot. And you're getting Chris Hartman at a really nice price, JK. Yeah, Paulie, I'm going to go with the five trigger happy um, for a couple of reasons. One, I thought the last race was pretty good. But not only did I think the last race was pretty good, I like why I think the last race was really good. There was a trainer change. And I think a lot of times when you see a horse run their best lifetime performance after a trainer change, it could be an indication that something about the new trainer Trigger Happy really likes, whether it's the way that the, the, the feed schedule, whether it's the training schedule, whether it's the morning exercise riders, uh, maybe it's an equipment change uh, that they've made with Trigger Happy. But all I know is that since switching barns, Trigger Happy ran his lifetime best. And I'm hopeful and assuming that at eight to one, I don't have a problem trying to figure out if he can continue to kind of stay in that, that, uh, that highest level that he's been in frankly, in his entire career. I'm going to go with the five trigger happy. I've got no problem with the seven, uh, but I can't uh, turn away from this eight to one on the five. Big number there. Second in his last pair. Sired by Gunrunner. Gunrunner siring a winner earlier on the Oaklawn program. Raj revisiting a topic we touched on about an hour ago, these mile races at Oaklawn Park and how they're different and how the jockeys are riding to the, the first wire. How does that change things? With the shortest stretch, the 16 of a mile shorter now, there you're going to be very, it's very conducive to horses that are close to the pace. Because if you're close to the pace, you have the first run on the closers into a short stretch. And I think that's going to benefit a horse like Sarah Shaman, the number two horse. He has a, enough tactical speed where he's going to be up close to the pace. Javier Castellano, the Hall of Famer. He's going to be able to save ground, and he might get first run on a, a deep closer like um, my pick, Macman, who I think will be coming from a bit off the pace. Mm -hmm. Now, Christian Torres on Macman, he's going to have to try to secure a, a forward spot from that outside post going into the first turn without getting hung out to dry too wide because he knows if he's too far back going into the second turn, that short stretch is going to impact him. Raj going with Mac Mann, the wagering public, siding with number seven, Alexandro Helios. Maggie, what are you noticing? 
Well, I think what Raj brings up is, is imperative to handicapping this race, and I don't think it necessarily hurts your your favorite in here, Alexander Helios, who is cutting back in distance is of three sixteenths of a mile. So it was a bit of a stretch for him, and ultimately, as we've discussed, he moved early in that race, and he moved into what were quick fractions for the distance of the you know it was twenty three and change forty six. Uh, so he tired, rightfully so. He's warmed up beautifully. I mean, all things look fantastic for your current two-to-one favorite. He's a really good-looking horse, and I think the cutback really lends itself well to him. As we'll take a look at the other one taking a lot of tension in number nine, Macman. It shows that he's lightly raced in that he's still... if. There was a line before his la after his la last race. I'd be concerned because he doesn't necessarily present himself as a fit horse. Quite chunky. Um, but I also liked the mile um, distance in here because I think a little less ground is going to be better for him. And watching the race uh, and watching Christian Torres ride him, he went clear and when he asked him with the crop he kind of got to wondering a bit and when he hit the lead he got to wondering a bit so he had to use the crop a bit more and he responded to it well but I think it was a hard ridden four and three quarter length victory so it's not like he just cruised um, to a four and three quarter, quarter length victory as a favorite that day so I have some reservations about this horse the horse that I really like though is number two uh, Sarah Shaman shipping in here for Safi Joseph though it's a Big question mark with this surface because his one dirt fast race was terrible but it was his first race so I'm always willing to forgive a horse for that and it's not like he looks proverbially turf or anything like that he's actually a very versatile athletic looking individual but I will say this the dam she was a turf horse siblings have one on either surface so I get the feeling that he could be that dual talented type of runner on either surface including graded stakes winner on the dirt great escape he looks fantastic such great energy shipping in here for Safi Joseph look for him to be prominent throughout like he was in that last effort um, but I like what I'm seeing from Sarah Shaman hopefully this team can get things started in the right way heading into the apple blossom guys that honored a lady Team, Javier Castellano, Safi Joseph, Sarah Shaman. Raj looking a little depressed after he heard Mag describe Mac Man as a little chunky. That is some <laughs> valuable information. And when you see a horse that comes off a two year layoff and they have two races and they still look chunky, the first thing that comes into my mind is it's not can a, I change a horse. My pick? <laughs> well, can I change my pick? And it might be a horse that you can't really train too hard between races. He has some susceptibility There's, that they have to really be a, a passive with. And for those reasons, this might be a horse that runs himself into shape more so than gets trained into shape, which is something that I wouldn't want to take on, on a horse that has only a few races under his belt. Live on the board, though, 7-2. to two, Mac Man leading rider Christian Torres, the favorites, Alexander... Helios, Matt Dinnerman with the call. Post time, race nine live from Oakland on Fox Sports 2. This race starts and ends at the 16th pole. And uh, Laroff, Megan's honor was a little bit slow to go. No problems for Alexander Helios. He's shown rain to be prominent. Wrecker point a little bit quicker. He's in front. Alexander Helios parks himself outside of that rival. Sarah Shaman and a pocket third down on the fence into the clubhouse turn in a little bit of a tight spot, easing off the leader. Wrecker point around that turn. The gray trigger happy, a little bit keen behind the speed. Eternally grateful down on the inside of him. Megan's honor after the bad beginning has made up ground to race a joint fifth. And also Macman is there. Another two and a half lengths further back to Silver Heist and Gamekeeper on the stage trails the field as they head down the back stretch. They went the opening quarter in 23 and 4 fifth seconds. Wrecker point in the white blinkers is a three quarter length edge on Alexander Helios placed in a perfect position. He's running in second. Trigger happy. Sarah Shaman are side by side. Macman is three deep. Megan's honor four deep on the course with that party as Sarah Shaman begins to give way approaching the four turn run. On the stage joins that rival with Gamekeeper eternally great 
Mindful shuffled back to the second last spot on the stage. Tries to get rolling, but has a lot of ground to make up as they round the fourth turn. Wrecker points still on top. Alexander Helios right there, a half length back, and these two open up too. In the third spot, Megan's Honors sent along. Trigger Happy calls it a day as they come off the turn. Alexander Helios, Wrecker point. They're side by side coming down the lane. Alexander Helios on the outside, breezing to the front. Wrecker point trying to fight back with the ears pinned back, but he's second as Alexander Helios shakes free. Alexander Helios, Paco Lopez with a double here at Oakland today. Wrecker point was second, gamekeeper third. Megan's honor, fourth across the line over Mac Man. Uh, too much Alexander Helios here delivering at two to one. Paco Lopez, the two wins, a date with Shotgun Hottie in the Apple Blossom. Picture perfect ride from Paco. And like we saw earlier with Flavian Pratt in this one mile, flat mile race with the short wire, they were both just tracking the leader and in position to take over right coming off the turn and, and hold off the closers. Maggie loved what she saw. Paul like what he saw from record point, completing the exacta. But in the end, too much Alexandra Helios. Results when we come back to Oakland, 7-3-4. Meantime, getting ready for the nightcap at Aqueduct with Andy and Greg. Yeah, we're going to close things out with this one-turn mile for New York Red Maidens. As we get a look at Sir Magic, Chad Brown, first-time starter. This horse, though, the nine, and he's still the favorite at nine to five. As he should be. It's a very fair price on him. He's just a super logical horse. We went through it before. He runs either of his last two races. Pretty likely winners against the track in his first race, against the flow of the race last time out. It's a big big pace that fell apart last time. It was a gold rail two-back. Gets a dry track. So unless his horse prefers a wet track, He's the goods and the worst to beat in here. Um, Merlin's moment, the seven, ran fine in the debut and is probably a very fair price at six to one right now. I thought the six in on it actually is a bit of a live long shot. Interested to see if the five Iron Man Ira coming in from Fairgrounds. First time for Rick Dutrow, maybe he improves the five to one. No bargain. He's awfully live on the board. I'd probably take a shot. And if I was looking for some prices underneath the nine, maybe the five and six. I would more on the favorite. Let's go to Acacia. Yeah, and we've been talking a lot about the uh, Aspison brothers riding against one another today. And here in the nightcap, you have Katie Davis against her brother Dylan Davis, as well as their dad, Robbie Davis, training the one. And Robbie told me he's got his tack in his car if he needs to step in at the last moment. But as far as Katie's mount does go, he has it all. Um, I do think we'll appreciate getting onto a fast track in here. Uh, physically, it looks like the mile is fine for him. He does get back in against New York Bread Company, as this is the other division of that New York Bread Maiden special weight. We saw earlier on track today warmed up nicely I don't have any problems with him and he does have that always dangerous early speed I'm a bit concerned with what I've seen in the preliminaries from the first time starter Sir Magic he was very laid back back in the paddock and then very green when he first got onto the track which is abnormal for a Chad Brown runner did not want any part of linking with the pony um, kind of sidestepping went off galloped by himself under Eric Hansel and he seems to have settled down now I'd say he's about 90% fit. Um, he's a horse that I'm going to take a, a bit of the wait and see approach with him as far as how he might benefit from having a race under his belt. The five Ironman Ira is a bit of the intriguing new face in here. They do take the blinkers off and he was not the quickest out of the gate last time out and was just kind of mid pack. never really got into the race. Comes back in here. I like the mile for him. I think he looks like this distance should suit him well and sometimes taking those blinkers off allows a horse to be relaxed, see their competition and hopefully, Greg, break a bit better today. Yeah, we'll see if he gets out better, too. And he has a really quick bullet drill uh, in preparation for this since that debut as well. Yeah, I'm, we'll see. I mean, he ran fine first time out and lost to a pretty talented horse. I'm just not trying to beat the nine. Not inclined to want to run to window bet favorites, but I think the nine is going to be very hard to beat here if he runs his race. Long shot and unaffected stepping in. But yeah, he has it all, has been favored throughout. Start number three here for Ray Handel was in against Open Company last time out, facing New York Breds here today. Chris Griffin with the finale on the Saturday card from Aqueduct. All set. And they're off. 
Merlin's moment towards the front. He has it all, shows early speed as well. And Iron Man Ira is now the leader. It's Iron Man Ira. Jose Gomez there in front. They're up by, call it about a half length. Wants to slow things down up top. Here comes He Has It All is ready to challenge this leader as they come out of the chute. It's still Iron Man Ira. Handful there down towards the inside. Now gets over to the rail with He Has It All. Just behind them, in on it is they're in third. It's a tight group here in that second grouping. Is unaffected, wants to get into the mix. Moves in the two pass and wants to move up with these leaders. At the rail, there is Judge Rules. That one's in fifth. To the outside, it's Merlin's moment. It's right there with Burning Beauty. Towards the back end, Muggsy Fury. The trailer is Sir Magic. He has it all is now tugging here, and he has it all is up by two lengths. Katie Davis, and he has it all. Take him into the far turn. Went 46.42 for that half-mile time. Iron Man Ira is right there, now moves to the outside here of the runner who got over to the rail, and Iron Man Ira is looming up on the outside. In on it is all in here from third. At the rail, Judge Rules. Manny Franco is now challenging for that third spot. Merlin's moment is chasing, and the red cap starts to make up some ground from the back. Muggsy Fury and Lane Leslie there on the move, but Iron Man Ira has been traveling nicely throughout. Reaches the top of the stretch and tries to kick away. It's Iron Man Ira trying to put it away. Iron Man Ira is up by three lengths. Here comes Merlin's moment is in pursuit and is coming after Iron Man Ira, who needs to find a final furlong. Iron Man Ira, Merlin's moment gets closer with every stride inside the final 16th. Merlin's moment will push on by. It's Merlin's moment to get the victory. Merlin's moment over Iron Man Ira. Then came Judge Rules in on it and Muggsy Fury. In one minute 37 and four. Merlin's moment comes and gets Iron Man Ira, who re-rallied after getting passed here by the favorite. Second time out for the Bond Barn. Yeah, the fight was obviously extremely well met, not only taking a lot of money after his dismal debut, but running you know, arguably as well, if not better than the winner of this race. But you know what? The seven-horse Merlin's moment had run well first time behind a runaway winner, St. Gaudens, in his first start. And he was able to swoop him up and get the victory in here. I think a little slower in the other division, um, but a nice effort by him. A nice effort by both the first two, and a horrendous effort by he has it all. Who, you know, they went a little quick early, but he was terrible. He had no answer and finished in nowhere. Seven five two six. It looks like, and five to one here on this second time starter, Luis River Jr. for Jimmy Bond Barn. I see the Bonds get a win. A generous price in this horse who, you know, he had run has run very well first time out as we talked about. Five improved a lot. It's sort of hard to believe the seven and five were the same price, but I guess the five yeah. was well met in this race. And they were right. He, he ran a winning race here. Just lost to a horse that was able to get a, maybe a slightly better trip. All right, so five to one to close out this card on the Saturday afternoon here at Aqueduct. Meanwhile, back at Oakland, there was an objection. Um, but in the end, it was apparently against fourth, the fourth place finisher. Maybe it was against, I think maybe it was against Paco Lopez for looking behind him about 27 times. It's no change, but we way. didn't know he had the best horse. Alexander Helios, the win, $6.60. Dan Ward, Paco Lopez, couple wins today and third win for this four-year-old. Uh, he was in control the whole way. They sort of oddly raided the two here, and Alexander Helios and record point, were, record point were basically able to control this race, and the favorite proved to be best. Race away from the grade one Apple Blossom in the Distaff Division. Race 10. Seems like it is wide open. Arkansas bread runners, allowance optional claiming, six furlong sprints. And the board says it all. Tim Bavati, a major player for Ron Moquette. Second start of her four year old campaign coming up. Yeah, I don't. I find a lot of these races, these Arkansas bread races, to be absolutely wide open. I'm never surprised when they play out that way. All right, much more with our crew out at Hot Springs on this competitive 10th race coming up when we return from a timeout. Apple Blossom still to come. Tax, your Black Eyed Susan winner from last year, former claimer, making her second start back of her four-year-old campaign. And Misty Vale, narrow runner-up in the great two Azari last start.
America's Day of the Races on our Fox Sports 2 coverage. Regional networks across the country. Grade 1 Apple Blossom still to come. Of course, fans got to enjoy the total solar eclipse. Hot Springs National Park was in the path of totality for just the third time in history. The last time was back in 1918. But fans that came out able to enjoy it just uh, a few days ago earlier this week. I unfortunately looked up at the sun without those special goggles on. That's why you've been bumping into walls. It is. Uh, I did not. It was so weird. I was walking home about, uh, what was it, Monday or Tuesday? Mo tu Monday, around 3 o'clock. People were just out in the street looking up. It was like really <laughs> bizarre. You like, tell people not to do it. It's difficult people. not to do it. Weird. $13.40 for the win with the James Bond barn here Merlin's moment. Second time out, Luis Rivera Jr. aboard for the win to close out this Saturday card here at Aqueduct. Yeah, I was watching the replay of the Wood Memorial where Luis Rivera, who's recently lost his bug, rode the long shot solitary man who finished second. And I know that he's made it in the Derby, and he's obviously a long shot and an unlikely winner, but I, I heard they were sort of looking for a jockey they made a decision yet. Boy, he gave this horse a great ride in the wood, and I hope he gets a chance. If he wants to ride him, he should get a chance to ride him, and he's, he's been riding well since he lost the bug. 7-5-2-6 finish. We got more coming up from Hot Springs. Best yet to come, that grade one apple blossom, and a very special story right now uh, with Lafitte. Uh, just an exciting time to be an Arkansas sports fan, right? John Calipari coming to town. We have the grade one apple blossom this evening. And next week, the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame, the induction ceremony, will take place. Eric Jackson will be there. He's being inducted. Jackson was the director of operations here at Oaklawn Park back in 1978. He served as a general manager for three decades and saw Oaklawn through some of the most challenging of times. Jackson, who would then pioneer significant developments that would lead to changes in the sport forever. You. Always, I miss you. Well, I miss you too. Eric is an innovator. He's a broad thinker. We have a problem. He will find a solution and then implement it. He is the most creative problem solver I've ever known. Eric um, was a big reason because of the things that he did, particularly the late 90s, early 2000s, to save uh, horse racing at Oakland. We were racing. 60 days, but we were closed 300 days. You had uh, intrastate simulcasting, and Eric said, gosh, if they can do it within the state, why can't we go across state lines? And so the very first uh, interstate simulcast with merged pools came here at Oakland, and I believe it was 1989, and today it represents over 90% of the North American handle across the entire United States. And it started right here because of Eric. Hey, man. How are you? How are you? Doing? I'm fine. Good to see you. Good to see you. After simulcasting, uh, we started to climb up the peak. But then in the early 90s, riverboat uh, casinos started. So we were feeling the crunch, and it was his thought that if we don't change something, we're not going to be in business much longer. Eric came up with a thing called instant racing, which was an electronic product under the horse racing law but it was based on making a wager on a previously run race in an electronic format where you could do it just uh, uh, instantaneously. And it much uh, resembled a slot machine. And it saved Oklahoma for that interim period for sure uh, before it ultimately was authorized to have full-scale casino gaming. When did you take over the club? In 2009. Wow. Boy, time flies. It does, yeah. It does. With Eric, we've got great relationships with the Arkansas Racing Commission and the Arkansas HBPA. He's always been uh, a key element in the communication with horsemen from scratch. I always felt that we could go to Eric. He was black and white. There was no fluff in anything that he decided. But if it made sense, Eric was right there and was real good about giving it to us. The Oaklawn racing program today is as good of a program that there is in America, and Eric contributed to that greatly over the years and through many different ways. A pleasure to have Eric Jackson on set. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time, taking a big step back, and even watching that feature, all the time you spent here at Oaklawn over the years, 
Seeing where Oaklawn is now, how proud are you of the current status of Oaklawn Park? Well, I, I think everybody involved, myself in particular, we're busting with pride. I mean, we were almost out of business not that many years ago, and look at the place now. But this is a testament to the Sella family. It's a testament to the team at Oaklawn. It's a testament to our horsemen who didn't give up. And after you've almost lost something and you managed to claw your way back and get it at an even higher level, you appreciate it a whole lot more the second time. When did you start believing the, the clawing your way back was possible and that Oaklawn and that the racing here could, could reach the heights that it has? Three things came together. Charles Sella overpaid purses by $5 million. Would it look like we were going out of business so you would never see that money again? I've told everybody if we were a publicly held company, we would have all been fired. Uh, <laughs> and then right after that, we came up with uh, interstate full card merged pool simulcasting. We did it on a handshake with Arlington Park and Dick Deshaswa. And then we came up with instant racing, which was historic racing. That was the patent. We called it instant racing, and that was the turning point. And quite frankly, I think that was in 2020. We have never looked back. Our mm. purses have gone up every year since. All that time spent at How active are you still here at Oakland? Well, I do my best to stay out of Wayne Smith's way. He is our general manager and does a great job. Uh, I'm on the board, and I am the senior vice president. I tell everybody that's the perfect position for me because we've never had that position and nobody knows what I'm supposed to be doing. So it's just <laughs> ideal. <laughs> and I'd say, congr I don't know if to say congratulations on the induction into the Hall of Fame that will take place next Friday, because we need to reference the fact that that should be plural. Two Hall of Fames you'll now be a part of? Well, that is, that is correct. And what's particularly neat about that, I think I'm the first person to go into both of them in the same year, but there's only four people in both of them and one of the others is John Ed Anthony, who's a leading, leading horseman in our state. And uh, he and I were together recently, and we're both pretty proud that we're in it together. Are they aware that you used to break in to Oakland Park? We didn't bring as that. As a kid, is that yeah, on we, didn't, we didn't bring that up. No. <laughs> uh, but used to be we had a minimum age. You're not in the Sports Hall of Fame yet. <laughs> not they just they yet. might change their minds. <laughs> no, we used to have a minimum age, and it was 16, and I was the scrawniest kid in high school. And of course, it's a rite of passage to sneak in. Yeah. I think it's all the, the boys, even all the girls, got in before I did. But I, I finally got in, and I said, this isn't a bad place to work. <laughs> You've made such a difference here. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. And again, congratulations. That Hall of Fame induction taking place next Friday. Again, thanks so much for the time, Eric. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Good again. seeing you. Eric Jackson joining us on the set as we get closer and closer to the main event, the grade one Apple Blossom race number 12, 11. As the festivities continue, the party on this massive day of Thurbid Racing, such an exciting time to be a part of the action here at Oak Lawn Park. Apple Blossom Saturday as our coverage continues on Fox Sports 2. Can't get out of my mind. I saw him down at OBS for the two-year-old sale. His breeze was spectacular. And then top the sale. Everything he did in his career, breaking his main sprinting on the dirt. Very, very impressive debut. Winning a grade one, stretching out. Breezing through the stretch. He's the real deal. And then the Breeders' Cup at Del Mar. He's just too good. Cornish wins the Breeders' Cup juvenile. And then going on and being a champion two-year-old, extremely difficult to do. Obviously, Quality Road has done enough for, for all of us to understand what he's doing. I thought Wasted Tears was a very, very good mare, Najran mare. She obviously won the Ginny Wiley Stakes, also a course record holder in the, in the Ouija board. So really good female family, good sire line, was delighted with him physically and, and was excited to breed to him. It's very important for us to breed physical to physical and uh, try to get the best physical cross. We're very happy with the foal we've gotten. He's got a great natural shape to him, a great hip, got a lot of power behind. It's very nice balance to him. Plenty leg, you always like to see a horse have enough leg. Also, he's a very uh, intelligent foal, you know, pricks his ears, has, a, has good presence to him. This is a Corniche filly out of Anima Jamela. Been a standout since she was born. Very strong, very well made, good mover. Really, you know, everything we were hoping for. 
you know, he's got a really sharp eye, good good shoulder nexus, um, nice top line, like the way he finishes out behind, but he really sort of travels over the gown smoothly and just has a real sharpness to him about his body and is exactly what I was hoping for, but I mean, we all know that hopes and dreams are not actually what they always pan out to be, so when they pan out, you double down. Joining us on this glorious afternoon out here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It's America's Day at the races on Apple Blossom Day. We've got one more until the main event as horses about to leave the paddock here for this Arkansas bred allowance race. We'll check in with the main contenders here, and one of them does include the speedy number two at Tamba Body for Ron Moquette. Now, she looks like she is on paper. She looks like a speedball. She's stout, compact sharp, all things you want to see from a sprinter as last time she just chased uh, and was second best behind the gate to wire winner Hall and Ice. Uh, so I like what I'm seeing. She's got a little annoyed here in the paddock uh, as we see the foreman here on her head. She is wearing earmuffs, but uh, she's doing a good job of saving that pent up energy until she hits the track as we'll check in with Randy Morse's charge. Punchy girl. She sends out tax in the grade one apple blossom and punchy girls looking for her fourth win in, or excuse me, your third win in a row as it's a testament to sometimes you just got to go back and get a horse's confidence up. A horse that is an Arkansas bred stakes winner early on as a three-year-old and they kind of went back down to the bottom with that non three for 20 for Arkansas breads, got that win, rattled off another win back in here uh, for the tag as she looks great. Looks as though she's thriving right now. Beautifully on the bridle, really rich, hydrated, dappled out coat to her. So I think she's kind of intriguing here as we'll also take a look at number nine, Mozingo. We saw former Diodoro horse get the win off the trainer change earlier on in the card. And this horse is one that she won the proverbial battle, but lost the war as Cantex was able to run her down late as a favorite back on March 2nd. I see nothing not to like about this Jerry Karoom uh, homebred and own charge making her first start for Michael Hewitt. You know, you look for these Diodoro claims to look a little bit different, and she doesn't. So I would think that, I should say trainer changes, I would say Lafitte that she's ready to run her A game yet again. Mozingo, co favored, three to one, rejoined by Rajiv Mirage. Uh, Maggie's right. Mozingo doing everything but win that down the dusty road early March. Yes, yeah, she took all the pace, pressure, was involved, and that was a stake race. This is an allowance, but she was involved in the pace, pressure, battled it out, and narrowly missed. That was a gritty performance. The fight that she displayed, though. Yeah, she was resilient in that race. She lost nothing in defeat. Seven to two. Who'd you come up with here? Originally, I picked Tim Vati, the number two. Talked to Chance Moquet this morning, the assistant for Ron Moquet, his dad. And of all his chances today, this was the one he was singing his praise. He said, good stuff. I like my horses. I love this one. Um, he feels like she's in top form. Finished second last time in the same level off a three-month layoff. Uh, which was a very credible performance because she was four and a half lengths clear of the third place finisher, Miss Carroll County, who was in this race as well. Uh, and this is the reason why she's a favorite. However, after listening to Maggie, I, I, I like this nine based on the last race. And I was kind of torn between the two. Now, when I hear Maggie say <laughs> that, <laughs> it's very close. A lot of changing of can selections. I pick both? Can well, I pick yeah, both? You can box them. You can put them in an exact. Yeah, absolutely. Box them. Yes. The current uh, choices: uh, three to one, Tim Bavadi, and uh, the nine at seven to two, Mozingo. Post parade, you saw run in the streets. There is Tim Bavadi and Rafael Bejarano. Yeah, this one looking good out there off the second place finish that we talked about. Music mistress, second in her last pair. Yeah, another one knocking at the door, always puts in a good race and was actually the favorite in her last race in this level. Sharp Delta Moon is rattled off too straight, but still an outsider, punchy girl. And Maggie liked what she saw of her in the paddock. Another one on a good trend, two wins in a row. Miss Carroll County would be a somewhat of a surprise. Well, third off the layoff and had a decent third place finish last time. So she's the one that's trending upwards she's as well. Little one paced. Uh, then the girl in red, Nick Juarez, only jockey this one with her. 
Another one that's third off the layoff and switching back to Nick Juarez. Mozingo, that near miss, she was 14 to 1 that day. And then Sassy last, a 20 to 1 with Chelsea Bailey. This one is going to hope for a pace meltdown. Blinkers off, off a deep closer who doesn't break well. Heated argument, uh, a solid effort at this level last month. Made a bit of an early move into a fast pace last night, paid the toll for that late, but still held on to only lose by one length. Field for the 10th race 11, the grade one Apple Blossom. We check in with Maggie standing by with trainer Randy Morse. That's right. As he just told me, I, I asked him how the big girl was, and he said, a lot less nervous than I am. But uh, that's a good thing about horses. They just take it all in stride, especially the good ones, and she is a good one, Randy. Uh, talk a little bit about what you've seen from her since that comeback race, winning at six furlongs. I mean, she's just trained awesome, um, you know, which she always has, but she's, she's really, really doing good. Just a matter of if she's good enough or not. We were talking about the pace dynamics. As you said, doesn't feel like there's a lot of pace in here. Coming out of the sprints, where would you hope to see her early on? Uh, hopefully she gets away good, and I, I'd like to see her, you know, forwardly placed, where she's fresh, like you say, coming off that three quarters. Um, hopefully she'll show a little more pace without being asked to do it. And Christian Torres being aboard her in the mornings, too. Um, talk a little bit about their relationship. He seems to have kind of gotten along with her well in especially their last outing. Yeah, he, he's uh, been on her a lot in the mornings. And as every jock that's ever sat on her, they just love her, you know. Yeah, he told me yesterday she's kind of push button. She does whatever she's asked of. Uh, talk a little bit about your horse here, though. Uh, certainly a player in here, punchy girl. I said in the paddock, it felt like, you know, you had to go back down to the bottom to get her confidence up, and now she's looking for a third win in a row. Yeah, as you know, it was nothing like a win for a horse. That's exactly what she needed was some confidence. So she's more than capable of winning this race. Wishing you the best of luck and in the next. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right, Randy Moore sending out text. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited to see this gray filly. That sprint victory here at Oakland, Raj, impressive. As you mentioned, getting her confidence back, that big gallop out. And what a story for a former claimer turned graded stakes winner, a grade two Black Eyed Susan winner in tax. Yeah, and what was impressive about it was that she did it at the six furlong distance. That's not her optimal distance. She's more of a a dist long distance specialist. That was just a race that was meant to be a, a starting point, a stepping stone for, for a race like this. And it showed them, it showed everyone, that she has come back this year a, a progressive filly. She's progressed, she's advanced since her last, her last races. And she always showed that she has talent. Now, a lot of questions are gonna be answered. Is it grade one talent? Take it on the big girls. Grade one, Apple Blossom, race 11. Four minutes out to the 10th. Over to Polly. Yeah, and right now, guys, a really wide open betting board, but the, the public is going with Tim, Tim Bavati right now, the two in here. And, and I can actually see that, you know, because I think that she might control on the front end in here. Um, and she's coming off a nice race where she was off a three a month layoff so she might have needed that last race and I can understand why Chance who handles a lot of the stuff for Ron too as well so involved with the barn and very very sharp with his horses uh, is does like the chances of the two in here and I think the horse to catch now when you get to some of the others in here you know punchy girl is a horse that's won two in a row for Randy Morris uh, since being off Lasix and uh, two wins in a row and a horse that's pretty consistent usually runs the same type of number I like the four in here. I'm surprised at this horse is seven to two. I mean, Joe McKellar has had seven starts, two wins, two seconds, and a third. And part of it's been because of this filly. This four-year-old filly, since he's taken the blinkers off, if you look at the one muddy racetrack race, if you draw a line through that, she's been right at the wire with a lot of these fillies. I think she draws great. Uh, in here she can sit behind some of the speed and Luis Fuentes is is a nice little pilot so I think you're getting a nice little seven to two I'm just against the nine in here guys at seven to two I just think the four music mistress is a good bet at seven to two but they're gonna have to run down the two she might be in front for a long time JK 
Yeah, I agree with you, Paul. I'm going to go with the four music mistress as well. I'm not crazy about our last race. Uh, sometimes, though, when the paces aren't very fast, sometimes weird things can happen. Uh, maybe a horse who wants to be a little bit more forward, you take their weapon away when the pace is kind of slow, and then you invite the closers in. I'm going to ignore that last race. The two and three back races, the one from February 17th and December 30th, both of those races are the reasons that I'm going to pick the four music mistress. If you look at that race, two back was wide all the way around there. Uh, there's been two horses that have come back and run second out of that race, two horses that have come back and run third. And then the race three back, there's been three horses that have come back and won three horses that have come back and run second. Very productive races Music Mistress has been facing. I understand the last race wasn't as good as those previous two and three races back, but I think for some reason, if she can find those fit those races with a little bit more of an honestly run race from a pace standpoint, I think the four Music Mistress could get her picture taken here in uh, the next couple of minutes. Getting closer to post time, Music Mistress. Yeah, those two second place finishes. Raj in her last pair, what do you think is the key for her to victory this afternoon? Well, one of the things is she comes from a bit off the pace. So it's essential for her that there is an honest enough pace up front. The faster the pace with horses dueling, softening up each other would be the best for her because we're going to see her best kick when it comes down into the late part of the races. Uh, on paper, how fast do you expect the pace to be early on? Well, Timbatavi, Timbavati, is on the in is in position. So Rafael Berano, he has to ask or hustle her out to a secure a good spot early. That is going to ensure a fast pace. And this filly is capable of running a half in 45, which is pretty quick at this level. And if I'm on... Not skelly fast, but fast. <laughs> not skelly fast. But if I'm Christian Torres on Mozingo, I, I'm on the outside. I'm not going to let him get an easy walk on the lead. I'm going to want to put him, you know, put, apply some pressure at least at some point going down the backstretch, which could set it up good for a closer like um, Music Mistress. See the selections from our handicappers, and this is what we were talking about. Mozingo revisiting her most recent, that down the dusty road, early March right here at Oaklawn Park. And Mozingo, who, who battled and battled, and essentially Raj doing everything but getting the money. Yeah, and, and this was at a higher level, but this goes to show that she had typical speed where she can be close to apply the pressure on the front runners, but she doesn't have to have the lead, and she will maintain her position. She could sustain getting into a dogfight and still have something left, which, which might be the difference maker here. If there is a head-to-head -head duel between Mozingo and Timbavati, Mozingo is probably going to be the one that has more to offer in the stretch if they were to absorb that that fight. Leading rider Christian Torres, two wins on the afternoon, and what an opportunity for Torres trying to win a grade one shot to take down the Apple Blossom with tax in about 35 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's looking at it race by race. He wants to win this race, but when you get close, one, you start getting those butterflies in your stomach, and I'm sure in, in the back of his mind, he's now less than an hour into a chance of winning the Apple Blossom. That's probably in his head right now. Excitement builds. Apple Blossom race 11. First things first, post time for the 10th. Live from Oakland, Matt Dinnerman standing by. Here's heated argument. We're ready to go. And uh, they're off. Music Mistress from post position number four was away alertly. Miss Carroll County getting into the race early. Miss Carroll County and the girl in red, those two square off. Mozingo not far off the lead within a half length. Now a neck, those three across the track. Music Mistress takes back to fourth to race with Punchy Girl. They're four off the pace. Another length to Timbavati. Heated argument side by side. Delta Moon loses contact with that pair. Is joined by Sassy Lass and running the streets. First start against winners off the maiden win about a month ago is last as they round the far 
third turn. The pace being set by Miss Carroll County, who leads the charge. Mozingo takes the second spot, comes up to apply heat on the leader. The girl in red back in third, losing position. Heated arguments trying to make up ground into third with Punchy Girl at the top of the lane. And then comes Timba Vadi as a lot of ground to make up as they come to the top of the stretch. Mozingo off the turn with Miss Carroll County. Mozingo in the white blinkers. Here comes Music Mistress charging down the outside. Music Mistress and Luis Fuentes after Mozingo and Christian Torres. Music Mistress, Mozingo and Music Mistress going to the front from Mozingo. Music Mistress for the Joe McKellar Barn wins it by a half length. Mozingo's second home. Third was Miss Carroll County and Punchy Girl was fourth. Exiting live races, as JK pointed out, Music Mistress and Luis Fuentes at three to one in the 10th at Oaklawn. Race dynamics and pace was the deciding factor and the outcome of this race because Moz Mozingo got caught up into a hot battle, a three-pronged battle, 21, for, sub 22 first quarter, 21 and change, and it set it up for the closer Music Mistress who just got good momentum coming from off the pace, settled early, shot out of a cannon in the stretch, and just wears down Mozingo right in the closing stages. For Team Mozingo, tough pill to swallow, and two gut wrenchers in back-to-back -back efforts. Yeah, she did all the dirty work, she ran her heart out early, and it just, it was handed on a silver platter for Music Mistress to capitalize, and. She sure did that. Who had finished second in her last two races. You see a fired up Luis Fuentes at the wire. Why not the winner's share of this $140,000 purse? Music mistress, trainer Joe McKellar. Raj, not starting a lot of horses here, not starting many horses at Oakland, but those that he's leading over, they're running well. Yeah, he doesn't just come here for his good looks. He comes here to win races. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good to win a $140,000 Allowance race, right? But but perhaps not in comparison to a $1.25 million grade one event. That is next. The one we've been waiting for, the grade one Apple Blossom, one of the most celebrated events for Phillies and Mares in the country. And there's the favorite. Tucked away for now, a dare manor named after Ireland's epic five-star hotel and golf course, historic, stunning, and for the first time in 2027, home of the Ryder Cup.
Plum Pretty is asked the question, chased intently by Absent Minded and Tiz Miz Sue. They're a furlong from the finish and Plum Pretty's in cruise control. Absent Minded did her best, could not keep up. Tiz Miz Sue outside of her, Plum Pretty dominating in the Apple Blossom. What a classy filly and a dynamic comeback. Wow. Brilliant in the 2012 Apple Blossom, former Kentucky Oaks winner, Plum Pretty. See, she did something wet paint is gonna try to do, Ross. She had not raced since the Breeders' Cup. She made her following year's debut in the Apple Blossom and rolled exactly on the agenda. What's on the agenda? for wet paint, stellar win, plum pretty, Azari all able to do just that from the Breeders' Cup to the Apple Blossom Winter Circle. And it goes to show you, it's not that tall of a task. Sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on horses coming off layoffs, what version of them is gonna show up. There's a two things. Tall of a task, because many horses have done it before. <coughs> Sorry. And wet paint is coming from a barn, Brad Cox, one of the top conditioners, who wins at a high percentage with these kind of moves. And so for the viewers just joining us, this is what the Apple Blossom is all about, championships. 16 fillies or mares have won this race and gone on to be crowned champion. Who will be next? Find out in the next 30 minutes or so. For the meantime, entering the winner's circle, music mistress, Joe McKellar had her ready to rock and roll. 860 for your would-be $2 investment, JK on target. Mozingo, another tough one to swallow here, Raj. Yeah, it was a, gr a great run from Music Mistress. Strategy perfect by Mr. Fuentes there. Just sat back, let them duke it out in that three-way duel, and that definitely softened up Mozingo. When you lose a race by a neck, like Mozingo did, tough. you have to feel like that early pressure is what made the difference. We turn the page, main event, America's Best Racing's Race of the Week, 60th running of the Grade 1 Apple Blossom. First look at the wagering. Look at that, a dare manner, trained by Bob Baffert. Much more on his stats and domination at Oakland over the years in a moment, but there is a live look at a dare manner on her way over four to five. Last year's top ranked mayor in California, and that Baffert factor at Oaklawn Park. Home away from home, you bet. More than 30 years since his first ever starter at Oaklawn. Since then, well, he's racked up 39 wins, 31 of them of the stakes variety. Ted Williams country and then some batting 420 in Hot Springs. Of those stakes wins, 25 of the graded variety. Of those, six. Grade one victories, five Arkansas Derby wins highlighted by American Pharaoh back in 2015. And you just saw it moments ago. Plum Pretty, his lone apple blossom win. Bob Baffert, his home away from home and looking to pad those stats in about 26 minutes. Raj, if there is a formula to succeeding and shipping horses from California to Oakland Park, suffice it to say Bob Baffert's figured it out major races on the calendar, races like the Apple Blossom and the Arkansas Derby. And Bob Baffert is looking at these races from well in advance, targeting them with these kind of horses. And that's why he has such big success in this race. So tell me why Adair Manor, in her one start this year, while in defeat, why we could feel even more confident about her going into the Apple Blossom. Her most recent race, while in defeat, was her career best speed figure. She ran four points higher on the buyer scale than she's ever <laughs> run in her life. So and she's already a grade one winner. And she's already, she's one of only two grade one winners in this race. Adair Manor and Wet Paint are the only two grade one winners in this race. But this showed improvement. She's improving on form that was already top caliber that would have made her a favorite. And now she goes and runs 102 buyer speed figure. So you're Juan Hernandez, right? riding Adair Manor. What is your primary objective in the early stages of the Apple Blossom to give her her best chance? It's pretty straightforward. If I'm Juan Hernandez, my filly has speed in a race that do doesn't have too much speed in it. So I would be looking to break away from the gate, let her use her natural speed as her weapon, and get comfortable wherever that is. If I'm on the lead, no problemo. 
if there's someone else that wants to do too much of a fast pace, I can always just sit back and track. But this horse is going to put him where he needs to be. Just be a good passenger early. Like we were just here a couple of weeks ago, watching Juan Hernandez, watching Bob Baffert do their thing. Muth taking down the grade one Arkansas Derby, now looking for the Oaklawn grade one sweep in the Apple Blossom, Adair Manor, four to five. Whose withers will that garland be around after the 60th running of the Apple Blossom? And when we come back, free like a girl. She isn't free, but definitely a bargain. Meet free like a girl and her connections next. Olympiad leads American Revolution. Olympiad gets the gold in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. In the Pilgrim Stakes, they come on for the finish, Annapolis by a head. It is Annapolis in front. It is Annapolis to win the Coolmore Turf Mile. There's a big, bold, beautiful world waiting to be explored by you and your friends, of course. But not just any friends, the best of friends. The kind of friends who let you do you. Because in this world, it's positive vibes only. And when you get in the zone here, you stay a while. These aren't just good times, they're the best of times. And your time is now. So come explore. Resorts World. And wet paint is looming on the extreme outside here. Olivia Twist is running a big one. Grand Love on the inside and condensation. And wet paint from last has swept by in mid-stretch in the fantasy. Wet paint is drawing clear. Taxed is moving on by Olivia Twist into second. Wet paint has swept the three-year-old Philly series here. That was last year in the final Kentucky Oaks Prep, but it was a big win for Wet Paint because it proved that those big numbers she was receiving, she could do it on a fast dirt track, and it made her the favorite in the Kentucky Oaks. Yeah, I, no, you're right. That was that was the first race where she was able to run a reasonable race on a dry track. But I also think she's kind of a horse that proves that figs don't lie. She was really never that fast, and she was a bad favorite in the Kentucky Oaks. And, She's okay. I mean, she ran well to win the CCA Oaks in one of her better races, overcoming a relative lack of pace, not beating the strongest of fields that day. And she was one of the better three-year-old fillies in the country in the dirt last year. Whether or not she's that good remains to be seen. Now, Brad Cox has terrific numbers. I looked up his three- to seven-month layoffs in dirt routes, and they're very strong. He's 5 for 14 in great stakes with a $4 ROI. So it suggests they make that kind of improvement they need to make, but she lacks peak, peak speed. And there isn't a ton of speed in this race, and the horse she has to beat by a lot is a very fast horse early. So she's badly compromised here. I think Brad would be happy with a good showing. Whether or not that showing is good enough to win remains to be seen. So all the success this uh, ownership group has had, Godolphin at Oaklawn, wet paint. We'll see if she steps forward now in her four-year-old debut coming up. You know, regardless, hey, these, these top trainers in the game, they're very good at bringing horses back, but it is tough to bring a horse back off the bench in a grade one. I'm sure they would have loved to have had a prep. Yeah, I mean, at least Taxed had that six furlong race under her belt. 
And with Baffert shipping here, because, of course, he can't run the La Troyenne at, at Churchill Downs, the grade one on Derby weekend, she shows up here. And, you know, I don't know if she's really a 92 buyer, a 102 buyer type horse, a dairy miner, dairy miner man, man, excuse me, but she's faster than wet paint. Can wet paint improve enough to be competitive, especially because the dynamics are against her as well? Five-month layoff. She is undefeated at Oaklawn, so back, obviously, to track that she loves. And she's a very interesting name, how she got it. Let's go to Maggie. That's exactly right, Greg. And it all started back in 2021 with Essential Qualities win in the Travers Stakes when longtime Godolphin employee and integral part of the team, Tammy Masterson, was on site and jubilant with the big win. And as they were walking out and as the tradition is in Saratoga that the colors of the winning owner of the Travers Stakes, well, as we well know, they get their canoe painted, but also the jockey statue painted as you walk in the front gate. So as Tammy was walking out, she joyfully ran over, stuck her arm around that painted jockey and returned with a hand of royal blue. And Robin Shoemaker, the painter that day, then after yelling wet paint, wet paint, wrote a sign that said wet paint and stuck it to the jockey too. So they all came together and thought, what a great name for a horse. And it plays well with Wet Paint's pedigree, too. So that is the long and interesting story of Wet Paint. But Lafitte, names can be very special. And for another horse in this apple blossom, Free Like a Girl, it's an extra special one with her connections. Far from the favorite, Maggie, perhaps a sentimental favorite she's currently 48 to 1 yeah free like a girl her name uh, free because of her full brother was named free indeed like a girl because of the little girl that loves her so much and for her trainer chassis deville palmier she doesn't think free like a girl has to prove anything because of everything she's done to this point we had her older brother, we broke and trained him. We actually broke the track record going two and a half with him in Louisiana. Uh, so when it came time for her the next year to come up to the yearling sale, we went and looked at her and we kind of knew we wanted to get her. We liked her brother. Budget was uh, like 5,000. We got the 5,000 on the bid. We didn't have the bid, we were the underbidder and dad looks at me and goes, well, you know, she shows up to be something one day, you'll kick yourself, offer 55, go from there. We got her for 5,500 and she's already made 1.3 million. For dad and, and the other partner, we're already partners, so we were trying to figure out if we wanted a piece or not. And my daughter had a show pony that the owner, the original owner, Mr. Bruno, had given her. It was absolutely amazing. She was making him a jumper and he colicked on us. We did surgery. And so uh, Mr. Gerald being who he is and he's been a family friend, offered her $1,000 or a piece of the filly. And my kid being game as she is, one of the piece of the filly. And she's been along for the ride ever since. <laughs> She's my first racehorse, and I technically have another one, but she's like my heart one, because I saw her and just instantly fell in love. Watching her race is really cool, but I get really nervous, because when she's in the gate, I hold my breath, and then when she gets out, I like finally breathe, and then the home stretch, I'm like just trying not to just faint, because I'm not holding my breath at all. She's just amazing. We uh, ran her in the allowance race to see how she would handle the track, if she liked the track, if she could handle the altitude difference, and she seemed to handle everything fine. Free like a girl trying to tag her. Free like a girl, all racehorse. That was kind of our deciding factor. Hey, let's come up if it's shorter field or, or just take a shot in the apple blossom and, and hope for the best. She was two-year-old champion filly of the year for Louisiana. She came back and was three-year-old champion filly of the year and horse of the year. She is the queen of the barn. I mean, she's been a blessing, uh, amazing. She's definitely routine based and she just loves her job. And we love watching her just cause she goes out there every day and does what she wants to do and loves it. What a story. It doesn't get much better. Live look at Chassis DeVille Pommier. 
And Raj listening to her daughter, Avery, talking about and interacting with Free Like a Girl, that, that part really, really hits home. Oh, it's very touching. For someone this young to have that experience and, and something like this, it's just really special. I'm really happy for them. It's nice to see some of the people that are the smaller capital investors get to e enjoy something so special in this game. See, that's worth tweeting about. That's <laughs> worth putting on TikTok. I'm 12 years old, and I'm a co-owner of a horse running in a $1.25 million horse race. What are you doing today? <laughs> yeah, that's got to be inspirational to people in that age group as well. How many 12-year-olds are out there with a horse running for a $1.2 million <laughs> race right now? Great. Great story. If you did not have a rooting interest in today's Apple Blossom, now you do. Free like a girl. Looking to shock the racing world 46 to 1 with these terrific fillies and mares in the infield. 13 minutes out till this grade one Apple Blossom handicap. And for our viewers just joining us, we touched on this at the top of the show, Raj, the significance of this race. There aren't many races on the calendar that have championship implications that are run in April, this one does. It's by far the most significant race for Philly and Mayor Distaff runners in the first quarter of our racing calendar. Many of horses have used this to, to championship. Let's get to Maggie standing by with Juan Hernandez riding the favorite of Dare Manor. Yeah, here with Juan Hernandez, we make the walk to the infield one today. Game plan. She looks as though she could be the fastest horse on paper. Is that what you're going to do? Yes, that, that, that's her style, you know, and, uh, like, but I'm going to play the break, you know, if uh, the plan A, plan A, plan A is, is try to go up, but I've, she can run, she, she, have, she, can, she can run behind the speed too, she has different styles, and then she looked great, she looked great, she looked great in the paddock, so let's, let's see what happens. And uh, Bob Baffer, the confidence he has in you, how much confidence does that give you? He gives you a lot of confidence, you know, and then uh, he knows that he, he has his, his horses ready all the time. So, you know, I, I ride with confidence, too, because uh, I know I have a lot of horse on, under my knee, so, and I always try my best. So, let's get, I hope, let, let, let's get lucky. Yeah, let's get it done. Thank you so All much right, for thanks. your time, Adair Manor and Juan Hernandez. And we reunited again. He knows her very well, Lafitte. And he knows how to win big races at Oak Lawn Park. It was Juan Hernandez riding for Bob Baffert two weeks ago, the victory on Muth. Normally, he would be dreaming of riding Muth in a Kentucky Derby. Bob Baffert trained horses, not eligible to earn Kentucky Derby points. Instead, maybe he's riding one of the favorites for the Preakness in Baltimore. Yeah, it's very unfortunate for the racing world, the racing fans, that Moot isn't going to be a part of the Derby because he would definitely be one of the top contenders. But the race winning the Arkansas Derby for Juan Hernandez, winning for Bob Baffert, it plays a lot of significance in him as a jockey because Juan Hernandez has been up and coming jockey from a second tier track golden gates then he came to the, the major california track santa anita del mar and now bob baffert is taking him from there and sending him out to ride these major races in the nation he's getting to be one of his go-to riders in big races and that's one of the best places for any jockey to be juan hernandez you saw aboard adair manor and that was jimmy barnes Bob Baffert's assistant trainer, the, the war road warrior, Adair Manor. To lend perspective to the confidence Baffert has in Hernandez, he has won 15 grade one events, 10 under eight of those trained by Bob Baffert, Juan Hernandez. When you ride for Bob Baffert, you win grade one. Juan Hernandez deservingly got the opportunity because he's a top class rider. He's established himself on the day in day out races in California to, to get the opportunity to now become the guy that goes out of California and, and challenges the big races throughout the nation. And, and doing it for Bob Baffert, there's probably no better place to be. Another look, Chassis DeVille Pomier and what this moment must mean to her. All right, so our viewers know the story now. Look at this race on pe paper and tell me how. How can Free Like a Girl pull off this massive upset? 
I know she's a big long shot. She's never faced the kinds like this. However, she's consistent and she has enough tactical speed in a race that we're talking about that kind of void of some significant speed. So I expect that she, with the good inside post that she has, her jockey Mar Marinique, he's going to try to get her close to the pace. She, if, if I was riding her, I would hustle her out of the gate, ensure that I'm apart, or if not right up close to the pace, and then just kind of bide my time from there. And probably you tr track Adair Manor and use her as a good guide to take me around the track. Talking about free like a girl, the Louisiana bred, first or second in 27 of 37 lifetime but taking on the big girls today another look at a dare manner in the colors of michael lund peterson the, the great dane he's known as owns some terrific horses over the years gamine the first that comes to mind and a dare manner again her stock rising even in defeat the biggest buyer speed figure in her loss in the beholder mile and now her second start of the season in this grade one apple blossom three to five nine minutes out we check in with maggie Four, three. Uh, a little bit of a delay here as horses just got riders up with the tractors still on the racetrack but let's check in with your current heavy favorite in adair manor uh, she's such a tall drink of water she's all legs and she has filled out i mean the last time i saw her was two years ago nearly for the grade one cotillions we do see riders jumping off as we'll be in here for just another moment or so um but adair manor i think the longer the better i know she's only getting another half a furlong here but she was getting to sweet azteca who was able to wire the field last time in that comeback race in the grade one beholder mile she just needed more ground and she gets it here. Do I think she's better now looking at her as a five-year-old mare with even more? Possibly. But as we heard from Juan Hernandez, she's likely to be forwardly placed in here, though there's some other horses that are very sharp. One of them that won't be challenging her for the lead is the comeback queen in here, number three, Wet Paint, taking a lot of attention at five to two. And it's well documented, obviously, that she loves it here at uh, Oakland Park. She is one that has always been fairly quiet and reserved. Uh, I remember going back to the fantasy, though, in which she won maybe her one of her best performances to date. She was actually a little bit more energetic. But look, she looks the picture of health. And she looks incredibly fit coming back in here. She hasn't changed much from three to four. And Brad Cox, when I spoke to him yesterday, did warn me of that. Um, but as he has said, Lafitte, he is very excited to get her back to the races uh, because he truly believes he's ready and she's ready and that she belongs in this. And just um, there, there was an issue with the tractor, right? A 16th of a mile beyond the finish line here. So the tractor is going to, I should say, the uh, bulldozer Lafitte is going to kind of re go over that spot where the tractor's harrows, I guess, just had a malfunction. So that's what we're seeing this delay here for the grade one apple blossom. Didn't see that in the rundown. Bulldozer. Matt, what'd you do to the bulldozer, man? Uh, it, the bulldozer is trying to manicure the track, but it doesn't look like it's working too good. I have Eric Jackson on the set, and you're over there sabotaging the, the bulldozer. Slight delay before the start of the grade one. Apple Blossom will step aside when we come back. Hopefully, riders up a post parade in the 60th running of the Apple Blossom. Clarier, brilliant a season ago. What will we see in this year's edition? We'll find out soon enough, we hope.
What do you do when the a bulldozer delays the start of a grade one event? You kill time by diving into the stats and numbers. Apple Blossom by the numbers. Most wins all time. Azari back to back to back. This makes sense. Owner of Azari, the late Alan Paulson, four time Apple Blossom winning owner. Hall of Famer Bill Mott, all kinds of success on this stage. Most wins by a trainer. The number is four. The number is seven for most Apple Blossom wins by a jockey, Mike Smith. From the Apple Blossom to the Breeders' Cup Distaff, or classic in Zenyatta's case, four have done it. This is what we're talking about, championships. 16 Phillies or Mares have won this event and eventually been crowned champion Eclipse Award winner that same year. And three Apple Blossom winners have been named Horse of the Year. Abba de Grace, most recent, the Apple Blossom by the numbers. First edition, 1969. You see that big crowd? We have a big crowd today. A lot has changed since. What remains is the prestige and importance of this event, Raj. Yeah, this has so much implications on championship and just winning the Apple Blossom in its own right is just such a big win. It's a $1.2 million race. It's a big event here. And, and, and a big deal. Riders up. All good with the bulldozer, I suppose. Over to Maggie. <laughs> The bulldozer has left the scene. Exit, stage left for the bulldozer, um, but really rectified the situation. As I said, there was a malfunction with the Harrows on the middle tractor. So it was in about the seven path, if you will, um, as horses will break from right behind us here. Um, they will be heading into the first turn there. So they had to make sure that surface was even, uh, evened out. And they definitely did as they then brought another tractor back over it to harrow it. So all things good, all things ready to go. Horses on the track, commencing a post parade, Lafitte, for this grade one apple blossom. That call to post, Maggie, thanks so much. So everything straightened out. The stage, as it were, is set. That delay, albeit just for a few moments, Raj, for the riders, what are you doing until you get back in the saddle, so to speak? For me, I'd be running the rates a thousand times through my head still. <laughs> it's all about execution. Uh, when, when you start thinking about the moment and not thinking about what you're supposed to do in the moment, you, you, I, I'd find myself getting nervous, thinking about the opportunity to win. It's, it's a thing that could make you start losing your focus on what to do. So I would be thinking about what am I supposed to do? What are my, what's my plan A, my plan B, my plan C? Running those scenarios and trying to pick up any clues or any cues that I could get from my opponents to see what they might be doing. Jockeys, other jockeys, how they're warming up their horses and, and stuff like that. I think we know what he'll be doing. Pedal to the metal, free like a girl. Quick drawn inside the Louisiana bred 42 to 1. What a story. Yeah, this is the sentimental favorite of the race. Um, it, tackling the big guns for the first time, but we're hoping to see a good performance. Taxed, last year's Black Eyed Susan winner. Nice um, prep race for this with a three length victory. Stepping up in class today, going for the first grade one win. Good offense, wet paint, perfect at Oaklawn. One of only two grade one winners in this race, perfect at Oaklawn. One of the top contenders. Adair Manor, odds on three to five. The deserving favorite um, is stepping up back to the grade one level here and just coming in on a top form. Flying connection, Ricardo Santana looking for a graded stake sweep. This one is the monkey wrench of the dynamics of this race. What Santana does early is going to have a lot of implication mm. on the pace of this race. Misty Vale defeated a neck in the local prep, the grade two is Zary. Knocking at the door, a consistent sort, who is trying to get that elusive um, graded stakes win. Lady, razor sharp, coming in hot. Yeah, coming off a grade three win in South Florida, a, a horse that is on the upward trend, trying to see where she fit amongst the top contenders here. Bella More, Keith riding for Father Steve. Third place finish last time over this track in the Azari. Just got beat a length and three quarters. Shotgun hottie, Paco Lopez looking for his third win this afternoon. Undefeated Paco today, two for two. Shotgun hottie was fought by two lengths over this track last time in the Azari. This is the third off the layoff. 20 to one. The field, nine Phillies or mares, grade one apple blossom nearing post time. We check in with Paul. 
Yeah, and when you look at the favorite in here, Darren Manor, she looks awfully tough, and she looked like she was the queen of the paddock as well. And, you know, talking to Jimmy Barnes a little earlier, he actually was saying to me, you know, this race is a lot tougher than maybe the, the tote board looks, you know, Sir being right now at three to five. But he also said, look, she's very tactical. I wouldn't mind if she just goes right to the front end. And there's a lot of speed in here um, at three to five. I'm surprised that wet point, wet paint, excuse me, is your second choice. I know that she owned this racetrack, but to beat these type of horses off this type of layoff, she must be training like an animal in the morning to be your second choice. I thought Tax ran a dynamite race in her comeback race. Randy Morse has been really, really high on her, Greg. But you know what? I'm going to take a shot today with Shotgun Hottie. I just think this horse sat really bad trips in the last couple of races, and I think she's primed for a really good race today. Listen, the four is going to be very tough at three to five. I just think Shotgun Hottie is going to outrun her odds at 20 to one, Greg. That one right there, this mare, grade one winner, deserves to be a heavy favorite. But we were talking about this race, Andy, in the seventh, the eighth, the nine. We think this race is being misbet. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, you started the conversation. You, mean, you, you turned to me and said, how are the seven, eight, nine all such big prices? And we think Wet Paint is a good, a good horse to bet against. She's being bet on a reputation that she almost doesn't even deserve. I'm not trying to be too hard on her, but she's never been that fast. And, I mean, I don't think that the two is a bad – listen, they're all good horses. I'll knock them. But tax is going to have to get faster, too. And all of the 7, 8, 9 are cable running faster. So our, our plan, and Greg and I have put into motion in our Naira Bets accounts, we're going to make the four on top of 7, 8, 9 in the try, second and third, and a small saver with 7, 8, 9 over four with 7, 8, 9 third, and try to take advantage of the, the mismet race. Yeah, now I mean, you look at Honor to Lady the Seven, 13 to 1. She comes back her four year old debut, and she runs a figure that's in the ballpark of some of the best races that Darren Manor's ever run. I agree. I mean, and you also you have to like the fact that she's coming off her best career start. Did she have a perfect trip? Yes, she did. But she has a trainer who wins, and she has enough tactical speed to put herself in position to get another good trip today. I think it's ridiculous that she's twice the price of taxed and four times the price of wet paint. She might be a better horse. Surprising. 13 to 1 right now. 3 to 5 favorite, though, remains the great one winner at Dare Manor. Let's go to Jonathan for more. Wolfie, I, I desperately want to try to beat a Dare Manor, but uh, her last race is just better than what everyone else has run. And, and while there is a couple of horses that are turning four, like wet paint, there's, there's a, a big jump up. They can really make some improvements. Wet paint's style has always been a little bit annoying to me coming from way out of it. Uh, I, I, I it just it, it just doesn't seem like you want wet paint yet. It feels like they probably got a little bit of a late start with her. Uh, maybe down the line a little bit with her throughout the rest of the year. Tax going to have to prove it to me as well. It just left me no choice but to fall uh, to a horse like Adair Manor. She's got a tactical advantage. Uh, she, she ran well in her first prep race coming, getting ready for this, if you want to call the Beholder Mile a prep race. She's just got everything in her corner, including a tactical edge. If this was a, a race on a Wednesday uh, at Indiana Downs, you'd say, oh, the four's got a little bit of a pace advantage, going to be forwardly placed. It's not going to go very fast. I just, I, I just I wish I could think of something a little bit cuter here. If I was going to pick one of the four-year-olds, it would be taxed. But like I said, she's just got to get a lot faster. I'm going to go with the four or Dare Manor. Jonathan, real quick, the discrepancy between Adair Manor and everyone else. Is this a Bob Baffert thing? Would she be three to five if she wasn't trained by Bob Baffert and we weren't at Oaklawn Park? Well, that's the thing. When I looked down, I wanted to try to beat her. Bob Baffert has a name that when he ships to places like Oaklawn and Churchill and New York, uh, where he's not all the time, people that follow the game enough know that Baffert's horses win a lot of races, and they often get overbet, but they win a lot, too. It's very similar to what we see up at Saratoga with Chad Brown and with T and Todd Pletcher. It feels like they get overbet, but are they really getting overbet? Because they win a lot of stinking races. To the tune of 42% Bob Baffert, over to Maggie. Yeah, I, I just can't fully pick uh, three to five shots. It's kind of like, you know, against my religion. Um, just kidding. But I, I, I dare Manor can definitely win. I literally have nothing against her here. But I'm going to try uh, for a little bit of a uh, long shot in here. But let's talk about tax. Uh, as she is second off a layoff, I had a lot of interest in her. 
Until I saw her in the paddock, um, I still feel like at this caliber, she needs to be more fit. Even though she's second off, even though she's been working very forwardly, and two, she's getting it back out to a mile and a 16th, which, which I think, despite being winless, is really well within her wheelhouse. I just think this is more of a stepping stone to see where she stacks up, to gauge where she belongs. That's a short price on her, too, where you're getting astronomical prices, as the guys were saying, on many of these, including number seven, Honor Delady, at 12 to 1. She did get fairly revved up in the preliminaries, but she's a horse that, at least you know, looking at our last race, projects to be somewhat forward in here. Now, I will have this caveat about that great, great three Royal Delta in which the favorite did not fire at all. She also feels like a little bit of a testy horse that doesn't like to feel the crop that much, but she looks the picture of health, and I loved Bellamore. I loved everything I saw from her. I thought, you know, she ran a well and respectable lace la race last time in the Azari. I'm going to shoot for the moon here, Lafitte. 31 to 1. Why not? <laughs> Bella More, Keith Asmussen would be a first grade one victory. Same can be said for Chassis Deville Pommier looking on fly like a girl and daughter Avery, the 12 year old, a co-owner of a mare about to run in a grade one event. Final check of the tote board reading three to five Adair Manor, the favorite post time for the 60th running of the grade one. Sports two. Here's Matt Dinnerman. Side. We're ready to go. And uh, they're off in the Apple Blossom. Flying Connection got squeezed coming out of there. Adair Manor is showing speed. Honored you lady right there with her. And Shotgun Hardy, three across the track. And now Shotgun Hardy takes a hold. Adair Manor goes on with it here, takes the lead and takes the initiative into the clubhouse turn. A length and a half clear. Honored you lady concedes the lead second. Free like a bird is running in the third spot. Shotgun Hardy inside of her. A gap of a length and a half to Taxed and Bellamore. They're side by side. Another length and a half to Misty Veil vale and Wet Paint. They're together. Flying connection at the back of the pack off Adair Manor, who leads the charge, went 23 and 3 fifths seconds. A moderate pace at best set by Adair Manor. Javier Castellano wants to get after that front runner with Honor D. Lady, and he shakes the reins at her, and she goes up to apply pressure on Adair Manor, who appears to be going well within herself down the back stretch. Honor D. Lady, second and a half length back. Shotgun hotties right there. Three wide, perched in the third position. Free like a girl in fourth into the fourth turn. She's lost a couple lengths. Taxed is next. Bellamore is shaken up. Wet Paint needs to do more along with Misty Vale. And Flying Connection has yet to pass a runner. Adair Manor quickening that pace. Shotgun Hottie chasing in the second spot. Free like a girl calls it a day. So does Honor D. Lady. Bellamore into the third position with Free like a girl. They've got to get going. And then comes Taxed as they come down the lane. Adair Manor has scampered away. She's gone four ahead with a big kick. And she's opening up now. Adair Manor by five with a first long to go. Coming flying down the outside is the big long shot flying connection, but Adair Manor has a six light lead and she is back in business. Adair Manor wins it in devastating fashion under Juan Hernandez. Flying connection second, free like a girl third, and shotgun hottie completes the superfecta. Adair Manor looking strong in the apple blossom. in control every step michael lund peterson's amazon mayor adair manor runs him off their feet in the 60th grade one apple blossom yeah she just did her thing broke well uh juan hernandez led her bounce along in her rhythm she has that high cruising speed and she sustained it and that's a dangerous weapon. When you can run fast early and sustain it over a long course of distance, you become in a different level of horse. How surprised were you that she was allowed to dictate the tempo as easily as she was? Well, she ran fast. She ran a, a half in 46, which is fast at the distance. She dictated the race because she has the natural ability to do so willingly. And I was not surprised because I expected Juan Hernandez to just let her do her thing, be a good passenger early. And that's what he did. Very polished trip for him. Everything went well. Adair Manor. Michael Lund Peterson, known as the great 
Dane, owner of a great mayor, and for Juan Hernandez, Bob Baffert. Baffert, the Arkansas Derby Apple Blossom Sweep. He pulled it off in 2012 with Bodie Meister and Plum Pretty. He does it again with Muth and Adair Manor. Juan Hernandez aboard for both and quickly establishing herself as one of the top mayors in the country. This is definitely a step towards a championship run or an attempt at a championship as the top filly and mayor. Did you ever get the sense she might be in trouble, she might be in deep water, that somebody was gathering momentum to rally and challenge her in the stretch? When you look up at the clock going down the backstretch and you see a half in 46, that does tend to lean to some vulnerabilities because that is a hot pace for the level. But it didn't look like it. Maggie, as you can see, with winning pilot Juan Hernandez. Maggie. <laughs> uh, I, she is so big, Juan, that I'm standing next to her. She is such a big girl, but what an easy win in this grade one event. Yes, yeah, she's huge, but at the same time, <laughs> She's a really nice girl. She's she's so nice. She's so kind. And like uh, plan A, A work. Uh, yeah, you asked me for the race. You know, she broke really sharp. She was really, she was really, really uh, game today. You know, she was quiet. And then she went to the to the gate. I feel the I feel the uh, she wake up going to the gate. And then I have a nice break. And you know, after that, she was really comfortable. That's her style. Run on the lead, and I just let her let her go, and, and then be galloping up there. Her ears were pricked. Even when Javier Castellano tried to send honor to Lady, she was like, I really don't care. That was so easy. Looks as though she might be at the top of this distaff division after that blowout win. Yeah, she was doing everything. Uh, I mean, not easy, but comfortable. She yeah. was doing everything really comfortable because, to be honest, I have to ask her a little bit around the turn when I feel the other guys. I was like, okay, time to go. And I was uh, and I was thinking, like, I'm going to... I was thinking, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I'm, I'm, I have to work a little bit more on her, but as soon as I ask her, she switch lead and then she take off again. Oh, she's amazing. Juan, congratulations. Go get your picture taken. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I just, I just want to say thanks uh, uh, to Bob for the, for the chance to let me ride this beautiful filly. To everybody on the barn and, you know, to the, <clears throat> to the ground. Uh, he do all every, uh, they do everything, so I'm just here to, to have fun. Thank you. Roberto, congratulations. Big win for you. Thank you. Love getting the groom in. And the Baffert team, two for two guys in the grade one apple blossom. The, the grade one sweep Oaklawn, the road warriors for Bob Baffert, the high five Juan Hernandez. 15 years ago, you won this apple blossom with 7th Street. You could sense that excitement from Juan Hernandez. What is he? Can you ex expand on that a little bit and what this moment is like for a winning jockey in this race? His moment is very similar to my moment because at the time when I won the Apple Blossom 15 years ago, I was just an up-and-coming jockey. I wasn't a nationally known jockey. Juan Hernandez is in the same kind of stage in his career. He's starting to make a name for himself at the highest level. So this win, while it's a great win, a million dollar race, over a million and a quarter dollar race in grade one, it also makes him feel like, wow, Bob Baffert is putting me in these opportunities and there's more to come how many times will he watch the replay tonight how many times did you watch the replay oh I, this is something that he won't be able to sleep tonight he's gonna <laughs> get a jitterbug he's gonna get butterflies and he's gonna wake up early in the morning to go to work Th that is the winner sensational performance at dare manor and another story that we built leading up to post time free like a girl and her trainer chassis deville pommier is with paul with trainer here, Chassie DeVille Palmier, who runs third here with Free Like a Girl. She keeps on giving for you, Chassie. She ran a dynamite race today. Yes, she did. We we're so proud of her. Uh, I couldn't ask for anything else. We knew it was going to be tough coming in here. And we just wanted to be here. A great opportunity just to be in this race and run against these types of horses. It's an amazing field of fillies uh, we faced. And uh, I'm just so proud. She gives me everything she's got every time. And I can't ask for anything more. Those Louisiana breads keep on giving, don't they? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Free like a girl. A really good third here at a monster price. <laughs> and, and you can see him watching the race and the level of pride. Third in the grade one apple blossom for this Louisiana bread. It's a big deal, and it's a multifaceted ways. First of all, she's now a grade one place filly, which brings up her value, her, her broodmare value, her residual value as a broodmare. And she also collected a big purse. And it, this might be 
the first grade one place in ever for the trainer and owner connections. For Chassis and Avery, a moment they'll never forget, even though not in, in victory, but the story has been all about Avery, a co-owner of a grade one place fair at the age of 12. I don't know if they keep stats on that kind of thing. I have to think that has to be some sort of record. It wasn't a first place win, but it was a victory for this connection to be able to finish third in this race. $5,500. She was a millionaire coming in, but now that grade one placing and and for her to exceed expectation we picked her up round in the far turn while Adair Manor was clearly in control free like a girl was cruising towards the leaders on the rail we should have skipped dinner and used that money and invested in this horse because <laughs> we could have got a piece for, for what we paid for dinner last night <laughs> big big effort from free like a girl to uh, complete the trifecta in this apple blossom in the end no match for Adair Manor and it'll be see we'll see who can run with her moving forward as much as she has seemingly improved at the age of five now a second apple blossom for trainer Bob Baffert padding those stats here at Oaklawn Park just too much Adair Manor the favorite delivers in the 60th grade one apple blossom. Tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit BelmontStakes.com slash tickets today. is Mo Donegal by Uncle Mo. And they're off in the Remsen. As they come on for the finish, and it's going to be tight here in the Remsen. Mo Donegal. Mo Donegal bearing down on the outside. It's Mo Donegal and early voting. And it is Mo Donegal to win the Wood Memorial. And it will be Mo Donegal to win the test of the champion, the Belmont Stakes. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira Circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state-bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info. Back with you on America's Day at the Races and Adair Manor. What a brilliant performance. The great one, Apple Blossom, our winner circle lead in, brought to you by Fasic Tipton's industry leading selected yearling sales, July sale, Saratoga sale, New York bred yearling sale, all taking place this summer. Nominate your yearlings today at FasicTipton.com. This was just flat out dominant. Yeah, she really was. I mean, that was a very fast pace. You look at how the horses that tried to challenge her early in that race, and there were some decent ones. They just completely fell apart, basically. Um, and she just crushed this field. Listen, on paper, she was a heavy, heavy favorite, and she really ran very, very well. Hey, listen, the competition is going to get tougher. Let's not just like sort of anoint her the champion, but she right now may be the, the, the leader. She's certainly the leader of the division, I would say, at this point. But there's a lot of racing to come. She's a good one, no doubt about it. Very disappointing that from wet paint. I mean, it's not that we really liked her that much, but she and Tax, given the pace, are supposed to put in some kind of run there, and they never showed up yeah. at all. Good for free like a girl. Yeah. And these connections to Louisiana bread millionaire adding to that resume and that bank tally. Again, <laughs> purchased for just $5,500 cool. 
well over 1.3 million in earnings now. Right, she got almost uh, 20 times what she cost just for finishing third in this race. She's a cool horse. And she actually, I mean, good trip saving ground, but she was close to the pace. And other than the winner, she was the only one that survived at all that was near the pace. And as you mentioned to me, in this division, we're still waiting for the reigning champ to come back. We will see that very soon. Idiomatic. The La, La Trienne. Yeah. We're hoping, I don't know what's going on with Pretty Mischievous, but she should come back randomized. Hopefully she can make the ruffian maybe here. I think that's Derby weekend. So there are some big dogs coming back, but right now she is the big dog in this division, that but a long way to go. That was big good. time to watch. Yeah. Able to do things on her own on the front end, though. And Bob Afford continuing to dominate in, in the marquee races out at Oaklawn. We're going to step aside for a timeout. We'll let you know what happened. Picture is complete now, finally. Last chance to qualify and earn points for that first Saturday in May, the Kentucky Derby. We'll tell you how things played out in the 42nd running of the Lexington. Back with you on America's Day of the Races on our Fox Sports 2 coverage. Third and final leg of this year's Triple Crown. It will take place at historic Saratoga Racecourse, and it will be seen live on Fox Saturday, June 8th. That town every summer, the crowds swell. It becomes an event all summer long. It's it's going to be out of control for that week of the Belmont Racing Festival. It's going to be a great weekend. I uh, hope you get to join us there. We'll obviously can watch us if you can't come, but it's going to be a lot of fun, a little bit of an appetizer before a month later we head up there for our meet. Well, the Derby picture officially now complete for that first Saturday in May with the running of the Lexington and one horse had the ability to earn the points to get in and make that field. That was Hades. Instead, it is Encino Gate to Wire giving possibly, we'll see if there's a defection, is going to need a defection to get in, but maybe giving Brad Cox a little more depth on Derby Day. Yeah, a, a curious decision by Luis Saez to rate the wine steward who was the speed and allow her that was slower to wire on a track that was very tilted towards the rail. Now, to be fair, the wine steward spent most of the race on the rail. And a tip of the hat to, uh, to Florent Giroux for being aggressive in this situation and really winning the race for him. If the wine steward had gone and he had stalked, probably would have been a different result in here, but credit to him. How good this race was, I don't know. I, you know, I don't understand this. Like, Hades, they put their eggs in the basket of the Florida Derby by missing the Fountain of Youth. 
and then they don't get the points and they rush two weeks later to run in this race. I, I don't know if it's probably, I don't know if it's an owner's decision. It's a curious decision. I'm glad for the horse it didn't work out. He's probably better off not being a derby and obviously and doesn't belong. The sports. happiest people, the connections of no more time, who this horse, uh, if Hades had one, would have bumped out of that top 20. Uh, this horse now, who wins this race, sits at number 21 on that list. He would need a defection to get into the Kentucky Derby. we got three weeks to go. We'll see what happens. I guess the, the main one you're looking at there, maybe, obviously anything can happen. But Endlessly, who's primarily um, a turf horse, Let's wait and see if connections do want to go on with well, it. Well, and deterministic. He's not going to re -kick. I can't believe there's any chance he's going to run the derby. No. I, 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 I'd be surprised yeah. knowing the connections like I do. So he so it could happen. So he unfortunately is in the race as a result of that win. I don't know what kind of effect he can happen have in there. We'll see what the figs were. I like to see the New York Red uh, Wine Stewart come back and run well to be second. I'm yeah, going to be a little biased to the home team. Brad Cox with Catch Freedom uh, as well. He's got just a touch and. This would add him a, a little extra depth, and we all know from just a couple of years ago with Rich Strike, anything can happen on Derby Day. I guess so. We'll see. I mean, you know, all I do is hear talking people talking about the two favorites. There's a lot more going on in this race besides the two favorites in here, and I think it's open, so there's a little time. Try to be a little more creative. Yeah, and those two big favorites, of course, Fierceness, Sierra Leone, yeah. going to be the top two choices on Derby Day. Yep. Back to Hot Springs. What a performance we just saw at Dare Manor. Guys, that was fun to watch. Just took it to him right from the start, wire to wire, and performing like an odds-on favorite should in the grade one Apple Blossom. You were talking derby three weeks from today, Raj, when you're riding what you believe to be a live contender heading into the Kentucky Derby. And you rode several of them, Wicked Strong and Irish War Cry and, and Mucho Macho Man. It, at this stage, when you're getting closer and closer, can you describe that level of excitement for a rider? Three weeks out, there is there is excitement, but there's also anxiety because you don't want to get that phone call that <laughs> there's something went amiss and now we're not running into the derby because basically it's closed, shut. There's no more chances to get into the derby. Everything has shaped up. There's no more qualifying races. You have to play the hand you're dealt. So now it's almost like you just want to find some bubble wrap to give them to bubble wrap your your mouth. Yeah, I'm thinking that. Yeah, you know, every time you the phone rings. Incoming text, you're going to flinch a little bit, not wanting. We've seen, I mean, several horses last year defecting in the final days leading up to the Kentucky Derby. And here at Oaklawn, over the years, such a, a productive trail from Hot Springs to Louisville with Smarty Jones coming to mind. Of course, American Pharaoh 15, Baffert Triple Crown winner. So, how strong is this year's contingent of horses who prepped in the three year old races here at Oakland, starting with Catching Freedom. We watched him in the Smarty Jones on New Year's Day, and in the end, an emphatic Louisiana Derby winner for trainer Brad Cox. How legit of a threat do you feel Catching Freedom is in the Derby, Raj? Well, this horse has shown what he has. He has a good late kick. He can beat that level of competition. He's done nothing wrong, and he doesn't need to take his racetrack with him. He runs his, a good race here in, in Oakland by winning, and then he goes to Louisiana and he wins again. That's, you know, when you don't have to take your racetrack with you, that's a big plus. It makes you think that he's going to run his A race wherever he goes. And normally you hear about you don't want a closer in the derby and all the traffic and navigating through 19 other horses, but Mage last year, Rich Strike, back-to-back -back years, horses from far, far back taking home the run for the roses. We've seen mind that bird from about 300 lengths behind and just cu cutting through on the rails. So it can be done. There's a lot of horses that have, have shown, um, had had success, whether winning or hitting the board in the Derby from well, well off the pace. Wayne Lucas, pretty good in the Kentucky Derby, a four-time winner. He's won with a former claimer. He's won with a Philly winning colors. So your thoughts on Just Steel and that bang up second place finish to Muth in the Arkansas Derby a couple of weeks back. Yeah, and prior to the Arkansas Derby, he was a horse with high expectations that was having some rough trips. He had a very dirtied up form, and things came together better for him on Arkansas Derby Day. And we saw what he's really capable of, which was a good second place finish. And obviously the horse that beat him that day, Moot, isn't eligible to run in the Derby because of the Baffert factor. But Just Steel, if he can, he, he needs to take a step up off that performance. But it, but it is a step in the right direction, his Arkansas Derby performance. Watch him draw the rail. Watch him draw the rail. <laughs> awful luck 
all winter and spring in these prep races leading up to the Kentucky Derby. He has Derby. been getting the parking lot post on the outside, which has been affecting him. So I'd maybe the parking lot maybe the, the rail it would be good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Just deal for a four-time Kentucky Derby winning trainer, D. Wayne Lucas. And in win, lose, or draw, it's just a terrific, terrific story. Still seeing the coach back in the mix at Churchill Downs for the run for the Roses. And then uh, Mystic Dan, who was so impressive. Speaking of mind that bird, that's kind of what it looked like, his rail run on a wet track in the Southwest Stakes. How do you feel about Mystic Dan? Because this performance, as fast as he ran, put him right there with the elite two turn three-year-olds. Well, this performance that he ran on that sloppy track was an unbelievable performance. It was one of the best performances of any three-year-old all year. Uh, so I think Kenny McPeak will be doing a bit of a rain dance come Derby week. And we've seen a lot of times that it's, it, it's susceptible to raining during that time of the year in Kentucky. Yeah, we have. Uh, which would only benefit this horse. However, he has run decent races on, on dry track. Um, just disappointed with his performance last time. Can he recover? Can he, he take a step back in the right direction after st a step backwards from that impressive win? Kenny McPeak, his first ever starter in the Derby, the closest he's ever been to winning, second with Tejano Run. Back in 95, looking for that first Derby victory with Mystic Dan. Uh, those are the boys three weeks from today. And in 20 days, uh, the run for the Lilies in the three-year-old Phillies. The Kentucky Oaks, most prestigious race for three-year-old Phillies in North America. And right here on this track, what Torpedo Anna did in the fantasy while dealing with a bad post. She was keyed up, wasting energy, pre-race, all these negatives, and she went out and decimated her competition. And talk about overcoming adversity. She had everything against her for her to have. She had 10 different excuses to not show up with a she performance. Didn't, she wouldn't load. And everything prior to the race, during the run of the race, the track dynamics, everything was against her, off a layoff. I mean, you could think of so many factors. And then she came with this monstrous performance. It, it's crazy to think. I expect her to move forward off this race. And now, for her three-year-old debut, I, not race since November, and a little bit like a dare manner in the apple blossom, Torpedo Anna never looked like anything but a winner in that fantasy stakes. Yeah, and, and you know, if she can even duplicate that performance, she's gonna have a major impact on that race. But I'm even expecting her to improve off that performance. How much confidence does that give you when everything doesn't necessarily go right for a horse? It's like though she she had trouble at the gate and she was you know really kind of keyed up and, and and as nervous as she seemed and the bad post how much confidence does that give you that everything wasn't teed up on a silver platter and she still goes out and does that it just gives me that confidence that she can overcome that adversity and now uh, i don't have to worry about if one or two things goes wrong i'm i don't have to start panicking as a jockey i know that this is a horse that is going to give me her a race no matter what happens she is bomb proof Board trainer Kenny McPeak, uh, much like the Derby, still seeking that first Kentucky Oaks victory, having finished second on three different occasions. Uh, he has a talented, talented filly, a Torpedo Anna, amongst the very best sophomore fillies heading in to the Kentucky Oaks. Meantime, race number 35 coming your way from Oak Lawn Park. Horses <laughs> in the paddock. 13 minutes out, the 12th and final winding things down. There's time and beyond the even money. Favorite for the nightcap on Apple Blossom Saturday. Stick around. Dancer, New York's leading turf sire again in 2023 with standouts like Barrage at Saratoga. Here's Barrage with a final surge. Barrage got him. War Saichi dominated on the dirt at Finger Lakes. War Saichi has scampered well clear. War Saichi all the way with the top spot. And Danzig Queen on the tap of the surface at Woodbine. And Danzig Queen will come away and win by a length. Consistently producing winners on dirt, turf, and synthetic. War Dancer, proud to stand in New York.
and no one covers it better than AmericasBestRacing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle, the best races, horses, and destination venues, cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more. AmericasBestRacing.net is a sport for you. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. Great to have you with us. Winding things down on America's Day at the Races. As always, brought to you in part by Naira Bets. But any track, anywhere, anytime, visit NairaBets.com or download the Naira Bets app to get started. DeLuca's. Raj, I'm, I'm, is that a live look? Because if so, I want to see if Paul has bailed, skipped out on the nightcap, and beat us there. It's kind of dark. Can you make it out? I, I expect that he is. <laughs> I expect that he is. If you're in hot, and place, I don't blame him. If you, are you kidding? Blame him. I'm jealous. <laughs> and you can see now that you're riding, you go straight to Deluca's after the races. A pie for myself, they call it. A pie for myself Saturdays. They do a great job. Great job. Great food, Anthony. Always a festive atmosphere, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll have to make our way back over before the end of the weekend. First things first. Call to post. For the 12th and final, Arkansas Breds, why not, on one of Arkansas's biggest day of racing. And just before this post parade, we check in with Maggie. Well, Lafitte's 83-year-old William Jinks, as we well know him as, fires is proverbially speaking not where he wants to be. One is that he is suffering from a broken sternum due to a car crash that happened here in Hot Springs a couple weeks ago. So he can't be aboard his 18-year-old pony Buck in the morning. So he's had to find a stand near trackside to watch his charges train. But also, he's not in the winner's circle where uh, he has been for 43 consecutive seasons here at Oaklawn Park. He's had a win at the meet. He's the fourth leading trainer here all time. Now into this meet, it's been a rough one. He, it's, he's been 0 for 39 coming in here as excuse me, that was 47 consecutive seasons. But as he's coming in here today with his first time starter, he's 0 for 39 and he'll send out mandatory mission Lafitte in hopes of keeping the streak alive. Oakland legend. Jinx fires 47 consecutive seasons with a victory at Oaklawn Park. Trains mandatory mission number six, the first time starter. You'll see him in the post parade. That was the even money favorite. More on him in a moment. Time in beyond changing times on his toes. Yeah, it hasn't shown much in two start. But looks pretty amped up today. Mm -hmm. Eight to one if you like him. Secret honor. 11 race maiden. Yeah, 0 for 11. Trouble back in the maiden 20 last time, Spe steps back up to the 40 level, which makes him a big long shot here. Tarp Storm, Edgar Espinosa, own first time starter and trainer as well, Espinosa. Yeah, first time starter and not much to go off on the workouts, but decent pedigree here, Arky Brett. Come on, Jinx, one time. Mandatory mission in John Court aboard. The man is on a mandatory mission to make it 48 years consecutively winning a race. Breaking that is me. Sternum in a car accident. Uh, Jinx fires their streak and Deacon and Travis Wales. What, really on his toes, uh, being pretty amped up blinkers on today. Blessed vision off the board in his debut. Yeah, one start adds LASIK, steps up into the Archibred race. Great barrier. Blinkers on, Eric Asmussen in the saddle. Blink, if second place finish um, for Maiden 30 last time, steps back up to the Maiden 50 level, but he's on a, coming off a good race. Gabe Sayers with a win this afternoon. He's aboard Money Strike. Yeah, looking to light it up again after winning with a 50 to one shot earlier. There's a 51 to one shot, it's a rainy day. 
Yeah, it's pretty dry outside right now, but this one hasn't shown much in four starts. The has been so great this entire weekend. Uh, all green lights, Ricardo Santana, a pilot aboard Skelly in that sensational performance earlier in the Cal Fleet. A credible third at this race in this level last time out. Cuts back in distance. Had a lot of trouble. Carried seven wide and had traffic in the first turn of its last race. Field for the nightcap, post time six minutes. Pauly dealing with an odds on favorite in time and beyond. What do you think? Well, I mean, listen, it's a, to me, it's a dicey proposition betting this horse at four to five. And the only reason why I do think that, you know, he might be the best horse in this race. But here's the deal. This horse has broken bad in his last two starts, and he cannot make that mistake again, especially from the inside post, you know, with a lot of horses that are coming over on top of him at four to five. He, he broke eight of 12 and eight of 12 in his last two races. Now, I know he's dropping down in class, but he needs to get away a little bit better from the gate. Now, the other horses in here that you can look at, the three is taking money. And, and the reason why the three is taking money you know, when you run out of the Arkansas bred ranks and you come into, they just take money. I don't care how bad the races have been. And I think the three kind of on his toes could be a horse that might show some speed in here. I preferred the other Asperson runner getting the blinkers on. Uh, great barrier. If you look back, this horse has drawn some really wide barriers. And today, you know, Eric gets aboard. He's got a decent post position. And actually, I think it's going to be sitting in a, a decent spot. The 12 is an interesting horse in here because he is a big drink of water. I'd have to get the Maggie on this one because all green lights is big and he's going to be coming from off the pace. But I'm going to mention one other horse in here. I would not be surprised if the 10 runs a bang up race, Maggie. I hope he looked okay on the racetrack, but I'm going to stick with the, the nine horse in here, Mags. I like the fact that you're sticking with the nine, Polly, because the 10, a little hot, little washy. And as you mentioned, the 12 so big that I don't really understand the turn back in distance. But let's talk about number six in here, mandatory mission, that first time starter for Jinx Fires. Decent you know, Arkansas bred pedigree with this gelding uh, by Mark Valeski. Uh, not that precocious of a sire as far as first time starters go. But damn, she was an Arkansas bred stakes winner and graded stakes place trained by Jinx too. Um, her both of her foals have been winners in modest races. She's very laid back. She's very professional. She's well suited physically. You know, her pedigree says sprints. She entered in a sprint. She looks like a sprinter. She just doesn't look 100% fit. She is taking some nibbles at 9 to 1. I just feel like she'll really greatly benefit from a start. So, sorry, Jinx. I don't think... She's going to be the one that keeps the record alive. But moving on to uh, some others in here. Number nine, as Paul was mentioning, great barrier. I think he looks fantastic. He's, I downgraded him slightly watching him warm up. I wish he kind of got into his stride a bit quicker. But uh, I will say Eric Asmussen kind of brought him back, regathered him up, and then they went on again, which I think helped as he does put those blinkers on today. He looks fantastic uh, overall physically. So uh, he is a bit interesting. As Paul mentioned, number three, taking money, changing times with that drop in class. Also, Paul mentioning how wound up he was. He's been a handful from the word go. I mean, uh, Francisco Arrieta had trouble getting him on the track. You see him, his feet uh, kicked out of the irons for a moment there. This horse has not drawn breath as he wears an extension blinker. Not totally sure if he's always worn that. Uh, coming off the layoff here, Brett Calhoun looks as though he has him ready. But there's many signals to me saying that this guy mentally, Lafitte, isn't ready to run his best. All right, so some concern there. Far from rave reviews, but Maggie, real quick, mandatory mission. You got you to talk this thing into existence for Jinx. Come on. Well, yeah, you got to do a little manifest destiny, I suppose. But uh, the, the one thing I am, Lafitte, above all, is brutally honest. And I'm just being brutally honest, man. <laughs> so I'm hoping you work, work the magic, talk it into existence. Jinx fires with mandatory mission number six and incredible for decades, 47 years, having saddled at least one winner here at Oaklawn Park. Like I said, like an Oaklawn legend. Yeah. And what Maggie said, I respect her opinion. And looking at the horse out there, 
Um, but this race is ripe for a first-time starter. When you take a, a, a deep dive in it, the horses that have run have proven that they're just ordinary horses. They, there's nothing special in here. And while Maggie is correct that she might need a race, I think maybe if she doesn't need a 100% best race, if, if she can run a bit, she mm -hmm. might be able to win not being 100% wound tight, which I'm optimistic that that's what's going to happen here. Time and beyond odds on. Arkansas bred maiden $50,000 claimer, six furlong dash. We saw a six furlong sprint earlier today, the grade three count fleet featuring a superstar. Ricardo Santana, who's riding all green lights here earlier, just a quiet passenger, skelly, ridiculously fast. Not a stumble, just a sluggish start in the beginning, getting out of the blocks it made no difference as he hammers his competition, successfully defending his Cal Fleet title. Yeah, I mean, this was the performance that we were hoping to see. Because this is an exciting horse. It's a fun horse to watch. Um, the fact that he's, a, he's one of the best sprinters, if not the best sprinter in the country, um, and we get to see him run often. He's a, a gelding, and he's run four times already this year, right? But, so this is a fun horse to watch. We hope we get to see him run more often. If he can continue to run like this, there's not many horses that can compete with him. I hope we get to see him at, at Saratoga. Last year, trainer Steve Asmussen's best sprinter, Gunnight, after two starts in the Mideast. We saw him twice at Saratoga in the Vanderbilt, in the Forgo, where he did defeat the champion in that one a season ago. So hopefully a chance to see Skelly in upstate New York. And, and Raj, the difference between a sprinter who goes as fast as he can right from the opening bell and does everything on like one deep breath and one like Skelly who will actually give you a second move. Fast, early, and still re-breaking in the stretch. And one of the reasons why he's sustaining that run is he's running fast, but he's not doing it over-exhausting himself. He's just naturally fast. Ricardo wasn't having to push him too hard, and he didn't look like he was um, overly, the horse himself didn't look like he was scrambling to be there. He looked like he was just floating along in rhythm, and, and when he can have that fast rhythm and sustain it, that's a tough horse to race against. For those keeping score at home, two count fleets for Skelly, six for Steve Asmussen, seven for Ricardo Santana, and by the way, 38,000. 38,000 strong here at Oakland for today's Apple Blossom program. Man, if you have never been to Oakland, the race in here has just gotten to be top class. When you think about the horses that pass through here every season, champions, legends, uh, every year, it's just fun to come out here and watch. And the atmosphere, especially on a gorgeous day like today. Picture perfect. And when the superstars show up and do superstar things, like Skelly and the Count Fleet, like Adair Manor in the Apple Blossom. One final time, turning things over to Matt Dinnerman with the call, the 12th and final from Oakland. Four. Money strike. Here's Money Strike. It's a rainy day, tarp storm into the outside, all green lights. Mandatory mission goes into the gate, all green lights to the outside to round out the field. Here's all green lights. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off. In the finale, having to steady a little bit coming out of the chute was Tarp Storm, who's at the back of the pack after that. Clear Echo going to the front from the inside. Muddy Strike on the outside to apply the heat. And these two are 1 2 as they head down the back stretch here. And the third spot is Changing Times, racing alongside of Blessed Vision and a deep Great Barrier in the fifth position now within six lengths of the lead approach in the turn. There's the favorite, Time and Beyond. And midfield, Streak and Deacon has been passed by him. Streak and Deacon now 12 off the lead as they're real strung out into the 
return. Mandatory mission joining all green lights there together. It's a rainy day is plummeting back. Secret Honors second to last. Tarp Storm, the first time starter, losing contact with the field. Coming to the top of the lane. Clear Echo on the lead. Money Strike right alongside. And these two are off the turn together. And they're four ahead of Great Barrier trying to pick them up. Time and beyond. And the fourth position needs to get going. Is making his move as they come down the lane. Clear Echo and Nick Juarez make a blitz towards the wire. And they've opened up the lead to four. Great Barrier in the second. And third Money Strike is beaten. Time and beyond did not fire his best shot today. Clear Echo coming to the line. He's on top by a diminishing length, but he's going to get there in time. Clear Echo over Great Barrier, Money Strike, and Time and Beyond at 4-5 to five, ran fourth in the nightcap on an Apple Blossom Day at Oaklawn Park. Raj, what just happened? Another bomb. 51-1. <laughs> to one. Clear Echo goes to the front and doesn't look back. 51 to one bomb. We had free uh, like a girl at 50 some odd to one, third in the apple blossom, and now this to close the show. Our second $100 plus payout winner today. Incredible. You usually don't see, hardly see one on a program. Two today. Two today. Shea Stewart winning trainer, claim to fame, stable, clear echo, Nick Juarez, 51 to one in the 12th. And final Final thoughts today, lasting impression. What did we, what did we learn? We asked, we hope they delivered. The big guns came and showed up. Um, what a performance by the stars, Adair Manor, showing that she is the top of the division, winning the Apple Blossom. She's an Amazon and she was brilliant. We'll see you tomorrow on America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. Live coverage continuing from Oakland. I don't know that we'll have 38,000. Whenever he shows up, you're going to get a big crowd. Ricardo Santana, seventh win in the Count Fleet as Skelly goes back to back. A blur in the stretch. And as the sun gets ready to set, the big mare owned by the Great Dane, Michael Lund Peterson, Adair Manor, the Amazon crushes him in the apple blossom. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night.